Hello? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. We're big on punctuality, so everybody needs to finish their talks on time. Hey, uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Bapi. Um, we have a crackerjack of an agenda. I, 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 I counted, we've got like 29 speakers from 19 companies uh, today, all on different kinds of chiplets and accelerators. Um, very, Ahmad's here, so I'm gonna get off soon. <laughs> um, I wanna introduce our wonderful host. So you know, in theory, we have 140 people registered. Uh, so even a 20% no-shows is gonna fill up slowly. Um, Maybe more by the time, I was hoping more by the time you were here, but we're good. Um, so in terms of an agenda, you can see where we're at. We'll go over this slowly. The, roughly the three, four blocks are the mornings, like we're gonna look at Intel's view of chiplets. The mid-morning is progress on uh, the work streams in our group. Uh, the early afternoon, we've got two, pa we've got panels in the afternoon, um, one with people, all of whom have designed actual chiplet-based products and new ideas. And we'll end the day with an update on the POC and a uh, chiplet workflow panel uh, where you're pretty loosey-goosey on time and you know if there's a discussion going we keep it going so please uh, stay engaged with the speakers um, i'm going to hand it over to our wonderful host animesh who is a principal engineer with the ip design group here uh, he uh, he does a uh, recently I, I don't know how recent it is started a lot of work on accelerators and the one thing I do remember is he holds tons of patents, including one on core hopping. That's the one thing I remember. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Anime. She's been a wonderful host. Uh, before I leave, I do want to say two things. One is there's a whole bunch of people at Intel who helped us with the logistics. Uh, so if you could give them a thank you, um, that's very nice of them. Uh, then this is an OCP workshop. Uh, if you need more information about uh, the OCP, um, Archana was out there. Archana is, is out there in the uh, uh, in the back checking people. Archana and Dirk are with the OCP, and DJ here can answer any OCP-related questions. Um, and finally, we've got a whole bunch of people from Netronome who helped us put the conference together as well. So thank you all. I hope you enjoy the day. Please stay engaged with all the speakers. I'm going to hand it over to uh, um, Animesh. You don't have a deck on this? No, no. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, all of you can hear me clear and loud. Uh, how's everyone doing? Uh, morning. It was a pretty hot uh, day yesterday here in the Bay Area. So, uh, following on the footsteps, probably we'll have a pretty hot session here today. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Bapi, for uh, the introduction, but uh, I'm, I'm your host. And as, as it says that uh, the credit, you know, comes to me. Uh, but I'm going to say that, uh, you know, if you want to discredit, it comes to me as well. Uh, so um, before I um, go further, I would like to acknowledge uh, the person who agreed to, um, you know, uh, give me the flexibility to uh, uh, host it, you know, for you. Uh, he's the uh, vice president of IPSG and the general manager for the group. Uh, chipset and IP technologies group that I work for. Um, he runs a diverse organization in terms of you know, people, uh, talent, and geographies. You know, his group is uh, uh, diversified in almost all geographies of Intel that you, you can think of, you know, worldwide. Um, there's hardly any product at Intel that doesn't carry um, the IPs or the technologies developed, you know, in his group. All Intel products so far that I have seen, most of them, you know, have his uh, touch. Uh, <clears throat> he has been um, uh, honored several times in the national, you know, uh, forum or international, you know, forum, um, uh, and uh, has, uh, and obviously is a uh, technocrat, has uh, several patents under his name. So with that, I would say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ahmad Zadi, Vice President of IPSG and General Manager CIG. They are driving force behind our group. Welcome, Ahmad. 
Thank you, Animesh. Uh, it's an honor to be talking to you guys. I'm really happy that uh, this uh, workshop was, uh, was put together. And as uh, Animesh has uh, mentioned, um, uh, I lead a uh, group which develops products. We did uh, most of the client and server chipsets for a while. Now we do a number of companion dies uh, for it, both Intel and external foundries. And we have a large portfolio of uh, IP technologies, you know, uh, all the way from AI-related stuff like audio, vision sensing, to security, to uh, IO technologies, all the way to fabrics. And these IPs go in all of Intel products in all of uh, different segments. So as we sort of transition into the future, um, I see a lot of innovation happening outside uh, in, in the industry. And in fact, this is some of the, if I look at from a Andy Grove's inflection point perspective, in terms of innovation, especially in the areas of IA, storage, memory, et cetera, a lot of innovation is happening. At the same time, we are finding that it's becoming more and more costly and difficult to integrate these technologies uh, on, the, on the chip. Um, and as we especially move to these lower and lower, smaller, smaller nodes. So, you know, so we have this dichotomy of, hey, we want to drive the innovation, but it's becoming more and more costly. And, you know, what we are seeing is that the Moore's law, despite a lot of people saying that, hey, Moore's law is dead, is still very much alive and active. It is how you perceive it, right? It's not just about, you know, doubling of uh, transistors every, every other year, but now other aspects of which are coming there is, uh, especially the packaging uh, technology. You know, so we have been doing MCPs for a while. Now we announced the Fovris technology, which is the 3D packaging. And now this whole concept of chiplets is, is going to be the big wave as we move to, into the future. And this is going to help us, you know, integrate different process technology uh, chips on the same, same packaging area. So that's why, you know, I'm really happy that we are having this uh, workshop uh, because having this some sort of standardization where we can build chips uh, with chiplets with some standard interfaces with different process technologies is going to enable the innovation because everything doesn't have to be on the latest and greatest process uh, technology and you need to decide what you're putting on the latest node versus something on a previous generation node and drive a more cost effective way of uh, uh, innovation moving forward. And having some sort of standardization is obviously going to accelerate uh, this innovation. So, you know, I, I hope you guys have great discussions uh, over this uh, course of the workshop. Um, as I said, this is a key inflection point in the industry and how we shape the future of the semiconductor industry in how we build chips and how we get more partners coming in and partnering with, you know, people like Intel who have the full know-how in technology but are able to sort of integrate technology from outside from other companies as well. We are in a domain ourselves at Intel that we, we, we know that we can't invent everything ourselves and we need to sort of partner with other people who have a lot of bright ideas. So that's why we're quite passionate about driving, uh, driving this uh, workshop. So anyway, so that's all uh, I had to I had to say. If uh, if there are any sort of any quick questions for me, I'll happy to take it. Otherwise, uh, you guys have a great uh, workshop. Okay, okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Is there a clicker for this? I don't.
Gulfstream. Gulfstream. Oh yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm Ramuni Nagasetti, and I've been at Intel for 24 years. My background is in transistor device physics, and um, I've done a lot of uh, transistor technology development in the first half of my career at Intel, doing things strain silicon, high K metal gate, and early path binding on uh, fin fat transistors. And then um, second half of my career, I've really been focusing on advanced packaging and to um, build uh, an infrastructure for mix and match chiplets and in, in support of an interoperable ecosystem. Um, and I report uh, to Intel CTO and have the title of process and uh, product integration director. So um, in this talk today, I'm going to start with the trends that are driving towards the use of chiplets and advanced packaging. And some of these trends may already be familiar to you, but um, maybe not all of them in the same way that I think about them. And then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to dig in three unique uh, examples that um, show how Intel is delivering chiplets and advanced packaging today. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each one of those approaches, what we've learned from what we've done, and then the third thing I'm going to talk about is the specifications and standards that are needed in order to underpin the foundation of this emerging ecosystem. And I'm going to finish with announcing uh, two new developments, um, one that has to do with uh, power modeling standard and the other one that has to do with um, an, a modification that we've made to the pipe standard. And those of you who are well-versed in uh, protocols know that PIPE is uh, one of the pieces of the protocol stack for PCI Express. So I'm going to be making an announcement uh, regarding our Intel support for the PIPE standard um, that is directly in support of the use of in-package integration. So um, with that, I will start with the, oh, the, the boilerplate legal information. Um, and then um, get to the trends that are um, shaping the industry today. And so um, advanced packaging has been worked on at Intel for a really long time. In fact, um, in 2011, I think, is one of the first on Intel's EMIB technology. So that's already eight years ago that we published EMIB. And of course, the, uh, the research was going on well in advance of that first publication. So uh, advanced packaging is not something new. Um, and the use of package level integration is also not particularly new. At Intel, we've been using MCPs for a long time for integrating um, first multi-core chiplets and embedded DRAM. And so uh, that's, that's all kind of uh, kind of the backdrop for what's happening today, which is the rise of disruptive architecture. 2012, that um, AlexNet won the ImageNet uh, challenge, and that really was the beginning of neural networks. And today, um, th these new architectures are disrupting at an even faster rate. And so when EMIB was developed in uh, prior to 2011 and published in 2011, um, AlexNet didn't even yet exist. So these technologies were developed and they were there. Um, it did not take off until we started needing them for specific architectures. Architectures are really, really hungry for communications and memory bandwidth. And um, on the right-hand side, you can see the rate of change I.O. Uh, variety and complexity in order to feed these new architectures. So it's actually, you know, people develop technologies, but until there's an actual use case, um, nothing really happens. And so these are kind of the platform that are driving uh, the use of advanced packaging um, and, and chiplets. 
Okay, so uh, package as a platform for innovation and agility. So these are three examples that I'm going to talk about in more detail. But what's really interesting here is um, that the reason that packaging was used uh, for integration was not necessarily anything to do specifically with more that are often talked about. Um, these implementations were really um, designed for best-in-class products that met specific requirements. And so on the left-hand side, we have uh, KB Lake G, which integrated the AMD um, GPU and high bandwidth memory and the Intel CPU. And that's a best-in-class product for client gaming. And then in the middle, we have Intel Stratix 10, which integrates HBM and transceivers, uh, high-speed transceivers. Um, and that, again, is a best-in-class product in terms of uh, transceiver technology. And then on the right-hand side, we have Lakefield, which was um, our Foveros 3D logic stacking was announced in December at Intel Architecture Day. And then at CES, we talked about uh, the more specifics about Lakefield, and that's our 3D die stacking. And that's really to achieve a small form factor footprint. And so, um, none of these really had anything to do specifically with Moore's Law, but had more to do with what kind of IP do you need to in order to have a best-in-class product? And where does that IP come from? Where is it available? Who has it? How do we integrate that into our product? And so the technology drivers include things like heterogeneous integration of HBM, um, Reticle Limited Die are another application for packaging technology, advanced packaging, then IP portability and suitability. And then on the right-hand side are the market requirements, which include the need for uh, smaller form factors, and being able to integrate accelerators, third-party IP, and develop custom solutions. All right, so this is a trend from Yol. Um, it's uh, basically showing the increase in um, advanced packaging over time <clears throat> in terms of a CAGR. And um, what you see at the top is this really small sliver in red. That's 2.5D and 3D packaging. And so even though it's a very small sliver, um, it's actually growing at, at the highest rate, 27% uh, for 2.5D and 3D, and then for fan out, wafer level packaging, 31 dagger. So um, it's expected that this trend is going to uh, continue to grow. Um, other things that underpin this trend are um, essentially uh, in 2016, the ITRS roadmap after a 25 year run um, retired. It's, and, and concluded its uh, <clears throat> first generation roadmap. And the ITRS 2.0 roadmap was then published. And that is a much broader roadmap. So the first roadmap really guided the entire semiconductor industry for 25 years. And then the new roadmap is intended to do the same thing, but it really focuses on things like heterogeneous integration connectivity. So that's another point um, kind of uh, to kind of underscore the importance of package level integration. And then the other point to make is that HBM, uh, multi-vendor interoperable HBM, is actually uh, the first proof point of a standard in support of package level integration. And high bandwidth memory is only increasing in overall usage in high performance applications. And so, uh, these are the trends that show we're at this inflection point in the industry. In terms of the advanced MCP landscape, there are a range of technologies that are available and uh, also a range of figures of how to judge these technologies and uh, how they're suitable for different applications. And so one of the key feature scaling metrics is I.O. per millimeter per layer. It's also called escape density. And what you have in this uh, graph here is basically the half line pitch, so line and space divided by two. Um, and then on the y-axis is I.O. per millimeter. 
layer. And what you can see is, uh, you know, this is based just, you know, math. The, the, it's not like a trend of what's out in the market. It's basically a trend of, you know, how do you calculate I.O. per layer from half line. And so what you see here on the right-hand side is traditional organic packages and then scaling up high-density organic interposers that are scaling up to 100 I.O. per layer. And then um, uh, fan-out interposers that are scaling up to even higher densities, like 250 I.O. Per, per layer. And then technologies like EMIB and COAS that use silicon back-end wiring. And those technologies are, or COAS or silicon interposer, I should say, um, scale, scaling up to 500. And this trend will continue. Um, uh, the EMIB technology scales all the way to 1,000 I.O. per and so uh, basically, technologies that have silicon backend wiring have uh, the highest uh, numbers of I/O per mill per layer. That does not mean that all advanced that that all uh, chiplets and package integration needs to use that level of um, technology. But that there's a whole range of technologies that su that support package integration. They will all be posted on the ODSA website. Um, and so, uh, to talk a little bit about um, EMIB, so... Um, hey, Cynthia, this is Archana. Is there a way that you can give me... ...stands for um, embedded multi-die interconnect bridge, and it was first used at Intel in the Stratix 10, um, which... Uh, which... Uh, six EMIB uh, uh, chiplets. I mean, mm -hmm. the EMIB is, a, is entirely passive. Yeah, you're there's talking on the way. on there, but... Six EMIB interconnects uh, to connect to the So this is a little distracting. Is there any way to? It is being recorded. Right. Could you please go on mute on the WebEx? It's up here. <laughs> is it possible to mute them? OK, I got it. All right. Not entirely possible. Anyway, um, so uh, the Stratix 10 has been shipping for over a year, uh, and it uh, has transceiver chiplets that are fabricated. Uh, it has it's fabricated on six different process technologies, boundaries, and it really is the foundation of um, an interoperable chiplet ecosystem, and it's also the underpinning of the DARPA chips program. And so what you see from the concept of EMIB is that you essentially use a standard packaging substrate and you embed uh, the EMIB uh, interconnect in that advanced packaging substrate. So you really get very local high density interconnect. The rest of the package um, is essentially standard. And what this does, it gives you high density interconnect where you need it. Um, between the die and then a standard packaging substrate that's more suitable for power delivery and so forth um, in, the, in the rest of uh, the die. So this is essentially where Intel's um, kind of uh, leadership in packaging technology now lies in terms of shipping with EMIB. So there are pros and cons of using EMIB versus a standard silicon interposer. Did you see LinkedIn is saying they can do the rec and power? They are. Yeah. Greg just responded, we can do it. They can? So which one do you want to go with? Can you go on mute, please? But he, what he said was... Um, They're not listening, obviously. Uh, however, the location will be at our Mountain View campus, and the parking is very limited due to construction in one of the other buildings. What's that? There's got to be a way to, to stop this. Um, is there a way to do that? I haven't heard that. Does anybody know how to do that? Oh, okay. Um, can you show me again how to put it on full? Oh, here we go. Um, 
Okay, so there's pros and cons um, for each of these different implementations. So for EMIB, like I said, we have localized high density. There are no practical limits to the die size that you can standard assembly process. Um, and uh, the cost of a silicon bridge is much lower than the cost of a silicon interposer because it doesn't have TSD, smaller silicon interposer. The downside is that it does increase packaging manufacturing complexity. Um, silicon interposers uh, have some advantages. They're uh, CTE matched with silicon. They have excellent chip attach alignment and excellent pitch scaling. Um, Typically, the interposer size is limited by the reticle field, but there are efforts in place to develop larger. Uh, the TSV capacitance does impact the signal integrity of off package. And the interposer attached adds an extra chip attached step. Now, all that being said, if you have one technology or the other, you don't use them in the same way. So when you design a chiplet to be you really are looking at your shoreline, um, and that's where your high density interconnect is. And when you use a silicon interposer, you would do your design somewhat differently. So, pros and cons are kind of, you know, in one sense, this is the list, but the how you actually use it and the other types of benefits you get um, really depend on the silicon that you build on top of that interposer. All right, in terms of, uh, I, I like this slide because um, it talks about kind of the range of So starting um, with the board and then on a standard package and on die as kind of the holy grail of uh, what you'd like to achieve with the package. And so the distance on, distances on a board are typically around a meter, uh, up to a meter, typically less. Um, and then on package, the distances are significantly less, 2 to 50 millimeters. With EMIB, we talk about distances that are 1 to 3 millimeters, although there, there could be a wider range side. And then on die, we're talking about very small distances. Um, the wire densities on a board on a typical kind of server board would be 2 lines per millimeter per layer. You get up to high density interconnect in mobile devices, you get up to 15 lines per millimeter. Reality, when we're talking about add-on cards and so forth, we're talking about something in between per millimeter per layer. With on package, um, we're talking about 35, and then with high density packaging, obviously goes much higher than that. And then with EMIB, we're talking about uh, capability up to 1,000 or even more lines per millimeter per layer, which starts to look a lot like on-die integration. And um, kind of hand in hand with that wire density uh, comes a power efficiency because you're driving um, across shorter distances and across a larger number of wires. And so that inherently gives you a more power efficient solution. So on the board in terms of picojoules per bit, we're talking about uh, 7 to 20 picojoules per bit. Uh, on package, one to two picojoules per bit. I've seen some numbers that are slightly less than one as well. And then with EMIB, we're talking about one picojoule per bit and lower, and sometimes significantly. Um, in terms of on die, we have a, a kind of a benchmark of 0.1 picojoule. Um, and then in terms of bandwidth for shoreline. Um, 200 gigabits per second per millimeter for a board, more than that for the package, and with advanced packaging, that would continue. Then with EMIB, you can clearly see there's a step function increase in the bandwidth per shoreline. And so that's really you know, a huge benefit, and that's where we're starting to talk about uh, approaching um, on-die capability. Um, in terms of the standards, Um, there we go. In terms of the standards, we're all really familiar with the board ecosystem where we have standards such as PCI Express and D. Um, on package, there are um, not a lot of standards yet. This is actually an open area. And I'm putting down here the standards 
um, that are actually out there being used today, and that includes HBM and Intel's AIB, which is the Advanced Interface Bus that uh, was announced with a royalty-free license last July. So that's about a year ago that we announced AIB with a royalty. Um, and so uh, essentially, we have a range of capabilities, but you can start to see different figures of merit and where different types of technology um, really fit in the spectrum. OK, so to kind of recap what I just talked about, uh, the industry's reached an inflection point. I started talking about the new workloads that are extremely hungry for community bandwidth. Um, and then I talked about these breakthroughs in packaging capabilities that approach on die solutions. These are capabilities that we worked on at Intel for a very long time and now are finally coming into the market because of these new applications. And then I talked about new interface standards that are essentially the beginning um, of package level integration as being the platform for an ecosystem to develop. So based on all of this, we have an opportunity to continue to scale ecosystem innovation through package level integration of chiplets. All right, so now I'm going to dig into uh, three demonstrated chiplet solutions at Intel. Um, these are three very unique solutions, unique from each other. Um, and uh, starting with on the left-hand side, KB Lake G. So um, KB Lake G uh, integrates silicon from multiple foundries, uh, multiple vendors, and obviously technology nodes. And so the Intel CPU here is integrated to AMD's GPU through PCI Express. And so some of you may already know that. It may, ob may be obvious to some of you, but we essentially took a board level component that was already connected with PCI Express, and we put it in the package because we wanted to create a best-in-class product. And so HBM is connected using EMIB to the graphics chip. And so here are the interfaces are industry standard interfaces, HBM over EMIB and PCI Express over the So we got a smaller form factor. We got best-in-class IP to create a best-in-class product. And this solution is a really interesting one is because you can use the same silicon die in a board-level implementation or in a package-level implementation. And this gives you the ability to have the maximum flexibility and the quickest time to market. And so KB Lake G is, a, is one of our unique examples um, that does use EMIB and PCI Express and kind of uses both standard packaging and high density packaging where it makes sense. The Stratix 10 FPGA in the middle um, has uh, silicon from multiple foundries and multiple nodes. And so um, its claim to fame is something like technology nodes. And, um, and there is lots of work being done by universities and startups to create chiplets that are interoperable with this Stratix 10 platform. And so the uh, interfaces are industry standard. It's HBM over EMIB, and it's AIB over EMIB. It should, uh, I should make it clear that AIB is a uh, die-to-die phi that supports not just Intel's EMIB, but also supports OWASP. And, um, and silicon interposer technology generally. And so the beauty of the Stratix 10 is that the FPGA can be configured to run different protocols. So you really only have to specify the SPI and the rest of the protocol stack, whether it's PCI Express or DDR or whatever type of interface protocol you want to use, um, the FPGA can be configured to run that protocol over AIB and EMIB. And so the Stratix 10 is really the hallmark of a mix and match approach to chiplets. It supports interoperability and it supports reuse. And then on the right hand side is Lakefield. And so this is um, entirely internal silicon um, and uh, you know it basically uses proprietary interfaces and logic on logic 3D stacking. And so the 
kind of the challenges with Lakefield are in a completely different class than the KB Lake G or the Stratix 10 examples. Um, in this case, the top and bottom die have to be carefully co-designed for floor planning, for power delivery, and for thermals. And so that really limits the ability to have any kind of interoperability and reuse with other chiplets. So 3D stacking um, with proprietary interfaces does not naturally lend itself to interoperability. I think the place where interoperability will come into play in 3D stacking is by stacking memory die or some other kind of um, like more standard die uh, on top of logic. But logic on logic, 3D stacking is very difficult um, to for interoperability. Okay, so moving on to um, kind of. Uh, one thing I want to talk about and try to clear up some confusion because I do hear a lot of confusion in terms of the benefits of package integration. So what I want to say here is that the level of integration that you use and the benefits that you perceive are really um, determined by the capabilities and requirements and also determined by how you got there. So if you got to package level integration by starting with a board level solution like KB Lake G was where you have a GPU and HBM on the board and then you have a CPU on the board and you integrate inside a package, you're going to have a different perception of what your challenges and benefits are than if you come from a, a monolithic SOC and you're disaggregating that SOC onto a package substrate, the completely different direction and how you perceive the benefits and the challenges will be completely different. And that's why I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about that. Um, so when you go from the board to the package, you do get smaller form factor and that's one benefit. You can accomplish higher bandwidth and lower latency. If allows and you get better power efficiency as well. But the challenge is really in the business model. And so we learned a lot about that through KB Lake G and integrating externally produced uh, silicon into our package. Um, the business model is a little tricky and it really relies on putting known good dye in your package because once you have silicon that was produced externally, put it in your package. If your package, if your part then um, fails to yield, you have to be able to pinpoint, um, you know, where where the problem is, and then you have to be able to attribute that cost to to the owner, you know, wherever that defect came from. And so, whether it came from you know the external silicon that you integrated, or you came from silicon, you have to be able to attribute that that yield fallout. Um, to your partner or not, to yourself. And then the other thing that is very challenging is, um, is thermal limits. And so typically on a board you have um, space between the die and you have a cooling solution for each one of these die. Now you're, if you take the same die that you had on a board and you put them in a package, you will end up hitting some sort of thermal limit. So you need to have solutions for power management have solutions for um, thermal management as well. And so that's how um, the board to the package um, kind of has its benefits and its challenges. Now, when you go from the other direction, from the package to the SOC, there's a kind of a whole different uh, kind of side of benefits. So there's terms uh, in terms of IP portability and suitability. So let's say that you have your next generation high-speed transceiver and uh, you want that transceiver to have um, kind of longer than one node of life because of overall effort that it took to build that transceiver. Um, you may not want to port that IP to every single technology node where you're going to put that IP. Um, and in some cases, that IP doesn't particularly scale favorably to a technology node. So there's a benefit of IP portability and suitability. Um, 
And so you can potentially lower NRE costs, and you can potentially increase uh, your speed to market or your time to market. Um, other benefits, you can address radical size limits, and in some cases, you can also uh, address field issues if you actually design your silicon to be disaggregated. And I want to make the point here, again, is that um, in this case, it has to be a known good chiplet. And so that means you have to be able to do wafer level sort to the point where you can guarantee uh, that each one of the chiplets that you put in the package is yielding. And there is a, a associated overhead with that because typically we are not getting um, you know, like our full yield um, metrics until we have a packaged part. So we really need to be able to ensure known good dye uh, go into that package. Now, in terms of uh, challenges, this challenges uh, is really uh, kind of interesting because the challenges here really look a lot like the benefits of going from the package. So the challenge of going from a monolithic SOC to a, a package is form factor. So your form factor is probably going to be a little bit larger in order to um, integrate those die. That doesn't happen necessarily when you talk about 3D stacking, but when you talk about 2D and 2.5D integration, your form factor will increase in size. So when you went from the board to the package, your form factor decreased, but when you go from monolithic to chiplets, your form factor increases. Um, other challenges include bandwidth and latency and the silicon area and power overhead for those die-to-die -die connections. And so those are also challenges when you go from SOC to package, but they're the benefits when you go from the board to the package. And then the last point is manufacturing cost. And so manufacturing cost is really a trade-off in terms of how much different technology costs. Um, typically, if you have a high volume application, uh, monolithic is going to have the, the lowest cost. If you have something that is not a high volume application or you have something where NRE cost is really the bulk of your cost and doesn't amortize over a large volume, then manufacturing costs can be one. And so all of this is really enabled by standards and business models. So you can arrive at a package from either the board or from a um, in either case, you need standards and you need business models in order to support uh, integrating out external IP into your platform. All right, so I talked about this a little bit. So test and thermal challenges are a very serious thing. So heterogeneous integration drives the need for uh, known good dye. Um, we have to have comprehensive content at wafer sort. It's extremely challenging to probe these fine pitch bumps. Um, and so uh, kind of innovations in how to ensure known good dye um, go into the package are needed. And so uh, being able to probe micro bumps is one of those things. Being able to test without contacting micro bumps um, is another thing that, that uh, is needed. And then kind of really thorough self-test so that the, the less you actually have to touch the, the chiplet, it would be best. In terms of thermal challenges, I also talked about that. These challenges are driven by power, power density, and thermal crosstalk. And so power density is only increasing. Um, this is not a surprise um, as silicon nodes uh, scale. And so, um, you know, in terms of innovations in dye cooling, uh, we, need, we need more innovation in this area. Um, this plot here shows uh, graphs of dye cooling capability. If you're using 2D integration or 3D integration, top here is two, um, two dye side by side, and this one is basically um, 2.5D for the side by side dye, and then essentially like an HBM stack, like a stack of HBM on the left. And so when you have a really um, high power die um, that uh, has a really high, essentially that die two performance is going to be limited by die one. 
And so that's another area where extreme care needs to be done in terms of how you uh, put these stiplets in the how you do your thermal um, and power management. And so we do need um, advancements in, um, in TIMS and in, in terms of overall power and thermal management um, specifications. All right, so um, next I'll talk about chiplet interoperability, uh, in, which really needs uh, to be supported by specification tools. Um, most of the time, I talk about interoperability, and I don't talk about read. And it's not necessarily um, that interoperability and reuse always go hand in hand. And so the point I want to make here is that you can, to be able to design interoperable chiplets, you need to be able to design to specifications. However, reuse is kind of an even higher goal than interoperability. Um, for example, you can have interoperability in a specific implementation where you have two die that were actually designed to be interoperable with each other, but those die may not be reusable in any other kind of implementation. And so interoperability first is um, underpinned by mechanical standards uh, for bump and wire sizes, bonding footprint, XYZ constraints, and also um, uh, material systems. So uh, chiplets manufactured at different foundries need to have interoperable material systems that are um, tested and validated. So the second point I've already made about the importance of uh, power and thermal modeling and cooling solutions. And then we also need standards for um, electrical interfaces that include power delivery, noise margin, capacitance, and then in terms of functional specs, um, all the way from uh, uh, power management, security, debug, configuration, and statistics, and manufacturing test access. So um, all of these things are needed, but do not guarantee um, a low productization and NRE cost. That's one area where a lot of work still remains to be done. Um, industry standard tests and DFX are extremely important. Um, functional safety is something that is becoming increasingly important. Um, certification and traceability as well. Uh, a lot of these things have to do with security being increasingly important, real-time applications, autonomous uh, driving, and so forth. Um, and then the business model and supply chain enablement is needed in order to support this. And of course, easy to use uh, tools, flows, and methods. And all of this is needed um, to minimize the area and the power and the cost of doing chiplet, imp chiplet implementation and to support in industry scale interoperability. So um, the next thing I want to say is that um, I'm going to talk about in the next two slides, I'm going to talk about two new standards um, that you may or may not know about yet. Uh, so one of my goals for this talk today was hopefully that you all would learn something important that you didn't already know. Um, and so there's a new IEEE standard uh, for power modeling that I'll talk about briefly. And then the last thing I want to um, talk about is uh, uh, support for a configurable short reach, reach phi in um, the PCI Express protocol stack, specifically in um, pipe uh, version 5.2. So these are two things. Hopefully one of these things is something you didn't quite know yet and maybe is important to your perspective and chiplet. All right, so uh, the new power modeling standard, IEEE 2416, um, this is essentially um, been ratified by the 24, IEEE 2416 working group, and uh, key in this working group are ARM, Cadence, IBM, Intel, and um, SI2. Uh, this is a standardized interoperable system level power model that is independent of voltage and temperature, and some aspects of this model are also process technology independent. It allows uh, essentially almost a continuous uh, kind of 
level of abstraction layers from IP block to the chiplet to system uh, on chip and system and package implementation. And this tool is really important for gaining early insight into electrothermal effects. Um, this model was done um, in conjunction with model producers, those who develop power models, consumers of those models, and tool developers as well, so the EPA industry. And so future updates to this standard include static and dynamic thermal modeling and the ability to uh, account for process variation. And so that's uh, one standard. Uh, this was released in May um, and also was just talked about at DAC last week. And then uh, I'm really excited about this particular thing. Um, so this pipe support for short reach applications. So the origin of our um, kind of decision to um, add this um, to the pipe spec is directly related to our experience with KB Lake G. I told you that we took PCI Express on a chip that had been designed for a board and we put it inside a package. And uh, we learned a lot. And we also learned that there's a lot of upside that can be gained by being able to um, have a configurable short reach phi. So this is, the, the idea here is that you can have a single phi on your silicon configured or tuned to either um, run uh, for long reach, like a board level, board level type of distances, or it could be configured to um, run at short reach, like the kind of distances inside a package. And our studies have shown that we can get 50% active power reduction on this phi um, by making it configurable, that we can also reduce power state transition times and also reduce cost by moving from AC coupling to DC coupling. So all of those AC coupling capacitors um, aren't needed if you are uh, doing DC coupling. And so the uh, pipe spec was updated in February. It's uh, version 5.2, section 2.6. Um, this uh, is essentially a very powerful way to carry over the board level ecosystem. So any kind of silicon um, that's designed for a board can also be used in a package. And a phi that is designed to be configurable um, then really allows you to get, you know, get inside the package and get some of these benefits of power reduction and cost reduction. Um, there are a lot of advantages to this in terms of uh, this whole ecosystem, uh, having a mature ecosystem for silicon validation and software. And in fact, this PCIe uh, pipe is a layer in this whole uh, infrastructure. And this is the ODSA um, kind of diagram showing where the, where the pipe uh, belongs in that spec. And so uh, this is an industry, uh, you know, open to the industry to, to use in, in any way. Um, this is also powerful because um, PCI Express uh, obviously already supports multi-vendor interoperability, and it supports a lot of other protocols like CXL, DMI, UPI, C6, SATA, USB. Port. So uh, this is a very powerful um, stepping stone towards being able to integrate chiplets flexibly um, and design silicon that can be used on a board or in a package and kind of leaving that decision to be made towards the end of uh, the integration process. And so I'm really excited that we're able to, um, to use our learnings from KB Lake G. Um, to actually uh, build in this support and uh, specification. All right, and so uh, summary and conclusion, uh, packaging is a platform for innovation, agility, flexibility. There are a lot of benefits to package level integration. Uh, there is advanced packaging approaching monolithic, monolithic SOC capabilities, not just at Intel, but also in um, the entire industry. 
uh, but what really makes that important, what's really important is having an application that can really take advantage of advanced packaging. We have those applications now. Those are the applications that require really high communication memory bandwidth. There are other types of applications that also benefit from package level integration. Um, they don't all have to rely on advanced packaging solutions. I talked about three demonstrated unique solutions, KB Lake G, where we took board level components packaged, Stratix 10, which is essentially the hallmark of a new industry standard um, for package integration called AIB that was announced with a uh, royalty-free license last year. And then I also talked uh, briefly about lake field and 3D die stacking. 3D die stacking is not necessarily um, going to be the center point of an interoperable ecosystem in the very near future because of the really high level of co-design and floor plan a different die. It could be very good for something like memory stacking. So with that, I just want to say this is just the beginning. And you saw this whole kind of list of different areas where we need specification tools business models um, to be worked out. Um, and all of that is really going to be the foundation of this uh, emerging industry scale chiplet ecosystem. OK, so that's all the slides that I have. Um, and so if there's any questions, I can um, I do in the back. Um, they want you to walk to the mic so that the WebEx can hear the questions. You talked about the, a little intense, um, the, uh, e, the, I guess, EMIB uh, interface not needing an interposer, but it looked like the AIB does use an interposer. So what's the, cause Obviously, interposers are huge. AIB is built on top of EMIB, and um, EMIB is Intel's proprietary high-density interconnect solution. And it, they're externally in the industry. There are silicon interposer technologies, specifically COAS from TSMC is one of the And so the physical interconnect and the, pro, the, the phi that you run are not the same thing. So it's AIB that runs over EMIB. AIB can run over co-op. So um, uh, in terms of how that um, plays out is when you look at uh, DARPA chips support for developing an industry scale ecosystem, uh, there really needs to be a phi that will work over a variety of high density interconnects, not just over but does it run on a, just a direct to organic substrate, or you have no, to have it? No, AIB okay, so that's, does not yeah, run that's on a direct on substrate. And actually, Dave Kellett, where is Dave? Yeah, he's sitting right there front and center. He's uh, um, the expert on AIB. He has any more. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, the pipe update. That's still a high-speed Surtees-like interface. It's not a, a wide AIB-like interface. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's just opti optimized it to save power. Taking your high-speed Surtees, which PCI Express is a high, very high-speed Surtees, and um, being able to um, take out a few figure things. that yeah. for short-reach applications. Right. Yeah. And right. so uh, it just offers a ton of flexibility and does not and require advanced packaging. Do you know what the reach is, Bill? Um, well, I think it, it can probably be tuned in the sense that, um, that it's configurable. So inside a package, the reach Two is inches, probably 50. Two inches, a couple inches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. It's not on. About how intense this one is. OK. OK. Uh, so the Kevy Leak uh, G. Uh, device. When you had the AMD graphics chip, 
presumably that was built to work on coos with the hbm did, exactly did the chip have to get adapted in order to and redesigned in order to be compatible with i think uh, that there unit? was um one back end layer that needs uh now if this is something that you really want to do i mean it wasn't like a chip redesign is kind of um like probably more like an RTL kind of uh, and uh, and also um, to ensure the materials uh, system proper build. So it's um, that's a, it's a really good example of being able to take a board level fit and put it inside a package. It wasn't completely seamless. Mm -hmm. There were some things that needed to be modified in order to accomplish that. Were there thermal issues and stuff like? That? Um, well, yes, and. But but manage, and so that's also where we learn, uh, you know, very clearly that th there's a lot of thermal issues to take these um, components from a board and put them inside a package. But it's nothing that we couldn't figure out how to manage. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of challenges with that approach, but it's the first time that we've done it, and so everything that we learned can be applied to the next. Time I have one other question. Um, in your list of pros and cons for disintegration, you said yield, but but I, I was wondering, like, is there a significant advantage to the ability to narrow your distributions if you're taking multiple chips and being able to select from, you know, hot parts and cold parts to get the product? There is, if you can actually test your parts at wafer level sort to get that granularity of performance. Um, yeah, there can be real upside in terms of yield if you can test things properly uh, and completely. So, um, you know, it's really interesting because people talk about the yield benefits all the time, but the three examples that I showed really had nothing to do with that. So the early proof points of this ecosystem and these the benefits of this technology um, are, are uh, well over and above kind of any kind of yield benefits, but you know there there are yield benefits if you uh, and but you'll still pay the price, the overhead for the die to die interface. So um, it's really a trade off in terms of yield and and the overhead for that die to die. Interface. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to uh, ask again about the pipe new P PCI pipe interface. Um, I think one of your slides, you said that there's potential to go down by a factor of 5 to 10 when we go from board to package. But then you mentioned the power saving is only 50%. So uh, oh, what happened oh, yeah. to, the, to the 5X? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So it's um, probably just a matter of um, kind of explaining this a little bit more clearly. So I think this is this one of the slides, probably. The slides. So uh, you can get a really great improvement in power efficiency when you go to these extremely wide interfaces. Um, but when you're taking a board level interface, in this case, 7 to 20 picojoules per bit, and you didn't actually change the interface, like you didn't change to, to be able to take advantage of the increase in wire density, you're not going to get this benefit unless you've actually done something to increase your, you know, you, how, how many wires you're using. The the pipe spec that I'm describing is taking the same board level 30s with the two to 15 lines per millimeter per layer um, and the seven to 20 picojoules per bit power able to tune this down by 50%, but you're not changing the interface, you're not changing the wire density, you're just changing the distance that uh, that signal is traveling. So you're basically going from a board level distance to a package level distance, but you're not increasing the wire density so you can get a 50% uh, reduction in power. Does that help explain it? It does, but I guess you're saying that we are using the same series, but we do certain optimization. But what if you use or also support the USR series for the 
for the case of, of for PCI, what happens there? Do we get like an X? Well, if you use, you mean one of these like AIB? No, yeah, we still at the serial domain, right? So, so using and, the yeah, and it's domain? MCM, so you don't have that word. Then it's I think just, you'll be in the range of one to two. Well, that's 10x, but that's why I was saying, how come pipe only gives 2x? Because pipe, because we're still using a board level 30. Okay, that's yeah. good. That's good. I think one of the reasons that um, you have seven to Tony because you're using a LR service, and LR service is designed to uh, drive all the way to a backplane or copper cable. Right. So if you optimize for something like a VSR or something on board, I think probably that number instead of being one to two may end up to be like three, like a four maybe. So I think that's why on board is so large because you have one, you know, like a superset. Thirty the drive that does everything. That's right. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. So our next speaker is Animesh, and uh, he's actually going to ma make some more news, I guess. And news? <laughs> wow. A long time no see, huh? Let's uh, switch the presentation. All right, while Bapi is taking it to full screen. Well, I do some crazy stuff here at Intel. Uh, for the uh, past few years, uh, I've been involved with uh, domain-specific accelerator in uh, video analytics, uh, edge-based uh, stuff and all that. And uh, <clears throat> my wife tells me that I look very old because of all this, but uh, I always tell her that I'm very young, and uh, based on what Ramuni just said, it makes me feel even younger that there's a lot of things that still needs to be done in this exciting you know, chiplet uh, ecosystem. So I'm gonna take uh, <clears throat> your mind off from all these interconnects and dyes and power and uh, thing, and take it to uh, a domain where um, I feel um, we have uh, a bigger role to play. Uh, <clears throat> go to the uh, one. Um, obviously, this is a boilerplate, so uh, I can't escape this as long as I'm here. Uh, <clears throat> so Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, you know, that specific line. But I say that I have a vision here. And that vision here is to make uh, the chiplets in a manner that are very fast to, you know, produce. Now, we all, I, I believe all of us here are from that uh, background of fitting out, you know, uh, medium to complex, you know, simple SOCs of, you know, various types. And we have seen all this effort that people have to put in, right? Uh, each and every individual SOC that gets designed, whether as a chiplet or as a uh, distributed, uh, you know, stuff, has to go through a lot of rigor. And each company has to bear that burden on their own, starting from the concept, RTL, you know, to all validation, verification, post-silicon, and then finally putting it onto the uh, package, testing it, and then bringing it to the customer, right? Uh, humongous, you know, deal here. So I let all the packaging guys and the interconnect and Phi guys to deal with the, the interconnect. I'll focus more on, uh, on, uh, on the vision that how do we pool resources in the, in the industry, right? And make such a framework where it can be leveraged by all companies and uh, thereby shortening the amount of time it takes to get the uh, quote unquote, you know, chip out, right? So that's the uh, crazy vision that I have. Um, it includes uh, 
um, uh, you know, a standardization of uh, the tool flows that uh, that people will have to, you know, come come up with, and uh, and uh, we have started taking, you know, some steps in that direction. So uh, what we are going to present is uh, work in progress. That's the announcement I have. But I would like to uh, introduce this thing to you folks and see um, are there, you know, participation stuff, you know, available, and then we'll, you know, present, you know, more details on it as we go. The idea here is that the IPs that you buy in a soft form today integrate, take all the effort to get it to a production. How can the uh, chiplet be done as an IP in a, in, in a hardware domain that easily with the, the customers uh, thinking uh, that everything is okay? Um, they are delighted by the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the compatibility and cross compliance and all of that one. So that's a that that's a crazy order, and uh, I, I I bring this vision to my group, and I require more crazier people than me to implement those. I just give them the vision, I show them the road. So um, I like to invite uh, even more crazier person than me in my group, Rob Adler, Robert Adler here, uh, and you will see the difference, right? So please welcome, you know, Robert. All yours. Show them your crazy idea. Uh, well, you can hear me. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so as Animesh was saying, well, maybe you didn't say, but we're part of a, a group here that uh, does more front-end related work. So we're related to uh, somewhat tools, flows, and methods, somewhat design infrastructure, somewhat when I, when I talk about packaging, packaging to me is how do I package up IPs for easy integration, and not just across, you know, from a front-end design perspective, but across all, all specific domains required to actually build that chip. So uh, we use packaging later in these slides. It's, it's really referring to that definition of packaging. Um, one of the ways we look at this problem around here, or one of the ways that our particular group looks at this problem is from a design infrastructure perspective, that one of the things we're trying to do, one of the things we have been doing, one of the things we've been building chips with um, is this sort of design infrastructure where um, fundamentally it's based on a, on a somewhat intelligent build system where the design aspects, the things that come out of it are mostly abstracted away. So the inputs to the system are some sort of architecture. I need to know the type of chip that I'm building. I need to know the types of thing I, I expect to go into it. Um, but then there's machine readable specs that end up configuring the rest of everything else. So when we talk about, as an example, one of these machine-readable specs, we're talking about things that configure fabrics, things that configure, um, let's say fabric, by the way, that's on die fabric, on die interconnect, um, things that configure the types of CPU cores, their, um, their parameters, things like that. Um, the way we enable our system here to reason about this is about relating to building a quote-unquote chassis. This definition of chassis is sort of based similar to what you think of in a car, you know. If you, if you follow autom automobile manufacturing, many mo automobile manufacturers talk about how, you know, they share that common chassis. They, they share the design infrastructure. It might be based on, you know, you might see a bunch of different vehicles that leverage that same base component, and then you plug in your value add. Um, in that context here, our chip design infrastructure is, you know, we have some sort of N, quote, unquote, chassis subsystems that are always present. I'll, I'll get into what a subsystem means in a second, but any of these things are always there. I need, I need to clock it, I need to power manage it, I need to get out of reset, food, et cetera, et cetera. But then these IP subsystems, you know, Ramuni talked about value add IP. I want to be able to drop in that graphic. If I have graphics, I probably have some display to go with it. Maybe I have imaging. Who knows what it is? Uh, in the chiplet domain, there's obviously this, you know, this package to package interface, things like that. That's potentially a chassis thing potential in IP subsystems. It's a matter of how I'm putting this thing together. The key thing, though, is that we want to be able to package this stuff up. Again, my definition of package. Throw this into our build system, and we're able to reason about this using this build system. And the end result here is a bunch of different collateral outputs. So we talk about developing hardware. We want to be able to do, you know, obviously, RTL models. We like RTL because that eventually gets us to a, a chip design. Um, but as part of that, we need to be able to simulate it because that's how we tend to validate these things. But you know, as part of that solution, there's emulation and, valid and FPGA solutions as well. 
um, key thing there is enabling consistent by construction, um, you know, collateral out, you know, or model output. And normally, if you're a chip head, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, my RTL goes right into the FPGA, goes in the simulator, goes in the emulator. Yeah, it's all the same. Yeah, but except for where it's not, where I have to swap out different clocking things, different files, different models to make that work. Um, similarly, I need to verify it, so I have S bands, verification content, etc. Structural design collateral as well. Um, maybe one thing that's maybe different here, one of the things we think about a lot is also the software development angle on this as well. So um, there are these, I don't know, we like virtual platforms. Uh, virtual platforms are, uh, I'll get into in a second, but think of it as a software simulator that if I'm simulating my design using different models at a different layer of abstraction, I need to make sure that these things are consistent. Um, Similarly, the concept of hybrid. Hybrid, I'll get into in a second as well, but the basic gist is I have these different models of abstraction, FPGA, emulation, simulation, this virtual platform. But if I have chiplets that I want to be able to compose together, I want to be able to compose those models together as well in order to enable us to um, verify that these chiplets work together as a system before we spend a lot of money on our packaging. Because we already established our packaging and whatnot it's expensive. I sure would want to try it out before I spent that money or in, and try to increase our ability to make this happen. Um, briefly talk about what a subsystem is or what, what we, how we define that here, how, we, how we're using that in the context of these slides. So it's all about abstracting away uh, the logical components that are required for some quote unquote architectural function. So classic example here would be a controller in a FI. You know, I have a PCI Express controller, we were talking about pipe a second ago. You know, pipes that interface between the controller and the PHY. But normally when I build an actual monolithic SOC, I need both. We don't want to necessarily take someone else's. We want to make sure those things work together. So we package them together as a quote unquote architectural function. We don't talk about, oh, I had a pipe. When I sell my chip, I don't say, oh, I had a pipe interface on it. I said I had PCI Express. Those two pieces, that's what the customer sees. Um, you know, similarly for our fabrics, our fabrics are sort of, we think of that as one subsystem. It's um, you know, our clocking, it's a, it's a subsystem, it's how I want to stitch this thing together, it's all aspects of that. Furthermore, it's all the pieces needed for all aspects of the integration behind there. So register descriptions, how to compile it, synthesis collateral, the RTL itself, obviously. Um, we just heard about uh, IEEE Center. I, I didn't know about that IEEE Center, so thank you for educating me. Uh, but that would be a piece. If there's this IP or a chiplet that comes with a description of that, I need to be able to relate these pieces together. I need to in my definition of packaging, I need to package those together, bundle them together, enable the system to reason about that. Um, in this world, for a chiplet, we see the chiplet to chiplet interface becoming one of these subsystems. It's ideally on the shelf. If I'm building a bunch of chiplets, I don't want to redo that, that thing. If it's especially if we get to a point where it is standardized, I need to be able to interface my value add IP to it, but I don't necessarily need to change anything else about it. But I need the system if I have to reconfigure it, if I need to um, you know, make it work in any, any way, other way, shape, or form. I still need to be able to reason about it. Um, you know, and standardizing the, inter, the silicon, sorry, the on-die interface to that, it's just a piece. You know, we, you know, I think Ramuni Slides had AXI and various Ambus things and whatnot on it. It's just a piece of it. It's a necessary, but um, not completely sufficient condition to make this all work. Uh, talk about BPs for a second, what a virtual platform is. I'm not sure how many people here have ever seen this, used it. Um, high level gist is that we combined, and by the way, this is not an Intel thing, this has existed for, you know, we've used it here for, I'd say a really long time, uh, approaching a decade, if, if I'm allowed to say that, which I guess I just did. Um, it's existed in other places for, for along the same time, if not longer. The key thing is that it's combining, it's not, you know, traditionally back, you know, back in the day, we talked about a core instruction set simulator. I had a processor core, I wanted to run code on, I wanted to see how that worked. But that's just essentially model the core. Uh, when we talk about how do I make that work, how do I make that look like a real system, I need models or similar models that are, you know, functional representations of the other IPs. So we combine system C, software accurate system C models, using the term software accurate, because it's not necessarily the performance side. Performance is good, we want to do that as well. 
Um, but these are the bit accurate descriptions. You know, if it has a register that does, I don't know, say it turns on a clock, or a register that does something, software's gonna write that. I wanna be able to model it, or at least model that software, that there's storage there that software can come and poke at, whether it actually turns on a clock, because it's different, that piece doesn't matter. But the key is that software can interact with it. And then when I combine this core instruction set simulator, aka the model of a core, the models of these IPs, and I can make that, you know, if I'm making it into a system, I need the interconnect as well. I need something that says, well, these things are talking to each other. This is the memory map. We combine that all together and we call the resulting thing a virtual platform. Um, I suppose the industry calls it virtual not platform, not just us. So um, focus of kind of the rest of the other pieces here, we didn't have a lot of time to talk here, but we wanted to get across the point that we want to look at this, or my group at least, when we look at this chiplet problem, we're thinking about how to actually build the chiplets as well. And uh, have a bunch of validation friends, and the only thing that they're gonna say is, well, cool, you put these things together, and well, how am I gonna validate that this chiplet works? Not only that this chiplet worked, but it worked with the next one, and it worked with the third one in our, you know, Ramuni gave a couple of examples where there were like three of them stacked together. I think other people will talk about other cases where there's more of them. We want to be able to test this. We want software to work. We want, you know, not just to show that it's validated physically, but we want to be able to test out this software and start developing it, even if one of these chiplets hasn't even been created yet. So when we talk about a consistent VP, this is all about, you know, using our build system to assemble a virtual platform, meaning I have a, you know, part of this packaging would say, you know, not just these are the RTL models, but this is the system C model. This is the the VP model that is co coincident, that's correlated with that model, enabling our system to actually stitch these things together, but with different views. So when we assemble our RTL model, we use that same information. You can imagine if we can assemble an RTL model, we can have all the information to assemble a, high, a higher level abstraction of the same thing. Um, the end result is, you know, similarly, we want to be able to uh, use the same tools that you use when you're actually testing things out. You want this virtual prototype to look and feel and be used exactly how you would, you know, interact with the final thing, whether it was an FCG, an SSC, or whatever. You want, you know, people to be able to make use of it. Um, I can deliver it to people ahead of time. Maybe I don't have this model yet. If I'm building, you know, say, um, I'll make up something off the top of my head. I'm building PCI Gen 7. It doesn't exist yet. There's some registers PCI SIG will put in there. I want my software to be able to talk to it now. I want to be able to make use of it, but maybe the IP doesn't exist yet, but I want to enable people to get a head start on, on that work. Um, the final piece here that's actually important I should mention is this hybrid concept. So the, we use hybrid, hybrid models around here where one piece of this design is in a virtual platform. Say the CPU side, it's a VP, you know, that enables cores and various other things to be modeled at a higher level of abstraction, they run faster, but then maybe the other side of the world, the things attached to it are actual RTL emulation type things or FPGA type things. Um, when we get into composing chiplets, we want to be able to, I think there's a theme today, or I believe there's a theme today about composing new and existing things, right? I don't know what I don't have right now, but I want to be able to take this new design, and if that new design has the same type of collateral, if I get the same compatible views, simulation, in this, at the moment, simulation, FPGA, emulation, virtual platform, test collateral and whatnot with all these pieces, I can mix and match how these pieces come together in order to enable an end validation strategy and an end composability story before I actually um, spend money on these expensive packages. Um, or similarly, maybe I, maybe I did spend money on the, those expensive packages, but maybe I don't have the ability to give them out to the whole world yet. Maybe it's just working inside but I want a bunch of people to be able to make use of this. In that case, I can compose my virtual platforms from all these different chiplet, chiplets, give it to people. What it is, it's a simulator. It runs on your PC. It runs on your PC. Yeah, sure, it runs slower. But it's a lot cheaper. It's just your PC. It's not like some FPGA board or some emulation farm, something that I have to spend a bunch of money on in order to maybe give it out to my other people. Now, when I spend that money, I get a benefit. So we want to enable people to make use of that benefit. Um, and the end result is that the key piece here is being able to compose this stuff, getting standard views, being able to have that VP, have that, you know, that virtual prototype combined in all these other modes in order to make this happen. Um, I think I had a 20-minute slot. I think at this point I'm probably out, out of that 20 minutes, so we'll just go to a quick summary. So 
uh, the VP part, it's not just about, you know, there's a piece of it that's enabling early modeling, virtual platform, you know, some of these system C models are A, about enabling early modeling for software people, but also it's about uh, being able to compose these things, give, give the resulting hybrid models, you know, VP composed models, et cetera, all your people um, make that happen. Uh, the chassis piece, chassis integration, so for us that's a proven success locally for integration uh, in order to build these chips, in order to build not just SOCs with the past, but chiplets of the future. Um, and then obviously standard TFM, you know, being able to say as part of, say, advanced standards or future standards, saying these are the views we want to be able to see, this is the formats that we expect, enabling this type of composability. What we're looking, what, what we'd like to see as well. So, with that, thank you. Very nice. Now I know where you are spending your time, Robert. Sleeping. No, I'm oh, sorry, not doing that. <laughs> All right. So, and questions, folks, for us? Yeah. Well, if you had that bagel and coffee there, you know, your voice would be loud. And you know. thank you. So, there you go. so I think you advocated for. Um, System level modeling and uh, that no no argument about that. And I think because the systems are becoming more heterogeneous, that's that's important. What I couldn't get uh, out of it is that how the chiplet ecosystem, when we come to chiplets, uh, is differentiated from the trend for system level modeling and whatever we have to do for SOCs and stuff like that. In your opinion, how how do you think this dynamic plays a role? when we are going into chiplets, and how, do, how does it affect the stuff that you are advocating for? That's a good question. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect it. It might accelerate some aspects of it. It could be that um, simply the fact that, you know, today when I go to an IP, an IT vendor, I might not actually get a VP model, system C model of it. I might, I might, I, I might get a performance-only model, I might get a register-only model. Maybe if I'm lucky, I get both, depending on the quality of that vendor. I mean, the I think the need going forward is simply to ensure, you know, whether I had that for my individual IPs or not, the composed system, I think the same is being made is that it needs, it's not just that it needs to be there, but I need to be able to reason about that, you know, what that contained, ensure that it was correlated, ensure that it would match, such that when I compose the final system, I'm able to make that happen. So it's not necessarily that it's, you know, any different or any of those trends. It's just calling out the need to make that happen and then calling out the standards for how this would be packaged together in order to ensure that, you know, when I get that chiplet, you know, that I'm able to see those different views of making it happen. Also, the hybrid, the hybrid angle is not necessarily something that you see on an IP level view because, you know, maybe I'd, if I built an FPGA, say, out of someone else's IP, I did it myself. It's not that they gave me that view. And here it's really about, you no, know, maybe that FPGA build or ability to build that chiplet is something that <coughs> me. Hi. So in the previous talk, we uh, learned about board to package flow, and there is another one that is SOC to package. So in one scenario, you have a system that exists on the board that you are trying to convert to a chiplet-based design. The other one is where you have a hypothetical single chip that you want to implement using a advanced packaging. So your talk seems to talk about the second one, which is more like SOC to package. So the question that I have is what would be a analog of this approach when you're going from a board level solution to a package solution? I'm not sure there's actually a difference. So uh, oddly enough, our, uh, so we, Animesh and I actually share a common manager and uh, our common manager talks about these things as, you know, when we talk, we talk about chassis, we show that, that sort of picture. Uh, he talks about this as, uh, he's using the phrase silicon motherboard. And in a way it's like being able to like, the, the key thing about a motherboard level interface is, you know, I, I it was a physical slot. I had PCI Express, PCI back in the day, ISO, whatever it was. There was only so many things I could plug into it. It had to have that connector. When I go on die, 
you know, the parallel to going from 30s to those higher speed, wider lengths, you know, that Rumuni was talking about is I get more wires, I get more flexibility. That means I get more create. I also can be more creative. And um, the key thing is, I think, in, at the beginning of this talk was about having that standard chassis where I can reason about how to integrate these pieces together, whether that meant it was a simple, you know, say one interface thing with a very defined, this has to be clock reset DM for it, like PCI Express card, or on the other direction, I need to be able to reason about it if it was something on an SOC or was IP based with much more um, flexibility and creativity. Either way, I have to be able to understand that, reason about it, package it up so that I can make use of it, you know, in a reason in, in a machine reasonable way to. to, to well said. Uh, I just want to add one more point here. You, Imagine when you do this uh, board type, you know, design, when you go from board to package, the number of hours of validation time, cumulative number of hours that all companies, those who have used that board or that interface, whatever, have put together. So you get a very reliable and a robust uh, interface and a solution. We want to bring the same thing by making it in such a manner that uh, this environment is able to leverage each company's, you know, specific design methodologies or a common set of uh, things that this, you know. So I have a follow-on question. So in ODSA, we are trying to do a proof of concept, which is literally taking three dies from three companies and we're trying to put them together. So we are thinking about a similar issue. And one of the challenges that we have that we are seeing is it's hard enough to get, you know, chiplets and, and uh, uh, data sheets from all the participants, we go one level more and say, okay, we need your transaction level models and all of that, right? Uh, what, what, are, what is the bare minimum that we need to do to make this kind of approach work in your opinion? Um, <laughs> my, <laughs> I must introduce me as being a little crazy here, but <laughs> um, I think when I look at that type of problem, the undertone of what you're kind of saying to me is like, oh, man, I have to do all this manual work. I have to create another transaction-level model. I have to make this work. And to me, when I hear these problems, I think of, you know, the, the, one of those first slides we showed was the build system, right? We have, you know, we've been working towards approaches where building those transactional, transaction-level models, building the pack, packaging all this together is so like think of it as if it were an order of magnitude easier for you to, for your vendors to produce that transaction level model i'm going to guess maybe they're not going to push back as hard or maybe your expectation will be raised or maybe a little bit of both so a lot of this is about um, enabling people to use the pieces that were already that they might have already had composing in a way that the machine was able to reason about it and then that produces the next level up you're right, if I have to do a transaction level model of the whole chiplet, that's hard. But if the people, but the reality is I, I got the pieces that went in that thing from other people. If they enabled it, which as good IP vendors they should have, my next level up is I just have to compose it. And if I'm able to compose that VP model consistently with my RTL model with zero additional work or maybe very small percentage, like single digit if not less, um, you know, additional work, I think you see the likelihood of that type of thing go up. So do you envision that all these chiplet providers in open market would be required to provide transaction level model collateral when they sell these chiplets? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's our vision. That's what we want uh, the forum to, uh, you know, kind of drive. We are trying to prototype a few things on our side, as Robbie said, that parts of these things, you know, have been at existence, you know, at, at Intel, uh, Intel, and uh, we want to put it together and open it to the uh, public view. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, there are no more questions. Thanks.
last I heard. Food comes to someone else. Intel's been really nice. Animation, Ahmad, they're providing not just the room, but all the food as well. And Cynthia, who's out there. Uh, 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 yeah. And um, that, so we've, we've got a very full agenda. OK, I want to spend, I will get off. So if you're here, you're here for this, for the ODSA group. It's, this is a new OCP subgroup. Um, we sit at the intersection of domain-specific architectures and chiplets. Um, I am really hoping, at least Ali Reza will interrupt me with a question halfway through. Um, so, but you know, please feel free to stop me um, at any moment. Or uh, simply put, what we're about is how do we integrate, create, maybe, be able to make products by integrating chiplets from multiple vendors and creating an open interface to make that aggregation possible. Um, so our basic, what we're trying to do is make multiple chiplets need that function as though they're in one die. Um, so this is our standard reference architecture. What we're trying to build is the stack. Essentially, you need some kind of a, a stack between the chiplets. As a group, we're trying to define this stack. Um, and one of the things that we got uh, after we sort of, you know, we, but one of the things you'll notice is if you came to our earlier conference or you came to this new one, we're trying to make the stack technology independent. So we're trying to say, look, it should be orthogonal to the what kind of substrate you use, what kind of file layer technology you use. Um, and that's where this pipe adapter, I was really excited to see Ramone talk about that in her talk, that um, where I, I think Brian from Tandu gets a lot of credit for this, for this idea, and he has a, uh, Brian has a 
app node for the Candu uh, for, for the Candu Fi, uh, pipe adapter for the Candu Fi. Um, late, we have done a pretty decent job of defining the uh, de uh, de defining what the requirements on the file layer, and I'll come to our progress in a minute. We're now going to start. Uh, Dave Kellett, if he walks in, we'll talk, we'll talk about the link layer in the next next talk, and a routing layer, which uh, my company Netronome has a technology that we'd like to offer as a starting point. Um, and finally, the transport layer, uh, which is this idea of what kind of coherent and non-coherent memory protocol. So basically, the basic theme that we're following is that you need a memory abstraction between the cooperating chiplets in a system. That's the basic theme. Oh, you're here. Sorry, you were using, you were sitting there. All right. Um, um, so the basic theme we're following is that you need a memory abstraction. For that, you have coherent memory protocols and non-coherent memory protocols. Um, it turns out in practice, from what I can tell, the greatest area of diversity or disagreement, depending on how you phrase it, is at the bottom of the stack and at the top of the stack. In between, there's lots of room for agreement. Um, so this is the, <laughs> if, you can, if you can sort of abstract away the bottom and the top, we're in business, we have a lot of things that we can agree on. That's the basic, uh, uh, basic goal of the group. So this is my begging slide. Usually it's in the end saying, please help us. This time I decided it's way, very important to beg up front. So um, we really want every, one of the coolest things about this effort is every uh, two weeks to four weeks, somebody really smart shows up to add a lot of value to the group um, from companies big and small. We have three work streams, um, and I'll come to each of these work streams in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, as we go along. Actually, you'll hear updates about these work streams. The one in the middle is defining the stack. Mark, who's sitting here, um, is looking for more people to help him. And Mark and Aaron from Facebook, who isn't here, but DJ is here somewhere. Um, and we have done, so we've had good participation from uh, Zglu, a, a bunch of companies. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through this. And the file layer, we're looking to grow part of, we're looking to start a link layer analysis effort. We've got Ramin, who's sitting over there somewhere, uh, who's, oh, sorry, here, uh, who's, who's worked with uh, Mark on this. Um, then the second thing we're doing is we put a lot of effort into building prototypes and POCs, building a prototype with current die. You saw Jawad, who's asked a lot of questions about this, and the friend Jawad and Quinn, who's sitting here, they do this effort, and we have a panel-like discussion in the afternoon. We've got JP and Samtech. Where is the uh, um, Samtech and uh, Larry Zoo from Sarcina? We've got a pretty nice effort, and there's a good report out in the afternoon on this effort. And finally, Sam is doing this um, uh, this business. How, do, how does business change when you do chiplets? And in kind of a weird way, we made this. This has been a fairly constant slide for about three, um, about six months now. I think it kind of mirrors your what Ramona said in her talk, and it's just kind of nice to see that the the way the problems decompose inside Intel kind of roughly mirrors the way the problems being decomposed outside in an open effort. And it's nice to see both of these lining up. Um, here's where I'm hoping to see a show of hands saying, where do I sign up? Uh, and please you know, sign up with us with any, in any, I'm gonna walk you through. So I want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about why domain specific architectures. Um, what, so why domain-specific architectures is fairly, uh, fairly interesting. I think it was uh, at the last Open Compute Summit, um, Vijay Rao from Facebook said something about domain-specific architectures being the fourth element of the data center uh, behind compute, network, and storage. And the basic idea is that you're, um, you're able to do something, you're able to execute high-intensity workloads much more efficiently on domain-specific architectures that you see 5 to 10x uh, power performance improvement. I think I'm already speaking to an audience that's sort of well aware of this. I'm not going to burn too many cycles on this. And so there's a lot of data published on the Google TensorFlow um, device. So that's how um, you usually use that as a starting point for discussions on the public domain. Um, my own company makes domain-specific architecture for networking. And the interesting thing in both of these things is they both contain, the Google, Google TPU contains multiply accumulate logic for machine learning and inferencing, whereas the Netronome uh, device contains lots of lightweight threads because that's the kind of processing you do in networking. Right? And if you haven't seen this, I'd really, um, 
recommend that you burn a few, uh, an hour or so reading that lecture, A New Golden Age for Computer Architecture from uh, uh, Hennessy and Patterson. I think it was a Turing lecture last year. And, but the, it's in the communications of ACM in February. It's, but the, the video and the, and the, the, and the write-up are well worth your time. Uh, right, and um, actually, you know what? This, this audience is already convinced of chiplets. I don't know why I'm burning cycles on this, but yeah, you know, I, 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 unless we can get, uh, I think I've got the original source, Gabe, sitting here in the audience, so maybe he can speak to the picture on the left about AMD chiplets and how you can uh, uh, cut up large die. This wonderful chart on the right is from Mark here, and um, it basically says, look, we, the, the, the basic idea is that you can get a lot of the benefits of a process shrink by doing an integration, right? And it's a, that, that, that's the basic message. So there, the whole idea is that you can either do, and it, you can do chiplets for IP reuse and integration, or you can use chiplets because you want to break up a large die, but in both cases, uh, chiplets are go, uh, chiplets solve some interesting problems, and so where we sit is at the intersection of chiplets for domain-specific architectures. And the motivation here is very very straightforward. After wading through a whole range of public domain and uh, uh, commercial and academic accelerators, I think we sort of hit the conclusion that. Only about 60 to 65% of an accelerator is actually domain specific. There's about 35 to 40%, which is common, commodity, well, it depends on whether you call it commodity IP or not, but common IP across a whole bunch of accelerators that something like network IO, uh, memory IO, general purpose CPU, onboard CPU, all of these are common. So there's the accelerator, domain specific architectures lend themselves to a lot of reuse because normally you would buy these as IP, but instead you could reuse that IP as chiplets. That's the sort of working theory behind our group. And that we're defining this as a reference architecture that you can sort of say, look, I have a marketplace of IO chiplets or a switching chiplet or a CPU chiplet available. I'm gonna reuse them and I'm gonna make my own new domain specific project and produce a, a, a domain specific architecture really quickly, cheaply, by reusing a lot of IP. And, and also, I think domain-specific architectures, I have absolutely no data to, corab, uh, to support my claim yet, but I, I think domain-specific architectures accelerate the mismatch between processing logic and external I.O. So in general, they tend to be larger because they have to squeeze more memory on it to buffer the, to make up for that difference. So my working theory is domain-specific architectures actually tend to be larger than uh, because of this uh, because of this greater mismatch, so you may have a large die problem as well. So, <clears throat> and the, uh, I mean, this is an audience sort of convinced of the benefits of heterogeneous integration, but it sort of is, you know, one of the advantages that you can obviously see is that, hey, not this, this entire, all of these chiplets need not be at the same process node. I can put my investment in my, uh, at the most advanced process node, I can limit it to the most, uh, to my domain specific logic chiplets from other older process nodes uh, for the commodity function. So that's, this is our working theory. Um, uh, any questions, anything else? Okay. So ultimately, if we do our job right, the, our, our, the, the second part of our working theory is that we are going to define this stack, which essentially creates a fabric that integrates across all the chiplets. And as long as all the chiplets support the stack in some fashion, they're going to be interoperable, and you can mix and match them in various ways. And this stack will essentially be a, a network, and it's like any classic network, it should have a router, it should have a link layer between, between chiplets, a link layer on die, and you should have fabric agents by which various logic elements actually talk to the fabric stack. But essentially, if you buy the fact that, if you buy the theory that memory is the abstraction by which you glue all the chiplets together, there should be no functional difference between a memory reference that goes off die versus a memory reference that goes on die. You may see a performance difference, but there shouldn't be a functional difference that the programmer sees, that they're, they're both called the same way. And that we need to make this fabric to glue all of these, um, to glue, glue all of these uh, chiplets together. Okay. So one of the things that Dave Killett said when we were 
uh, putting the program for this together, they said, I don't see a whole bunch of accelerator stuff on this. I see a lot of chiplets, but no accelerators. So this is our working theory of how, how all this glue together. So basically, accelerators drive the requirements for our work. Chiplets are the means to glue accelerators together. Uh, it may be that the means that we use to glue chiplets together can be extended to other domains, but fundamentally, we the, so far, we sort of viewed our requirements through the prism of accelerators. And there are a whole bunch of OCP sockets, right? This, this is three. There's about six or seven sockets that we counted. There's like a, 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 a bunch of server, right, TJ? There's a whole bunch of server landing zones. There's a whole bunch of OCP sockets you could land in. These are three as an example. This is an OCP OA, OAM card. Um, that's a NIC 3.0 card. This is a very small form factor M.2 card, which is 10 watts. And the idea is that you now need a, each of these has very different power, I.O., footprint, and performance constraints, and that you need a stack which is capable of scaling across these, so you'll assemble chiplets. What we want to do is really create this, a stack-compliant, interoperable chiplet marketplace, what we have are essentially what the two things we're trying to do is to define the stack and then create a bunch of reference architectures. So use those reference architectures to guide and then define a workflow. Use the reference architectures from the marketplace. You build a workflow to assemble products that can scale and meet these requirements. This is sort of how all our act, this is our working theory on how the various disparate work streams in our group fit together. And we're looking to have more people um, join us in, the, in this effort. All right? Um, so we, you can, our efforts right now are focused on the stack, a prototype, and a reference architecture, a base reference architecture. Um, we are beginning to think about this workflow, and we're, we, are, we really don't have much by way in terms of the uh, chiplet marketplace. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, you logged off. But not voluntarily. Oh well, it's luckily. <laughs> but but I made one new slide just for this. All right, rewind. <laughs> just for this. Because when you said here's a white one. Yeah, I thought it was a. Sorry, right. folks online. No one said anything. Okay. I think they. Oh, I I know what I forget it. I screwed up. My bad. Okay. Please don't see my email. <laughs> it's pretty boring. It's more than anything else. Like. There. No, no, no. It's just wrong. <laughs> I can't. This Groucho Marx thing. I don't want to belong to any club that will have me. All right. Okay. Uh, this is my one new slide, so I'm happy. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, for so this is this is how we see the scope of our work group. This is we are a new sub project inside the OCP server project. We essentially want to make this marketplace, define tools to grab chiplets from the marketplace, assemble them into working product that meets a wide range of stack form factor requirements. That's, that's, uh, that's essentially our scope as a working group. Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, the, the, this is just some bragging because we're excited about all the people here, but you know, I, I think fundamentally I'm almost um, 
I, I, we, we've come to the point where I've convinced everybody or all of us have believe in that when we may not have the right solution, but we have the right problem. That's, that's, a, that, that, that's the one thing we all agree on. That we're, we're somehow in the right neighborhood of solving the right problem, even if we're not doing the right, um, right answer for that. Um, we're pretty excited at the rate at which we, uh, uh, we've grown. We meet weekly. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we have project updates. We meet weekly on Fridays. So, so far, there's enough to talk on other than our kids and everything. So, you know, there's a, enough to go on. Uh, a lot of the material, including today's stuff, is going to be on the wiki. So you can find a lot of the material from our, uh, uh, from our workshops, from the weekly meetings, everything else on the wiki. Please join us. Um, please join us at, uh, if you can. OK. So in terms of progress, what have we done? Uh, where do we need help? I sort of, this, this is a boring text slide, but if, this is, if, if you take away nothing else, I want to, want to take a, give you these two slides as a starting point for how you can engage with, uh, with the current participants in the group. We have essentially four efforts that we have spent time on. The top three, what we started with, the fourth, which is kind of actually related to what Ramune uh, spoke about in her talk a few minutes ago, right? Let me just go through them in order. Um, the first thing we did was there is a lot of, um, you know, diversity is the word. There is diversity in the file layer, right? You've got this notion of a high. Essentially, in my mind, it can be broken down into two basic things. Do you build your interchiplet interconnect from on die, which means the wide parallel bus, or do you build your interchiplet interconnect from off package, which means the high speed serial bus? Right? So they really boil, seems to boil down to that range of options, and some va some variants derived from these. Right? And so one of the first things we did was we had a pretty decent uh, phi analysis. And what we wanted to do was say, what, can all, even if we can't agree on what the right answer for the phi is, can all of us agree on what the requirements are? And there's a gentleman named Greg Taylor, who used to be at Intel, who's from Zeeglu, who really led a very nice effort to capture this. And we had pretty decent participation from a whole bunch of companies with, um, uh, with phi technologies. And Halil here helped out as well from, uh, from Facebook. And what we did was we said, okay, let's try and figure out um, uh, what the common requirements are. So everybody can be evaluated in the same set of frameworks, and then we map those requirements onto the use models. Um, this is my first analog. We, this is the first analog paper I've written in about 25 years. It's very nice. It was, this is going to be a show up at Hot Interconnect. Um, so our, we uh, both this. This paper will, will essentially is a very nice, in my mind, is a clean way of capturing diversity across these phi analyses, figure out what, what the common requirements are, how each of those phi stacks up for these requirements. And in terms of the next milestone, actually sort of Ramon is still at Andrea, but we were actually hunting with a pipe abstraction, and, and Brian here has volunteered to do something in that space, and maybe combine uh, what Ramon has done with uh, his thoughts in this space. That's what we're looking for. And the area I think there's a lot of room for agreement across files is in operation test and management. That if you can roughly operate test and manage these files using very similar technologies, there's a lot of room for commonality in my mind. Right? So that's the file layer. Now, then the second thing we said was, okay, so you, the interfaces are either derived from on-chip parallel or off-chip, off-package 30s. So predictably, we said that there's not, there's not enough file technology. And said there's a new technology that the idea is that you have a bunch of wires interface, which is somewhat um, derived from the AIB interface, but has faster wires, um, faster, uh, faster wires. So you, and then there's, Ramin here is going to speak more about it immediately after me. Uh, this paper was also accepted at Hort Interconnect, so the, I think we're going to cover some stuff here and some stuff in August at the, the conference is here at Intel again. So we're, the idea is that we have a a parallel interface with fewer wires than AIB, but which can be run on an organic substrate, which has no technology license fees. And so what we're looking for in this is the idea, there are two or three things. One is we're looking for foundry support for test chips. If foundries are interested in making, in helping support the fabrication of test chips. I think there's a lot of room for open source implementations of the basic bunch of wires interface. So if some universities or companies are willing to, um, we, we are willing and interested in doing open source implementations of the basic interface, that would be a very exciting thing in my mind. Um, and then we're looking for chiplet support, either for the basic bow interface or 
where essentially what we'd like to do is, and you'll see that next layer is create a library of potential, at least a design library of chiplets that support this. So these two things we made fairly decent progress. Um, the third aspect that is really put on, put on a lot of heft is this idea of a, um, um, is this idea of a prototype. How do we take devices that exist today and build a prototype, a multi-chiplet package? Um, we've had fairly activity. Uh, we just had a recent burst of participation from JP over there, who's really given us some very nice ideas on a decomposable design flow, and they'll speak to that in the afternoon. Um, the, and finally, I think the, 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 the big change from our most recent thing is we have some sense of what a schedule looks like, that a, a deliverable, doable schedule. Um, what we're lacking here in my mind, or what we're, what we're really hunting for is end user participation in some sense. Um, this is where I'm hoping DJ will look up and say end user participation and, and then some funding. I think the companies involved are funding about 70%, 75% of the cost of the project. And we're looking for that last 25, 30%. Those are our two big asks in this space. Um, I now know what those guys on public radio feel like. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then, this is a relatively new project. It kind of feeds off what Ramuni said about this nice, um, we, you know, all of you had been received emails saying, please take a survey. That survey is essentially what Alex and, uh, Alex was here, but um, Alex and Jawad will uh, dis uh, discuss. And this whole idea is that you need to know about the physicals of a chiplet. It's not just the electrical and logical interfaces that we're talking about in the stack, but that you need some commonality on the physicals. Like, hotspots and uh, X, Y, and Z dimensions and bump maps and where the zero, zero axis is and all sorts of stuff. And so that's, we sent out this survey and the idea is that, you know, Jawad's company has a format, the ZEF format that they hope to use as a starting point for this discussion. And finally, I think Dave is gonna kick off a discussion about the link layer. And hopefully we're looking for more volunteers to participate in that discussion and make it as a, as into engaging a discussion as we had on the file there. These are the five projects that we think we know are in flight. These are four things that have, well, I can't count, five things. Um, they, 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 they're five things that have been requested by uh, uh, people attending the workshop or in one-on-one uh, -on -one in email. The first thing is, you know, the cross chiplet network layer, our company has a fabric that we want to use as a starting point at that uh, for the network layer between chiplets, and then also that ties into the agents that talk to the fabric. Um, the sec this one, the se second thing I want to talk about is the idea of reference architectures. Right now we have what sort of one standard reference architecture. That's kind of a nice fit maybe for uh, smarting applications and maybe for inferencing. Seems like if you take something like learning, not inferencing, learning requires a huge amount of bandwidth between cooperating agents. Right now, we don't have that much I/O bandwidth relative to the um, uh, relative to the uh, core. Uh, excuse me, re re that much of inter um, inter device bandwidth. This is not fabric between chip. This is not bandwidth between chiplets on a package. But the idea is that typically, when you do learning, you implement it across multiple packages. Multiple packages. You need a lot of bandwidth between those devices. So our big ask here is that we need people who are willing to step up and say, "Hey, I'm. I'd like to define a reference architecture for." Learning, I'd like to refine a reference architecture for storage, computational storage, or a different, reference, different reference architectures, because I'm really reasonably confident they will look different from the bare bones reference architecture we have right now. So that's a, a big thing. Um, and the second thing we really, the other thing we really are looking for is this idea that, hey, um, we are looking for chiplet proposals. Not necessarily a commitment to make chiplets, but this idea that, okay, there's an open source interface or there's a no technology fee interface that offers reasonable bandwidth. There's implementations that can be ported reasonably nicely across multiple process nodes. So we're hunting for people to say, okay, I can see how I can make a chiplet with these technologies, and I can make those available either in an organic substrate or a uh, interposer, COAS, whatever other packaging technology. So that's, these are the big things. And the other three are, you'll see, you'll hear more about the pitchlet design flow uh, in, in the afternoon with uh, JP and, and, and uh, Jawad and Quinn. And um, the idea of business workflow, we've learned a lot of stuff from how we do the prototype. Uh, and the most paradoxical thing we've learned is it's very difficult to share confidential information when you're working in an open organization. So 
So yeah, it, it, it is kind of backward, but that, that it turns out that just sharing information that's normally confidential is a huge pain point. We're trying to figure out how do you leverage that learning in some fashion, right? Um, so that's basically it. Um, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, more importantly, I'm happy to take your volunteer labor. So, um, so the, this is the, the, these are our, uh, the rest of our agenda today. Ramin's going to come up right now after me and talk about the uh, Ramin and Mark are going to come up and talk. Yes. Fair, fair. So um, the question was, how, how do we make progress on these proposed projects? And typically, if you look at it, what each of these meet, each of these things is a separate parallel weekly effort. So we have a weekly meeting on the FI. We have a separate weekly, or actually, it turns out multiple meetings on the bunch of wires interface. Um, so the idea is that if there's somebody interested in leading a reference architecture, say for learning, or a reference architecture for storage, that we can kick off. A, um, a a a, a sub-project effort, and somebody would be willing to lead that and round up the right people and part to participate. Uh, that so typically we the way we've kicked it off is we start with a discussion on Friday meetings. Uh, everyone who's interested volunteers, and we go off and as separate groups sort of forms it forms together and reports back in our workshops and the weekly meetings. Perfect. So um, you want to take that in your in, in your talk. I think the question was uh, how how do in terms of foundry support for a bunch of wires interface. Um, I think the short answer is there'd be a lot of interest in that, and then the idea is to meet the foundry support for the test chip, followed by foundry support for uh, chiplets with, that support that interface, etc. So right, maybe Ramin and Mark, you guys could talk to some of that. Uh, in, in your talk in the next 30 minutes. I think Suvi's so, so question is basically, how can a foundry support this effort? And maybe you could spend some cycles on that. Uh, OK, so there you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. You made my day. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. So it turns out that the best we can tell, the difference is in the details, right? Um, so for example, for the, for the, uh, for the link layer, uh, do you want a reliable link layer, or are you happy with the, uh, so you, you may not want error correction in the link layer. Uh, you may, you may, the, the nature of the stack is roughly similar for monolithic devices, but the, the, uh, the details in, in some sense. Oh, I'm sorry. I was comparing it to off package. I, I apologize. So, so for the uh, for, for the for the off off package link layer, the, uh, we're trying to figure out. Okay, where does the reliability requirement get met? Does it get met in the file layer, and you make the link layer really simple, or do you have to actually put in some degree of uh, support in the link layer? Uh, then the other big difference is in latency. How do you hide the impact of latency? So if you do FEC, you typically get a latency hit. So if you do, but if you do uh, if you do error correction in, in space, you you lose some wires between chiplets, and that beachfront bandwidth is very precious. Um, so the difference that that we typically wrestle with is not in the nature of the stack, but the details of the stack. The, yes, the implementation, and and then the fact that the the homo the, the 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 piece that glues it together is the routing layer between that looks the same across fa across chiplets and makes off pa off chiplet memory references look the same and we're really just beginning to look at that but there's i, I think the marvel guys put a lot of effort into this when they tried their open uh, mochi interface ages ago but you need to find some way of giving out the address space and then do you do you make it complex routing or simple routing you say like you know the, so the the best i can tell all the Complexity is in the details where you want to make your off chiplet link have latency similar to an on chiplet link and have a experience similar to an on chiplet link. 
And typically that comes out in terms of latency and this beachfront bandwidth that you're biting off. Does that make sense? Yes. Wait, sorry. We... I don't remember. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank right now. I apologize. I mean, do you remember the... We did. I'm just drawing a complete blank. I apologize. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the, what what Manoj said. I just don't remember. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. So, but the but the oh, wait, wait, say that again slowly. Yeah, sorry. Right. Right. But the but but right between the network and the link, or yeah. vertically. Between yes. It's, well, yeah, yeah it, that, that's a theory, but we're also coming to the conclusion that you shouldn't burden the on chiplet with this pipe abstraction, that you should only burden the off chiplet link with the pipe abstraction. That your on chiplet link layer, so that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the homogeneity should be at the routing layer, you shouldn't, yeah, and that the pipe is, the pipe is there to make the off chiplet links offer a common abstraction to the link layer that you can support a diversity of files, but we don't want to burden the on chiplet links with that. That, that, yes. Oh, but no, you had a question, I thought. Ah. Yes. Uh, so we're just working our way up. So we, we're just sort of saying we, th this is the next pit stop. We ultimately, we need to get there, but that's also the place with the most pitfalls because there's a lot of disagreement on what that coherent transaction layer looks like. There are three or four. Uh, so the non, so non, right, that's right. So if you look at it, we have two options, right? We're saying there's a, there's a non-coherent transport, which is the what we call instruction-driven transfer and just DMAs, and there's a coherent, uh, coherent bunch of coherent options. And you need like a standard interface to be able to support all of these transaction models. Yes. Assignment of address space. There's a whole lot of stuff to be done, yes. And we're just, it is in our list, it is the, so for better or worse, the, re, the, the reason we, we've sort of, there's no good reason why it happened this way, we're just sort of working our way from the bottom of the stack upwards. So we did the file layer, we didn't do the link layer, we're doing the network layer next, and we get to the, uh, we, we get to the transaction layer. But if somebody's willing to step up and say, you know what, I'm happy to drive the transaction layer, nobody, nobody in our group would complain. Everybody that way, they'd be pretty excited. Yes, sir. Yes. The terms are different, right. Yeah, well, there are also the term protocol I've seen it used to refer to the fabric agent that talks to the bus itself, and there, there's, a, there's a handshake protocol on how data is delivered and... Yeah.
It's very, yes, it's very, but it is an abstraction. So we're not arguing that these things need to be complex. We're just saying you need to recognize that it's an abstraction layer. And so you could have something as simple as each chip gets one significant bit in the address space, and that's how you move. Uh, Yeah. Um, they exist, though. Okay, so we can take it offline, but they are, and if we're wrong, we're, you know, we're ha happy to be wrong. But best. But even the P, the PC. Okay. Well, I'm going to. I'm behind schedule, so but I, I, I take your point. Uh, it's, it's, it's fair. Um, and you want to come up? The transaction layer would be this, essentially. In the, in, if I understand your terminology correctly, this would be the transaction layer that, uh, that's consistent with your terminology. Right. Any other questions? Or actually, uh, beat me up outside, because I'm going to hand it over to uh, Ramin. You, got, you need a mic. Good morning, uh, everyone. So uh, today uh, we had a presentation before back in March uh, that we introduced the Bo interface and uh, discussed some of the advantages and. Over the past two months, uh, we've been working uh, to develop some specs uh, for Bo and put it together uh, uh, so that more people can refer to it and design uh, this uh, common interface. And uh, in this talk, I'm mainly going to go over some of the progress we made. I mean, something I also need to mention, we all have a paper at the HUD Interconnect on Bo interface, and uh, we're going to cover different topics on Bo as a, as a whole, but not uh, just focusing on the specification. This talk is mainly the specification updates that we've had. So the high-level targets that uh, we started to design this uh, interdi uh, connectivity IP for Bo was uh, what we received from many people uh, from the industry, what they were looking for, what were the ideal type of uh, I.O. or interface looking for. Uh, the, the list here is what uh, from the feedback from people and companies file. Basically, they were looking for uh, a bandwidth or efficiency uh, of the throughput to be one terabit per second uh, per millimeter. That's die edge. The energy efficiency, uh, people want it to be at most one picojoule per bit, or in that range, ideally 0.5 picojoule per bit. And also, of course, uh, having a small silicon area uh, per IO port, so we can make them as dense as possible, so we won't be basically silicon limit, mostly not pad limit, especially when uh, we are dealing with MCM uh, connectivity on the package where the bump pitches are like 130 micron, 120 micron, and so forth, which uh, already uh, the pad pitch will increase the size of the overall I.O. port. Uh, we want to make sure that silicon area doesn't. Then the next step, of course, is the fact that we want these I.O.s to be um, from any chip to any chip. So the whole goal is to um, improve uh, time to market when you try to use chiplets versus a monolithic SOC. So you don't want to uh, spend a lot of time to port your analog complex stuff into this new 7 nanometer. Just want to uh, keep the logic on the 7 nanometer part, let's say, and keep your 30s, RF, and so forth on maybe 28 nanometer, 15 nanometer, and then connect together. But uh, if the I.O., the USR that you use in between them is complex itself, that hasn't helped really with the time to market because that will be your long flow. The goal here was minimize the analog and complexity of the circuit when you support it. And that's one of the reasons that we also try to limit the bandwidth of this um, interface to around 10 gig, uh, maximum 16 gigabot uh, per port. That simplifies the design, and that enables us to use simpler CDR, actually just do a phase alignment with the DLL, 
uh, use a digital PLL, let's say simplified block distribution and so forth, and even simple circuit. The other goal, of course, was uh, people didn't want to use multiple supplies for these IOs. So uh, we said uh, we'll try to focus on just using the same type of supply range that uh, you would use for your uh, logic, let's say uh, 7 nanometer ASIC or five, even 5 nanometer ASIC. It's going to be in the range of 0.7 to 0.9 volts, so you can use the same one. And uh, lastly, of course, uh, we didn't want to just reinvent the wheel when there is already a spec for uh, similar uh, chip to chip kind of or die to die um, interconnect. So we decided to mostly use what the AIB has defined in terms of management uh, of the controls and the connection between the two chips. So simplify the design. So once someone, uh, some company has already designed everything for AIB, they don't have to reinvent everything. So just a overall overview of the bow that uh, we proposed last time, we, uh, we defined in, in three different options that the bow base is the most simplest one when you don't need too much bandwidth per millimeter. Uh, this is a simple CMOS IO that effectively you have, and uh, it goes up to four gigabits uh, all the way to 10 millimeter, that's the range. And this is because it's not terminated. Try to use the simple inventor and latch on the other side not terminated and over package because of the reflections that you have, you're going to be limited to 4 gigabit, 10, 10 millimeter range. That's what you want to get. And that's what, what you want to use when you don't have huge bandwidth uh, between the two chiplets. So you want to use the simplest one. And of course, use uh, uh, cross synchronous uh, alignment to avoid basically CDR, complex CDR on, on both sides. The other one is uh, if you want to go longer reach and also. Um, Higher speed is to terminate both sides, and uh, this allows you to go to 50 millimeter. In fact, once you terminate, you can go much higher. You can go 50. That's what people in XSR domain. Are. But uh, again, for simplicity of the design, we'll try to limit it to uh, 16 gig. And in many applications, it may not even go up to more than 12 gig or so. And then final one is bow turbo, and uh, people have been using. Um, Simultaneous bidirectional communications. Um, for a long time, you know, telephone lines have been using it when uh, wire or connect connectivity is uh, very precious. So, um, also in Ethernet, uh, 1G Ethernet, 10G Ethernet, uh, AC, uh, we transmit and receive on both sides, both direction of a cable, because every copper cable have two bandwidth uh, in either direction. So when you just transmit in one direction, you're wasting 50% of the bandwidth. So whenever bandwidth is scarce, you want to use both the direction of the company. And same thing here. When you try to use really high bandwidth or high throughput over a package, when it's an uh, organic package with larger bump pitch, the number of bumps are limited. So why not just uh, double the effective use of every bump and maximize it? And be so that's what uh, the Bo Turbo presents. And of course, uh, these interfaces are all backward compatible, meaning uh, when you have a bow fast, you can just simply turn off the termination and basic. Other triplet is using bow basic, and you have the bow fast. Simply by turning off the uh, termination and lowering the light, you can still connect to the other triplet. If you use bow turbo, you can connect to both bow base and go fast at the same time connecting to, to each other. So uh, the way to do it is when you want to transmit, this is a bow turbo that has both transmit and receive. Connecting to a bow fast scenario, you just simply turn off the receiver for power saving and the transmitter transmits. And when you want to receive, you turn off your transmit and just try to keep the RX on. So that creates the compatibility very easily in configure, of course. Talking to Bull Turbo, uh, that's the ideal scenario to get maximum bandwidth out of it. This is the bump map or the bump ordering that we proposed. Uh, this is like a building block that uh, we propose to use. Um, of course, there's like a bump map A, bump map B. This is for uh, simplicity of uh, stacking them and putting them side, side by side. And um, one of the uh, in, uh, key things is that we try to limit the data a bit or data bumps to 16 v two clocks, and also one mode be that I'm going to explain uh, further about 
uh, that improves the efficiency of every bump uh, on top of uh, both receive and transfer. So we try to maximize that use to the extent possible. And uh, this bump uh, map, as you can see, in a bow base scenario, gives you 64 gigabit per second of uh, throughput. When you go to bow fast, go to 256. And bow turbo, you can go all the way up to almost half a terabit within uh, about 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 of uh, diage, uh, what, what you get. And of course, um, as I said, uh, for both slices, with the, this is the same circuitry, whether you have um, map A or map B. Circuit is pretty much the same. You just uh, shift the bumps uh, in one staggered version versus the other and uh, to better match them when you try to interface it with the other side or when you stack them on top of each other. This is the uh, top level uh, bow slice specifications and target that we're trying, trying to reach. Um, the, the single supply chip or, or interface IP that goes all the way down to 0.7. It can go more than 0.9, but uh, mainly because of many synthet applications transit tolerated. We, we try to limit to that uh, level. The bump rate for base is uh, up to four gig, fast and turbo. Uh, this is uh, baud rate effectively up to 16 gigabit to limit the complexity. The max throughput for this slice uh, uh, is what, uh, you know, you can stack these up to three stacks. And the, the goal here is that given that every slice is about 330 micron, and uh, also the feedback we get is that people do not want a stack which is like much longer or much tall. Uh, we try to limit it to a stack of three. So if you put up to stack of three, effectively you get uh, for bull base almost 200 gigabit per second, fast 800, and for turbo about one and a half terabit per second, with stacking up to three levels. The dimensions is as uh, listed here, the power efficiency uh, that they've had in uh, 14, 14 nanometer, so less than 0.7 uh, sequential per bit, and of course you go to seven uh, nanometer, we did a projected one comes down closer to 0.5 sequential per millimeter per bit. The trace length, uh, as uh, I discussed, uh, goes up to 50 millimeter for the fast and turbo and 10 for base. Uh, the latency is, of course, a function of the baud rate. The faster uh, you run, uh, the less time it takes to basically go through the chain for the same amount of bit rate same over them number of bits, so it's roughly three nanoseconds at the bar per The rest is pretty much what I uh, explained. The BUR target is uh, 10 to the minus 15 without any error correction. Of course, uh, uh, we have a proposal for error correction, a very low latency by the uh, Solomon that uh, will provide error correction that gives you a uh, full circuit and 10 to the minus 30. And of course, this interface, we are uh, targeting uh, uh, to meet the ESD and CDM, HPM, and CDM for uh, the packaging um, standards, which are uh, basically the pins are not exposed outside, but you know internal to the package. I guess that. I did. Yeah. Good. So uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Mark Emerly. I drew the short straw today, so uh, I get to be the public radio announcer um, for, for my part of the program and, and beg for your help. Um, I wanna start out, um, yeah, I don't know how we got the ordering that we got for today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I wanna, wanna start, the, start out, and I guess we'll switch back to Ramin and switch back to me, um, just describing why the, why the bow spec, the bunch of wire spec makes sense um, for the industry, makes sense for a lot of different apps. Um, and I think the, the really interesting thing is that uh, when we look at different interfaces that are available um, and, and the different types of applications that need to be put together, um, we've got some scenarios where we don't need to move a lot of bandwidth and other scenarios where we need to move a tremendous amount of bandwidth uh, per millimeter of chip edge. Um, the one thing that, that at least I personally think is interesting about this specification is that it starts in this basic mode um, where you can use a relatively simple circuit, uh, relatively simple retiming that are available, uh, honestly, 
in many different technology nodes, uh, going back and probably even to the 90 nanometer uh, geometry, and build a pretty good, uh, pretty power efficient interface that could go between, for example, uh, uh, our switch chiplet, our hypothetical switch chiplet, and a bunch of RF chips that may not need um, a tremendous high bandwidth of interconnect between them. Uh, also, uh, the interesting thing that Ramin will cover later, uh, <laughs> since we're all out of order today, um, is that uh, there is um, leveraging the master-slave implementation that I think we borrowed largely from AIB. Um, you can simplify clock generation requirements for those older technologies. Um, the other interesting thing about the interface is that because it's expandable, we can move to higher data rates with a, with a terminated interconnect. We can move to even higher data rates with a bidirectional mode. Um, there's an opportunity to use literally the same interface uh, on, let's say, an advanced uh, chiplet A to not only build into a system where you're communicating with very low bandwidth to simpler devices, but also use the same chiplet uh, to build uh, higher bandwidth connectivity uh, between applications that might need it. And so I just kind of drew, for example, you know, our chiplet uh, communicating in, in thousands of gigabits per second uh, per chip edge between uh, uh, NIC and FPGA in our, in our chiplet. So um, I think this is, uh, th these are the reasons why at least the modes that are currently defined in the, in the BOSE spec um, seem to make a lot of sense. Um, but as, I, as uh, Will mentioned many times today, uh, we do welcome participation from other folks to come and encourage uh, the solution to evolve in a way that's useful for you know, as many people as we can make it useful for. So I'm, I'm going to switch back to you, Ramin. <laughs> he didn't notice that we changed our presentation five minutes before. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Now, uh, what we tried to do, as I shared earlier, we tried to uh, have the compati compatibility with the management interface of AIB. So logically, they are compatible, although from pin points of view and everything, it um, won't be. So th these are basically uh, cut and paste from uh, AIB uh, spec. So uh, what you see effectively, you have the transmit, receive, box signal, sideband communication for management, asynchronous signal, also an uh, group that is for the whole, uh, let's say, part of a chiplet that uh, basically is like about power and reset and the existence of the chiplet on the other side or so that can be shared across the whole thing. So um, what some of the differences that uh, we, of course, have as a result, uh, and it fits better in for uh, a bow interface is, for, for example, the uh, we try to uh, make sure that the master slave that exists in AIB also is always used in the data mode as well. And that helps us to reduce the number of uh, high-speed clock teams, uh, basically, to just one, rather than having one in either direction. Uh, also, the sideband controls uh, in AIB, we have 80-some uh, registers for that. Uh, we think, based on the feedback we got, 32 should be, should be enough for uh, practical purposes. And uh, the aux signals uh, or bumps are duplicated uh, in a, AIB because they're using micro bombs and the chances of uh, yield issues is uh, like or bad yielding is high. So, but they want to guarantee that because of that, you won't have any problems. So, uh, but in when you use package bombs, you won't have issues. So you can you don't have to use duplicates. And um, again, Bo providing master slave options is not a must have, but that's preferred. And uh, the bus slicing that we have is up to. Uh, 16 bits, as I shared, rather than prior. So uh, the master slave clocking in the data mode, as uh, you can see, we, we try to use this scheme to avoid forcing people to have PLLs or high-speed PLLs on one side. One PLL on one side that uh, you should be able to do the communication. And that PLL, depending on the speed that you run, could be 4 gigahertz all the way up to 8 gigahertz. That's how a CR or DDR type of uh, clocking. So master basically uses that PLL clock to transmit the data to the other side with that clock. And also, same clock that is sent to the slave side is used to transmit 
uh, data with that same folder that can back to the master, and master has this DLL to do the adjustments for the phase. So because the clocks are all synchronous, you need, uh, simply need a simple adjustment on the phase. The SDR and DDR clocking is pretty much the same, so the, the, just the understanding of convention that on the falling edge of the forward clock data is transmitted in the SDR, every falling edge. For DDR, on the falling edge, you send transmit zero on the rising edge, the, or data zero, uh, and rising edge, you send uh, data one, and that's the order that you use in the adapter later to uh, basically decode the data and align the data that's as been shown here. So in a transmit path, uh, every two bits uh, effectively are sent based on the clock. You want to use the same interface, uh, pretty much coming from the Mac side, but uh, when you double data rate, you cover uh, all the bits. So we try to support both SDR and DDR for all modes, depending on what's sitting on the other side. Same thing for the receiver. Then uh, the control signals, again, these are uh, cut and paste from AIB, what they, they're using for the basically calibration, uh, start of calibration, calibration being complete, and so on and so forth between the two. Pretty much use them, they're about seven bits, then we allocate 16 bits for uh, user-defined specific uh, requirements on the, the two master slave, depending on the application and nine reserves. Because we have limited the number of uh, bits that is communicated, we do not have to run a very high frequency, so effectively 200 to 400 megahertz would be enough to do that uh, communication. And as a result, we don't necessarily need a high-speed phase alignment run at such low. That is pretty much the same clock used for uh, storm synchronous transmission. So this is a technique uh, or like a proposal that we use to limit the number of bumps in the bow interface because all these management interfaces uh, in AIB have their own dedicated micro bumps and micro bumps are, I shouldn't say free, but almost free. You can get a lot of them in a small area. Here you don't want to spend, let's say, <coughs> something in the tune of 10 signals or more just for management interface uh, when you use uh, 130 micron pitch of uh, uh, bumps over there. So we have this mode bit that uh, basically when you're in mode one, the slice is in uh, data communication mode, everything is normal, clock or high speed forward the clock and all the blue uh, signal uh, are data. But when, when you go to mode zero, then uh, you go into the calibration mode. That's the state that you communicate about, like, you know, whether the Mac on the other side is ready, you reset the adapter, et cetera, et cetera. But all the other serial data communication that is about whether the other side's calibration is done, what state that is, and so on and so forth. So every time something goes wrong, this mode bit goes low and the bit uh, purpose uh, changes. For test and testability, of course, uh, we plan to use uh, some of the standard existing uh, solutions uh, out there, for example, JTAN span, also the HPM uh, type uh, testing. We also have the at-speed at self-test, and this at-speed at self-test meaning because uh, we don't run too long, like too fast, uh, within the, uh, the bow slice itself, between the we can have this connection internal with the MOX to run the connection between uh, transmit and receive and do a at speed serial loopback with PRBS. In the case of Bo Turbo, because already transmit and receive connected to the same pad, uh, we simply need to turn off the hybrid to be able to do this uh, local loopback. Uh, that will also give us the high coverage testing during a wafer test, but one of the other additional advantages of using Bo uh, is an important advantage is that you can do at speed testing at the testing time using the ATE machine. You can have probe cards that are at 130 micron or so, probe cards, and you have, have kind of built traces between chiplets or interfaces to be able to test them under different conditions, you know, putting a 50 millimeter trace uh, on the load board and doing a loopback test. And with the eye monitor that we plan to have on chip as part of requirement, you can uh, pretty much do a good error coverage, or let's say test coverage for screening of the good uh, interfaces. And that's very important because that enables you to put the good chip, uh, known good chip, uh, on your big package uh, rather than 
having a faulty chip that you know at the end you have to throw away the package. Uh, <coughs> calibration again very limited. Try to stick with the same type of calibration required for AIB. Of course, you need PLL DLL lock. That's uh, part of a requirement. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a good clock. Then you have the receiver phase lock and uh, and of course, depending on the application and how fast you want, you want to run, you have the duty cycle calibration. That's part of the optional requirement. So just an advantage summary. I mean, this uh, idea has already been proven uh, in uh, 14 nanometer silicon. The good thing about it is that the hybrid part is, the, is rather easy to port, is uh, uh, mainly built of like uh, passive elements. The, it gives you uh, at least one terabit per millimeter uh, of the chip edge, 50 millimeter or two inches uh, of trace with 100 pitch. Uh, so effectively in both turbo, it can go up to 32 gigabit per second throughput over per bump. It has a small area. Power is fairly small, 0.7 in 14, that's what we got, and uh, 0.5 in 7 is the projected that you see. It has uh, basically uses a single supply, same thing they use for your synthesized logic. It's rather easy to port. Uh, you don't have to run it all the way up to 50, 60 gigabytes with time for it. It's NRZ and maximum you need to run it. In many cases, even you can run it up to 12, 12 and a half to get up to a terabit uh, per millimeter. Then it's backward compatible, so you can always choose to put the highest end, let's say, build turbo on your triplet and be comfortable that you have to be. And uh, it gives it a huge advantage of the coverage at test for uh, the chiplet, which is uh, very valuable to improve cost. Okay, then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I can just wrap up with uh, with my public radio announcement here. Uh, Bobby's telling me we're way over time already, um, so uh, we definitely need your help. Um, the, the guinea pig's not a not a mistake. Uh, we need folks who are looking to develop the BoFi IP in a range of technologies. Right, the more technologies this kind of IP gets developed in, the more useful it'll be uh, over the range of, of folks who will use it. Uh, also. Uh, certainly um, need folks to um, help develop this interface so that um, we can move to the next level up of interconnectivity, right? Defining uh, people who are interested in coming in and helping and defining what that next uh, layer is uh, beyond the PHY itself. Uh, so we, we can come up with a cohesive and useful interface layer uh, beyond, uh, beyond the BOW uh, PHY. So, Please, uh, everybody, uh, anybody who's interested in, in participating in the, in the standards committee, um, come and um, contact me. I'll be happy to get you involved. Uh, and, and absolutely, uh, Subi's already uh, interested in uh, uh, talking about test chips, so absolutely, foundries who uh, are willing to participate and provide silicon to prove out this interface, um, it would be absolutely most welcome. That's all we have. Um, I guess, Ramin, if you could come back up, to, do we have time for questions, or are we keeping people from lunch? <laughs> okay, okay, good, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, question over here. So uh, it's, it's part of the design technique, you know, how to make sure that the, the switch doesn't, uh, you, you have random switching, but if you guarantee that that switching always happens constant, uh, continuously, you get the fixed switching pattern that uh, all you need is to make sure that you do proper filtering. That's the similar technique that people have been doing uh, When you say you cannot define the substrate, what do you mean by that? So when you say switching noise, right? Correct. So when you say switching noise in a single ended, you have data that is random, right? It turns into noise. That would be a problem. 
But if you use, it turned out switching noise, rather than having switching at some point, no switch, switch again, and so forth, that's a noise. But if you guarantee that switching always happens, even if there is no data switching, that's uh, a bit, pretty much a known technique people even use in high uh, precision DAX. Yeah. This is, uh, I guess I can share more. This is a circuit technique that you can guarantee whenever you don't have a data switching, some dummy switch also does the switching to guarantee constant current. Sorry? Something similar, yeah. Yeah, but that's the technique we've been using, and this is this is a, something similar version of it is in product without any issue. I can tell you if you like, uh, I, I can show you the technique and how it works. And this is not my invention; people have been using it, so we'd be more than happy to show why that's not a problem. Brian, you're standing at the mic. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, we thought that was your question too. Okay. Um, I think you had one that you were showing that was a bigger ball map, or is it? This is okay too. So yeah, basically my my concern here was that it, it almost seemed to be that we are viewing 10 or 16 gigabit per second as a DC. You know, I would counter that. I mean, have you actually built a, like an HFSS model for this? To include this kind of ball map in addition to the substrate, where you will actually consider, for example, all the cross dog aggressors. And do like a like an end-to-end -end simulation or not? I yeah, mean, they, if uh, it works, I mean this is great. You know, if, if it really works, but I think that's going to, it's going to be very challenging. And it really is important, I think, to to make that sort of, sort of uh, analysis done before you make significant try to make significant progress. In my opinion. I mean, something I mentioned. Uh, of course, this is something a similar version of this. We have used it in product. What speed? And, uh, 25 gig. But uh, did you have this many bump? Actually, the bump pitch uh, was tighter. It was like 110 micron. Right. Pitch. But what about the return, the ground return? You know, how far is it comparable to this? The solution that we've had was like 25 millimeter reach. Mm -hmm. When you say ground return, but uh, assume if you be careful about how you do the grounding. Uh, up to 50 millimeter that we talk about here shouldn't be a problem. We are trying to use lower speed, right? And that will ensure uh, longer reach, so visualization and so forth. So what you are suggesting um, is that something that you could potentially share with this group because I think that's a that's really critical for this group, you know, to to make sure that this kind of scheme really works, you know, or either by you know showing actually uh, realistic data. Uh, or potentially you may have to build a model for this to show that this can actually work. And it's, as it was also mentioned by the gentleman over there, because of the, the ground pass return and single-ended, um, that in terms of you know, simultaneous noise and other issue, uh, uh, even like, for example, maximum of 50 millimeter here, uh, you are going to be greater than a baud you know, you're going to be at a baud rate of delay. You know? Thank you. Sorry, sorry. But I would, so so pl pl please contact me and join the committee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can make sure we address those. Do we have time for Brian's question? Yeah, I'll be real quick here. I just, just say, you know, so yeah, the things that'd be good to see are, you know, the is this a BDA separate power and ground like the memory world yeah. or or not? Is is you know what. What what does the response look like with the the full SSO you know all in each direction down all down and all up make sure that it doesn't bounce it so hard and and uh, uh, and 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 just giving some data that, to show that it actually does work because because there's definitely problems in, you know it's easy to, to trip into problems in these kind of interfaces yep great sure. thanks thanks Brian thank you. I'll give you.
Thanks for the good vague information. Okay, Bobby, if you can help me get my uh, slides up, please. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Kellett. I'm a researcher at uh, Intel's Programmable Solutions Group Technology Office. And I wanted to talk about uh, uh, some uh, chiplet topics here, um, the phi, I want to talk about the link layer, and, and a little bit about an interface I've been working with. Um, we've got our standard Intel disclaimers. So with any good Intel talk, you've got to start with something from, from Gordon Moore. Um, the interesting thing about his, his statement about um, separately packaged and interconnected chiplets, um, he made this comment 54 years ago. So I'm wondering, 54 years ago, he made these comments, why are we so interested in chiplets today? So, so what's changed? And so I started thinking about why are chiplets interesting? You know, the advantages of, of heterogeneous integration uh, you can mix processes up. This isn't new. Um, the time to market advantages of you solve part of the problem in one piece and solve another part of the problem, sometimes do them in parallel. That's not new. Um, I came to the conclusion that it's the advanced packaging technology that's new. Now, Ramuni talked about how EMIB was worked on eight years ago. So there's two things I'd say. One is it's relatively new compared to 54 years ago. And the second thing is I will grant that, that it allows you to go after applications, which was Ramuni's point about the application, that you couldn't attack otherwise. So just so we know what we're talking about here, here's our standard packaging flip chip technology on the left and the advanced packaging technology, a couple examples of, of Intel's EMIB and a silicon interposer. And you can see you get the 7 to 8x density increase by using the advanced packaging technology. So I kind of started thinking, now, what could you do with this advanced technology? If you had this philosophy that wires are free, how would you design things if wires were free? So on a, on a silicon bridge or interposer, um, I just took an, an example here on, on Stratix 10. We have uh, 500 wires per millimeter. Um, you take a typical interposer, it's a tiny, tiny cost per wire. And my conclusion out of this is you should spend very, very little at the end of each wire. Don't want to spend a whole lot of silicon on, on serialization, any complex circuitry, and that more gigabits per second per wire is not necessarily better when you can go wire. If wires are free, then uh, it doesn't necessarily pay to go faster per each wire. Now, just at the other end of the spectrum, I tried to give the craziest example I could come up with of expensive wires. So I dug up some things about Google's. Uh, a trans-Pacific cable, they have, they have uh, six fiber pairs, it costs $300 million, so in contrast, they have a cost per wire that's five trillion times more than using an interposer. So the conclusion that in that case is you should spend everything you can at the end of the, uh, the wire, and they do, they have these huge terminal apparatus stations and modulation schemes so they get the maximum out of their super expensive wires. So. Um, so I have a simple flow chart here of what we should do. Um, if, if you support chiplets, great. You move on to the next stage. If you don't, you know, the, the door's right there. The, uh, the, the next decision point, though, is actually at the crux, I think, of, of the multiple phi showing up on Bobby's part here, which is, are you going to use advanced packaging? And it's a complicated engineering decision because uh, it's, it's probably inherently cheaper to not use advanced packaging just for the packaging piece of it. However, you can have capability that might more than compensate for that if you use the advanced packaging technology. So I kind of said you have a decision point here. You have to take all your factors of your business case, of, of the product, of the application you're trying to, to address. If you're not going to use advanced packaging, I think everybody's realized you must serialize. You just cannot get down with density you need to address these applications without serializing. And even the, uh, the BOW BASIC, um, really, um, it just from some examples I've seen, it doesn't really carry enough bandwidth to, to get you where you need to go. If you want to use advanced packaging, then um, I'll make a case that you should use wide parallel. Uh, talked about AIB, uh, it's, it's clock forwarded, um, similar in many respects to the, the 
it's a bunch of wires, that's generally wider. Um, it does really make sense with advanced packaging because I think if, if, if you're not using advanced packaging, then you do need to serialize. And then I'll make one more claim, which is if you're going to serialize, then you really need to think about, do you really have to do a multi-chip package at all? Because there might be an easier way to solve your problem. Um, I'll, I'll talk at the end a little bit about protocols. You build these on top of a, of a, of a file layer like AIB. We did a public release of our specification last fall. Uh, the specification includes electrical specs and so on. You can pull this up off our open source site here. By the way, we released the AIB interface open source in January of this year. And it, it's really a, a simulation model. Uh, it, it's derived from our StratExpin design, um, generic cell library. The whole purpose that we have out here is our business model is not to monetize this interface. Our business model is, is thinking, how can we get other silicon in conjunction with Intel silicon to address applications that Intel couldn't do on their own? It's one of the things that I'm all dighty mentioned to, to kick off this morning. So the idea here is how can we do everything possible to reduce development, development costs? Now, I started thinking also about how, do you, how can we enable design for heterogeneous integration? Talk about reducing silicon development costs. Um, I would like to make the die, die interface IP as close to free as possible. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the open source that we've already done. Uh, and there was a comment at the last workshop where one of the participants said, somebody should just give away their certies. Well, it, it, you think about it, giving away a physical design is probably impossible because embedded in your physical design is some foundries technology, some foundries transistors that are proprietary, that we all sign non-disclosure agreements on. You cannot give away your GDS2. So, uh, uh, I'm working on some research for open source physical design that I think is kind of the next step that would help get us to a point where you could open source a, a actual PHY. Um, the second point I think to, to enable design is to expand access to advanced high density packaging. The Intel EMIB is captive inside Intel. I've talked to the packaging folks plenty of times about this and it could make it, there's no fundamental reason you can't make it open. It's just require such a humongous business opportunity that we would just grab it and do it ourselves. So uh, to, to really make an ecosystem go here, I think we need to uh, expand access. Uh, and Farhan was kind enough to give me the slide. I know he's here, I saw him earlier today. Oh, there we go. Hi, Farhan. And so this is, a, I think, is a, is a great example of how to get broader availability of advanced packaging technology out to all the potential users of this. Um, Farhang has written, written a, a book on 2.5D and, and 3D approaches. Um, they're they're a, a company that has a lot of experience here. I've not personally used them yet, but I think it's, it's a, a great example of, of an opportunity to get away from having to talk to uh, the really big names who will want 50 million plus to work with you if you want to use a, uh, advanced packaging technology. Um, to get this a little more broadly available. Uh, we had some discussion about data rates. Um, it came up really at the last workshop, and I want to talk a little bit about this. We're at, at two gigabits per wire today. Um, why not more gigabits per second per wire right now? Now, it's clearly, it will be possible. Um, we've said a lot about 112 gig XSR 30s. GDDR6 is out there doing this. There's uh, plenty of other um, unique signaling technologies, so it's possible to do this. So you kind of have to ask just a few questions about why not doing more. And it really comes down to, uh, you know, your, your development cost, how, how much does it cost to build this, um, your, your operations cost, how much silicon area do you use, and then this kind of fundamental issue of complexity. Uh, the number of teams out there that could develop a CERTES, probably a fraction of the silicon development teams out there, so what do they do? They, they, they have to buy this technology. Um, and there are things you need to think about. You know, if you're used to die-to-die -die kind of response, you are going to have to cross over. There is going to be some cost. Other complexity about training um, and, uh, you know, how do you get into a training mode and exit training mode. And then finally, back to my point, is I, I think this whole 
energy use integration on package makes sense now because of the enabling technology of advanced patching. Uh, so I, I want to say if we were going to take AIB to a, a, a next a next node, and I'm not saying we are, but but if you're going to, what are the, the technology drivers? If you're going to make a change, what's really why you would make a change here? And I, I found three good ones. One is that the uh, micro bump spacing, if you could get the micro bump spacing down significantly, uh, you know, like 35 micron from where we're at right now, gives us nice doubling of density. You can see even how you could get straight line mapping to go across um, if you got from 55 down to 35. Um, there's a lot of talk about going to uh, lower IO voltage. Um, we, now that we have a group of chiplets out there, compatibility is really important to us. So you have to now think about how would you operate in a dual voltage uh, case. Then the line rate. Now, even with um, you know, wires that are basically free, and uh, uh, we have applications such as direct RF sampling um, that will continue to, to push high, for higher bandwidth. They want more than our terabit per second interface can do right now. So I think it, it's inevitable, even though the core speed of an FPGA or an ASIC is not doubling, that uh, we will uh, uh, want to double the, uh, um, the, the line rate per wire. Now, you've got to watch the latency that you don't introduce something, something funny going on. So if you take these three factors, the micro bump spacing, the IO voltage line rate, I think you have the basis for how does our current AIB evolve. All right, a little bit on, on protocols. Uh, so anybody's worked with, with protocols, you know it's, it's the use cases and applications that drive protocols. We don't have protocol out there, protocols that are well suited to some applications. Uh, you know, we have Ethernet taken over a lot of the networking space. And I think that, that you can kind of divide these in, into a, a, at least two categories, probably more. There are um, the CPU accelerator use cases where soft, you really want software to have a, a coherent view. These things today, you can go out and buy from, from Intel a, a PCI Express accelerator card. There are other people who make these things. Uh, so that they're, they're really important there, and, and the whole software stack on top of it is super important. But there's another case of, of protocols, and they kind of land in a, in a couple camps of, of memory map protocols. You're doing reads and writes. Streaming protocol where, like that ADC DAC case I was talking about with direct RF sampling, the data is just is coming at you. It's being real-time sampled. Uh, these often come from die disaggregation. And uh, to the point that, that was made earlier here, um, if you could build these things monolithically, you, you would. Um, in some cases, you have an analog design uh, focused technology versus a high-speed digital, not able to. But you want to think of it in the same way that you would have if you had modules on the same ASIC. How could you talk to each other very efficiently? Um, so I, I came to the conclusion that DIDI products will need a variety of protocols to meet the product goals. Uh, ASIC developers like their Axie style lightweight protocols. Um, the software developers, on the other hand, want a coherent memory model, so I, I don't think one protocol will meet all the use cases and applications. And I think that's okay. I, I think that, that if, you, if you accept a couple camps of protocols, this first one here of, of large-scale integration things that are currently PCI Express boards, um, this probably makes sense to have that common point. This is the pipe interface, and then it goes up differently from there depending on what your application, what your protocol is. There are consortia already in place. Compute Express, uh, the, the CXL one that, that was announced recently, other existing ones, C6, C um, those are already in place. I don't think that we need to talk about actually how to do those ones. Um, we do probably need to address how do they actually map onto the hardware. I think the CXL, for example, is working its way towards either pipe or something just a little bit of a pipe. So there's this other group, the, uh, the, the monolithic-like, uh, the, the folks that want the actually style streaming or memory mapped or, or older APB, HB protocols. This is where we can help. You, you think of something like Axie 4. It's 
got five buses. Um, AIB has one bus this way, one bus that way. Same with uh, you know, bi-directional sturdies. We can have a bus each direction. How do you map five buses onto two? So there's some uh, some work to be done there. A, a team I was working with in, in the DARPA CHIPS organization made a lot of progress here. And then they kind of fell down at the end because the licensing terms that they offered weren't really feasible for anybody to use this. So when somebody helps here, please be thinking open source, that the specification would be open source, that implementation would be open source. That's something I can use if anybody else. So that's it. I just wanted to wrap up uh, um, with uh, kind of my view on, on chiplets about advanced packaging. Um, that I really want to attack the, uh, the chiplet design cost, and that's the efforts we've made through uh, open source IT. And I, I copied our, uh, our leader here on uh, um, the, the ODSA goals, just to kind of come back to, am I really addressing what the goal of the organization is trying to do here? And, and I think so. Um, but a spe more specific call to action, that we, we should tackle this ASIC-like module-to-module protocol or protocols for chiplets. So, um, Bobby, I believe folks are interested. They talk to they talk to you. They talk to Mark. Mark, talk to Mark, please, about joining in on this because this is an area here where it needs to be defined. I think it would be really helpful. Great. Please contact Mark. Okay, so I think uh, I've got time for a few questions. Uh, yes, it, it seems uh, obvious that uh, that there ought to be a standardized uh, uh, pipe over AIB uh, spec. And I was wondering if you knew of any uh, efforts along those lines, and uh, that exists somewhere out in within Intel, maybe the industry, PCI Sig, some other place. Uh, you know, I'm not aware, of, but but uh, of one, but maybe you are, and 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 it seems like a good idea and an obvious thing to do. Uh, we took a look at this really late last fall to say, can you build pipe on top of AIB? Quick, let's go check. And so we studied this and came to the conclusion: yes, you could do this. The pipe interface recently, uh, you know, 4.0 and beyond, has been very much simplified so that the encoding. The channel alignment is all done up in the Mac, mm -hmm. and so now the pipe layer is freed up from that. So really, our, our conclusion was that you could build it with um, probably just a width conversion mm -hmm. right at the five. There was really no mm -hmm. shim other. That's, yeah, I looked at it too, and it seems right at the data path. Like that's the case. Yeah. Now the the, the control, there's some funky, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. all the software on each side. Yeah. So something like AIB, you'd probably have some dummy state machines in there to deal with that. Pretend like it was the real file. So yeah. we, we kind of satisfied ourselves that it could be done, and then we're looking around for a, a need. Right. When I look at your picture here, uh, various people today, including yourself, have compared like PCIe and AXI kind of in the same breath. And if you look at the PCIe transaction layer, fundamentally it's two buses. It's one out and one in. and Different flow types are based are kind of mapped over those two data buses. If I look at AXI and this, or anything that's on die that you labeled on die, that's that AXI family. It's actually four, two out, ones for. It's four out. It's not going to with those four, are, but this, this four, four has, has five. Yep. I, I'm talking four date for data transfer, not for like flow control. They're just four data, right? And uh, they're they, they get away with that for different people to optimize for different things. PCI is based on the original PCI and how you were kind of board limited. And now for part of your slides, I think earlier, were saying, well, I want to go really wide parallel. If I go really wide parallel, you still seem to have this choice of, well, PCIe style, where it's optimized at two, works per perfectly fine. But then there's this on die AXI types thing that's more at four. So I was wondering if you had comments on that, if there's any yeah. thoughts in that space or um, if you haven't gotten there yet. Or what. I, 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 I guess I went over the AIB part really quickly here. It's it's bi-directional. You have a, a set of wires this way, 
and, and you're not required to. The spec allows unidirectional, but but typical application we have same number of wires going the other way. It works really well for network. And you basically have these two buses. So uh, while you could take AXI and directly map it to a big field of wires like you would do on die between two modules, the utilization is so poor on some of those wires that we wanted to map them to one bus this way, one bus. And it, the evolution of AIB came from supporting CERTES to begin with. Thanks. So I think you teased it a little bit, but it, it would seem as if one of the things that Intel, Intel could do to, to move and, and to incentivize AIB would be to have a committed roadmap rather than uh, be nice to get to uh, 35 microns. Is there any possibility that uh, there um, could be a stronger commitment? Intel's a big company, and even PSG is a big organization. Um, so I, I had proposed why not announce a roadmap going forward. A lot of people do this. It gives folks an understanding of where's this going next and how to prepare for it. Uh, this is a little new for, for PSG, the idea of having something open. So the, the compromise was kind of, I could talk about technical direction without actually talking about a road. So that was kind of our, our decision not to publish a public road. Thanks. I, I think uh, I got it right. A key tenet of your proposal is that the advanced packaging is a is, is tighter bumps is, is, is the way to go. Um, and obviously, you've had EMIB for a long time now. Uh, you're opening up AIB. Um, is there any possibility there you'll help enable the community in the in the packaging in the in the actual EMIB piece itself, or or have, or have you already opened that? Um, yes. So this was was something I alluded to a little bit here, which was the, the EMIB is captive in, inside Intel, and there's a little bit of it being proprietary, but I don't think that's the biggest factor or why it is still captive. I think it's, it's to take the technology and bring up somebody outside Intel who could bring this up or license it out to whoever would wish to license it. It's such a big project that the amount of business it would take to justify that project, we would just do it ourselves. So you end up in kind of this, you can't go forward, you can't go backward. I, I, I think. I think the, uh, the, the, the real path forward here is probably some more standard technology, um, something like Farhang's Broadpack company here of, of just more access to uh, interposer technology so that it's uh, more freely available. You don't need to have a $50 million value to Intel project for using the package tech. I think that's, that's the way. Thanks. Now, if you do have a $50 million opportunity, please let me know and, and, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, so you talked about uh, uh, like uh, EMIP, like 10,000 kind of wires and stuff like that. Uh, what do you think of like fan out? I mean, that seems to be more popular. Is it, do you think it's going to be AIB over fan out or a uh, bunch of wires over fan out? Or does it even matter? Um, you know, Ramuni showed that chart in her presentation of, you know, kind of the, the whole um, the feature size and the bandwidth, and she had this curve here, and kind of it's right at the, this borderline between um, where EMIB has, and interposers have started here. So it's an interesting technology. Um, Intel's looked at this years and years, um, hasn't really gone there. Uh, it, it's, we want to see how that develops, because if it could get to the point where you could use that and then really go after something where you need three or four terabits per second to do this direct RF sampling, um, it would be it'd be fantastic. I just I think we'll have to see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, when we talk about making it more av available, it's about 1,000, 2,000 wires. And for HPM, you just need that many wires, maybe. Maybe for many applications, that's good enough. There's plenty of applications where, where that's good enough. I think that's a, a key thing that people naturally ultimately come to is, does it really make sense to have it on package? Could I do this solve my problem with a board level solution? Some things you can, and that's great. Some things you can't, you know, if it's space constrained or super high bandwidth, um, that's where the MCP makes sense. Thanks. Okay, I think I'll close it out there because uh, we are.
that's my last slide, because uh, of impending delayed lunch here. Yeah, it's, it's risky. Okay, the, the previous speaker, I assume you can, can hear me clearly. You know. So the previous speaker gave a good segue into um, access to advanced packaging, and IME is very um, excited to talk about this specific topic, about providing access to, to advanced packaging. Uh, we are located in Singapore. Uh, Institute of Microelectronics is part of Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. I'll get a quick overview and then get in very quickly into the, into the details. And what we offer is really an open innovation platform. IME has uh, scientists and engineers as well as the infrastructure to develop advanced packaging. We have done it for over 20 years. And uh, I'll go into that right now, okay? So, uh, so Agency for Science, Technology, and Research uh, our basic mission is, as it says, you know, advanced science and technology and all of that stuff. Um, we are divided into a science and engineering council, biomed, someone to commercialize and offer scholarships to students to really study around the world, including right here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we met a few of them a couple of days ago. A um, lot of staff, a lot of researchers from several countries, and uh, IME itself, uh, was established in 1991, and advanced packaging has been a key area of focus at IME. And um, I'll talk about what we have been doing there. So at Institute of Microelectronics, uh, as I said, we are focusing on heterogeneous integration and how we can draw more and more of the components that form a system into the package, which more, a lot of people refer to as system in package. There are other programs also focusing on sensors, IC design, um, memory-enabled AI, uh, advanced optics, such as flat optics, and biomedical and biopackaging. So focusing on advanced packaging, one of the key things we have is an infrastructure, which consists of 12-inch uh, PSV, as well as fan-out wafer-level packaging engineering line. Uh, we have state-of-the-art equipment, uh, sufficient clean room space, and metrology facilities so we, are, uh, we have strategic partnerships. Uh, you can think about it. Uh, we partner, for example, with equipment companies such as Applied Materials. Now, so what is the thinking here, right? I mean, if you have a full line, an equipment company can optimize their equipment to make it faster, better uh, for advanced packaging. A materials company can work with us to do the same thing to further optimize the materials what have you, underfill, overmold, and there's a whole bunch of materials involved in heterogeneous integration. Um, increasingly, we are working with EDA companies to provide you know, package and assembly design kits, and also testing companies, because advanced packaging happening at the wafer level, people are looking at how much can I test at the wafer level, this whole multi-chip package. Coming to fabless uh, companies, uh, we, would, we, we do prototyping, small volume, as well as uh, new concept realization based on exactly what kind of package is needed. That's very important. Of course, we work with foundries because there are gaps between foundries and OSAC, for example, that do not meet all the requirements of advanced packaging, and therefore IME can bridge those gaps. We have a very uh, business-friendly platform, um, stringent controls, IP controls and compliances, um, good uh, pool of talent and such. So. We have uh, an expanding facility right there in Singapore, and I will can get details, come visit us. So I'll quickly jump into uh, the advanced packaging development approach in IME. So based on the system requirements, you know, you could have a high performance, uh, IoT, 5G, bio, or, or even automotive semiconductor. We can identify, work with our uh, partner, and identify the correct packaging architecture, provide mechanical, electrical, and thermal models, as well as what it takes to get the package physical design implemented. And our heterogeneous integration team uh, works on developing process modules, TSV, chip stacking, uh, fine pitch microbumping, 
fine pitch audio, thin wafer handling. These are just a few in the snapshot. So this is available openly to our partners and uh, developed a process integration scheme. As you can see here, this is a wafer level package with multiple chips within each one of these packages. And our two main packaging solutions include um, 2.5D, 3D IC, which is, uh, you know, using TSV and interposer and chip stacking. And the other one is fan out wafer level packaging. Used to be used years ago for single chip packages, increasingly available and we have demonstrated for multi-chip packages, you know, with fairly um, good density. And we, and we believe it has legs. Of course, there's always gonna be a gap between these two and it's up to the end application. This is an example of our wafer level packaging line. The purpose of this slide is really to show that it is an end-to-end -end facility. You know, I mean, I don't need to go through each of these, but basically, if somebody wants to do uh, prototyping on wafer-level packaging, or t using, you know, fan-out wafer-level packaging in this case, same thing is there for TSV and interposer. So you can go start up from wafer start all the way, you know, you know, go through, you know, grinding, debonding, and dicing. So basically, we can. Um, demonstrate different package architectures, integration flows, you know, die first, die last, we call it RDL first and mold first, uh, and optimization of processes, uh, tools and materials. And uh, as far as fine pitch is concerned, we have demonstrated, I will show in the common, coming slides, down to two micron line in space. We are working with equipment, uh, stepper manufacturers in the OSAT space, in assembly and packaging space, to go down to one and 0.8 micron line in space, all of this for the package. Uh, and we can estimate the manufacturability, variability, and, uh, and uh, reliability of these packages, and also accelerate the time to market. So this is an exam a snapshot of our uh, packaging uh, capabilities. Here I talk about, I show an example of fine pitch RDL down to two micron line end space. This is something <laughs> that we have had for a while. Now we are looking at seeing, you know, how can we take it down to one micron, for example? Are there cases, and that's the kind of feedback we like to seek from, from you all, is that is there, are there use cases wherein even finer pitch can be used for reducing your uh, picojoule per bit uh, power efficiencies? Uh, vias, micro vias down to two micron, uh, which can land on these RDLs, up to four layers of RDL. In this case, this is again polymer Fine pitch demonstration, we have done it down to uh, 20 micron pitch with starter tip. Of course, below that, there are bridging concerns. And uh, when you look at fan out uh, packaging, such as this, and having an interconnect through the mold is very important. There is a variety of them. You can use a vertical wire. You can use copper pillars. You could use laser drill via. So it's, uh, there is a lot of options there. As far as copper pillar um, itself, we can go down to really fine pitch as well as uh, decent heights of up to 200 micron to go through these molds and offer interconnects there. Uh, we do both you know, die first as well as die last uh, processing. In the case of interposers, we can, uh, we can offer both RDL, multi-layer RDLs, as well as um, damascene type of RDLs. Um, in terms of chip stacking, we have, for example, demonstrated up to 15 die chip stacking. Um, as, and Increasingly, the, it appears the industry is moving for toward hybrid bonding, you know, for uh, fine pitch, copper to copper, uh, sort of, you know, eliminating the solder completely. This is an area we have started to work on. Uh, this can um, take the form of wafer to wafer hybrid bonding, and into the future, it can be dye to wafer hybrid bonding. So, I would say these two are areas coming up in the future. So I'll quickly go through some of the, the two platforms I talked about, the 2.5D, 3D IC, as well as the fan out packaging. First up is our um, 2.5D, 3D IC platform. So the, uh, the, the TSVs that we offer, we have shown via middle, uh, you know, via first, mainly for interposer, as well as uh, via last. Within via last, we can do both via last from the you know, front side of the wafer, as well as from the back side. The back side approach is, has gained some interest because it's modular in the sense that you can have logic wafers brought in and converted into an interposer, okay? 
So the, again, the purpose of this slide is to show that all of these are actually done in the line. It's not an outsourced facility. It's all done right there in Singapore. PSVH, liner oxide, you know, bonding, debonding, multilayer RDL. Whenever you look at a large package, such as that of an interposer, um, warpage is critical. Uh, signal power integrity as well as thermal effects are critical. So we have a team of scientists who can provide you these electrical, mechanical, and thermal models. And the applications wherein we have demonstrated heterogeneous integration is in like FPGA memory, uh, 3D CMOS image sensors, 3D memories, and uh, VLS stacking for high performance computing. So those are some of the applications. And I'll uh, go, some, go through some of the details, for example, for VLS, TSV. Because of the limitations with uh, bonding issues, the aspect ratio is typically limited to four to one. We are trying to go even higher. We can make really thin interposers down to 40, 50 microns. And then, uh, again, this is uh, the detailed process step. I don't mean to bore you with this, but overall what we are showing is we are able to get high quality TSVs. And this structure here shows here a CMOS wafer, which gets used as a as an interposer or as one of the layers in a logic-to-logic -logic stack. This wafer is attached to a carrier wafer. Subsequently, the TSV is drilled from the backside after grinding it to whatever thickness. You can grind it down. Typically, we grind it down to 40, 50 microns, then make TSVs from the backside. So the front of the wafer gets processed at your regular facility, and then you can subsequently add TSVs that land on the first layer copper. All of this is made possible. You can see here, for example, the no whites observed, for example, in our X-ray imaging uh, with an overburden of less than two micron here. And uh, we'll show you an example in the next slide wherein this was used for a high-performance compute application wherein two layers of logic were uh, attached. With, you can see the transistor layer out here. And then the TSV is coming in and landing right here. And then another logic layer attaching to, to microbump joints. So very good alignment, good TSV edge profile, liner coverage, connectivity with metal one, as I mentioned here, the metal TSV filling, as well as good bump height uniformity control has been demonstrated. So this is one of the applications. Uh, more recently, we did a heterogeneous active interposer using the same VLS flow, wherein the active interposer supports power management unit ADC, DAC, IO circuits. So all of these don't need to be in your state of the art 10 nanometer or 14 or 7 nanometer chips. They can all be downloaded or offloaded to the interposer. The interposer can have your VLAST TSV. Then uh, the, the expensive chip can focus mainly on, on the processing functions or the, you know, or the high performance functions, while the interposer can take on the, the regular you know, ADC, DAC, and decoupling capacitors. This shows a cross-section out here, the active interposer at the bottom, a 65 nanometer I.O. chip and an FPGA. This was an older FPGA chip, 28 nanometer. So this is a chip actually that got demonstrated, uh, demonstrating heterogeneous integration. And this assembly was done on a chip-to-wafer level. You know, the FPGA is attached to the interposer. Um, a 40 nanometer was the thickness this active interposer wafers, fabricated via last and chip to wafer bonding. So, so basically, a lot of this work gets done in collaboration with our customers. And the collaboration can be one-to-one, -one, or we, we also have consortia-type projects wherein the industry works together. Um, and uh, we'll go quickly to that. So fan-out packaging, we just talked about. Same thing here, uh, similar. Uh, but here, in this case, the chip uh, are embedded inside the epoxy mold compound with two mold VS. Uh, again, as in the past, we uh, provide design support as well as you know, modeling and simulation. Full recon and RDL and multi-layer multi fan out is all achieved here for a variety of applications. And you'll be able to see it, the, the details. The slides will be posted on, on your website. But overall, we cover a wide variety of applications. And uh, we have demonstrated chips with, uh, you know, uh, Packages as large as 20 by 20 in the past uh, with up to 2,400. When I say IOs, it's, those are package IOs. So 
more recently, we are looking at, okay, can you use fan out to connect a GPU and an HVM? And we have done the demonstration of that also, except in this case, if the package size is about um, 30 by 25, and now we are looking at seeing, and can we make it even larger? Does it need to, you know, usually fan out goes on a PCB directly, but put it on a substrate, but can we make it 40 by 40? This is an area of interest that we are very interested in. Yeah, this was a question that came up also. We believe there are some, there is some likes to get in, getting this fan out out there, but there is going to be limitations. Other applications are, you know, mobile as well as millimeter wave for 5G and automotive for fan out. We offer uh, process design kits for our uh, flows, for our packaging um, technologies. Uh, that's the PDK that we offer, which runs off of standard EDA tools and then. Uh, gets the overall reference flow that's available to our partners in an open manner. They can get it, and in the interest of time, I'll quickly go. So summarize today's presentation by saying, you know, IME offers uh, capabilities, um, you know, and technology platforms for 2.5D, 3D IC, and wafer level packaging, 300 millimeter majority, and there is still continued interest, and we offer that 200 millimeter in certain cases. We develop transferable, production-worthy uh, solutions utilizing heterogeneous integration, demonstrating prototypes for our partners uh, for integration of, you know, of the chips so that they can get into system boards so the system and package can go sit on a board and its products. We have a critical mass uh, uh, to run small-scale pilot runs to bring products to market quickly for our um, industry partners. We also support a multi-party collaborative model. Once you're done with this, you are, people are looking at, can I take it into production someplace? So we're happy to um, you know, work with you and then transfer it to a manufacturing partner. So it, kind of rem it remains an open um, innovation so that you get to prototype and then transfer it to your uh, manufacturing partner. So that's all I have for today. Thank you all. To take any questions. Today we are uh, looking at 35 by 25 is the size we have, and now we are uh, working to develop even larger, which would be like a 40 by 40 or a 40 by 50, in which case uh, we would have to do some kind of a fan out on substrate. The, the, the previous size, 35 by 25, we are targeted to go directly on a PCB. But with a larger size, we would need to use a, use a substrate because of you know, handling warpage issues and, and yeah. It, yeah, it, it is somewhat similar. The only, the main difference here is is that uh, in this case, the, this solution does not need a differential bumping. You don't need a large bump um, under the most of the sparse case. You can have a fully populated 55 micron pitch um, or a 40, whichever kind of pitch across the whole uh, surface. One of the things we, one of the things we, uh, some of our partners said was they, they they wanted to have a uniform micro bump across the whole incoming chip rather than dense microbumps where the HBM phi comes in and not so dense somewhere else. So this thing can support that. That's uh, one of the things. And also, the, the we were also looking at a case wherein you don't need a, an embedded chip out there to do the fine intercut. You can eliminate it completely and still using fine pitch RDL, like down to one micron line in space. We, don't, we are looking at skipping that also, yeah. Minimum pitch right now is uh, four micron pitch, two micron line and two micron space. By, ne by in about a year or so, we can go down to two micron pitch. Right, interconnect, yes, that's right. You're talking the micro bump pitch, right? Yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry, the, the RDL pitch, okay. The, five, the pitch we are doing 55 micron, 55 and uh, my colleague uh, here can say we can 
we can go down, we have demonstrated down to 20 micron, but we have not applied it to any specific chips yet. So the, in this case, we went down to 55 micron, which is what the HBM spec is, right? Yeah, sorry. Bump. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, no, I think you're on already. Oh, direct for you. Everybody here has designed a chip, or at least they claim to have designed a chip. <laughs> 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 That's the model of the whole theory right now. This is your shot. All right. So um, to start off this panel, um, first of all, I want to say that it's uh, really an honor to um, moderate this panel. This is a very uh, highly esteemed uh, group of individuals <laughs> with a proven track record in chiplets, um, and uh, actually. Thank you so much, Bobby, for arranging this. This is really, really fantastic. Um, and so we're going to start. Uh, each one of our panelists uh, has one slide and about uh, three minutes or less to um, present their introductory slide. And then uh, I have um, some questions to uh, kick off the discussion. And then um, hopefully we'll have enough time to allow for questions from the audience as well. So um, with that, I want to uh, first invite Zahir to um, present the slide. Thank you. So um, Zahir, um, or as I uh, been there for a couple of years now, a little over six years actually. I'm responsible for silicon design. I think for the interest here, the, 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 my role includes the, the network on chip, the DDR, HPM, memory subsystems, and chip-to-chip -chip interconnect. Uh, but there are other aspects of the, of the architecture that, that I'm responsible for. Uh, before Xilinx, I worked at a few different companies, uh, especially uh, in the areas of SOC, which sort of tag ride the NVIDIA, the GPU at the AMD, or I would say ATI, ATI, AMD, and a bunch of different companies for the CPU. Well, I've been mostly on the, the architecture, logic design, that side of things. I'm not the analog expert per se. Uh, but back to the Xilinx, uh, in terms of what we have done for the chip, uh, in, uh, sort of the 2.5D integration, uh, we have in 28 nanometer multiple chips could be integrated uh, or, or in a poster that was back in 2011. And obviously the rationale was to build the biggest FPGA we could, which looks more like one device as seen by the end user. 
Uh, Subsequently, uh, then more of a heterogeneous integration where you could have multiple FPGAs and then multiple uh, CERDES chip and put them together via interposer. That was also around the same time. Uh, more recently, uh, we have done integration of uh, some of the standard chiplets, if you will, which is the HBM, multiple of HBM device with the multiple of FPGA device or the interposer. And certainly looking forward, as you can imagine, uh, we're looking at now more the, the standard chip integration. We'll continue our own chips integration together, but we're more looking at as both the parallel as well as the serial being the sort of, we both in, uh, have to have both of them. And on the parallel, it's more the HBI or the high bandwidth interface, which is kind of leveraging the, the HBM um, phi and then overlaying other things on top. I think that's great. Thank you. Okay, Sanjeev. Hi, guys. Um, I think some of you are familiar faces here. Um, been at, oh, sorry? Yeah, there is a light right in my face, so I might have to turn around a little. <laughs> Apparently, they don't want me to see you guys, so. Uh, so um, I've been uh, with Cisco in this incarnation about five years now. I was at Cisco before for 10 years, before I went out and did something, came back in. I've um, uh, been working on uh, multi-die chiplet-based uh, uh, chips for the last four years, I believe. Um, and essentially, we are now completing our third generation of uh, chiplet-based uh, uh, ASICs. And we're on to the fourth generation probably in the next uh, couple, three months. Um, I've done a bunch of stuff in the industry, uh, SOC development, switching ASICs, uh, algorithmic memories. And uh, right now, I think pretty much everybody knows this here in this group, at least. The main driver for us was we just ran out of die area uh, for switches. I think our bandwidth and the feature set was increasing so rapidly that uh, um, we just couldn't fit everything on a single reticle. That was the main driver to start going to chip lights. This was three or four years ago. And then we also needed some IO flexibility. Uh, we, uh, our customers, some were still in the 56 gig uh, uh, IO range. Some wanted to move to 112 gig sooner. We wanted to mix and match chip lights, keep the main die and all our switching functions uh, the same. So that was another uh, driver for us. Uh, and obviously, the yields are much better when the dies are smaller. So that helped us on the cost side. But another interesting thing for us was a product mix. Uh, we could actually mix and mas match these chiplets and do different feature sets, different IO speeds and feeds. And so we could address a lot of markets uh, based on a single die architecture. I mean, single main die and then use different kinds of chiplets. So these are the four main areas we found uh, chiplets to be very uh, helpful. Uh, and I, I guess we'll talk about the issues we saw and that stuff. But overall, I think at least from uh, our roadmap, switching roadmap, I mean, this is the way to go. There is no other way for us to get what we need without uh, heavily investing in uh, chiplets. Great, thank you. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, it's perfect. You can just stay there. Very good. All right. Um, oh, even better. All right, Dave. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Dave Kellett, and I worked on a, a series of, of Stratix 10 tiles, and I just kind of want to walk through how we went down this journey. And it started off with uh, Altera adopting Intel's 14 nanometer technology, and we didn't have enough time to get a transceiver into Intel technology, and we wanted to reuse our 20 nanometer TSMC design. So we did a disaggregation. And that was kind of the genesis of, of AIB was to just separate out the, uh, the transceiver from the core. Next, we had a, a major data center customer who said, we want hardened IP for PCI Express, SRIOV, and for, for Ethernet. Can you please do this? And we said yes. And then finally, with the, the e-tile, uh, we, we kind of had a, a under-the-radar project in a sense. Um, what we were really able to do here is, is I, I built two teams so we could do two tiles at once. And you'd think it wouldn't require a management change in order to do two things at once, but just mindset-wise, that's how it worked out. 
these, these are all in production. Um, I checked a year ago, we shipped 100,000, so I, I don't know what the number is now, but it, it's, it's, it's much larger. So this is proof that the, the tile scheme works, um, not just prototype, but also in production. Uh, one thing I found is, is that in, in this experience, the divide and conquer approach unexpectedly really, really paid off. So I led this tile team and the, the main die team could do their thing. Um, we did it a lot faster. And uh, um, it just brought in a whole nother team of people and team of management and, and uh, we were able to do, do things uh, um, more, more in parallel. Uh, just a couple more comments. That this forward-looking flexibility that we um, designed in early on was much more valuable than we imagined. It allowed us to progress from 17 gig to 28 gig, 56, 112, you know, Gen 4, Gen 5. That this uh, this framework here ended up being really valuable for us. Uh, recently, I've, I've been uh, working on a government contract with DARPA called the Chips Program on areas of the uh, 2NFT5 on, on on protocols, transferring data between chip to chip, open source I talked about, and uh, even, even the applications. Great, thanks, Dave. Dave. See if this uh, mic works. Great. Uh, I'm Gabriel Lowe, uh, or Gabe. Um, I've been at AMB now for about uh, nine years. I'm in our research organization. My current role is as the uh, principal investigator of our uh, Exascale um, program with the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, you know, as part of this, uh, you know, we've aggressively looked at all manner of uh, chiplets and advanced packaging just due to the extremely um, you know, aggressive targets that the DOE has set for their Exascale machines uh, and just, you know, with kind of all the stuff you've been hearing about, you know, you know, for years, end of Moore's Law and all that type of stuff. Um, you know, it's been very difficult building uh, large and larger systems. Um, and, and this is a, uh, an area where, um, you know, AMD has been, uh, you know, heavily involved in the last several years as well. Um, you know, starting with our uh, GPUs, or, you know, I believe, you know, first company to do, you know, high volume, you know, GPUs with silicon interposers and HBM. You know, we you know, rapidly moved to second generation HBM, which, you know, a lot of folks are uh, making use of. Uh, our first generation uh, EPIC processors, uh, you know, shown on the uh, the bottom right there, uh, make use of you know four separate chips in a single package. The total silicon area of those chips is basically approaching you know the size of the reticle, uh, and so you can basically get you know reticle scale uh, silicon capabilities at a you know, uh, you know much e much easier you know design point or cost point I should say. Um, we talked about earlier there definitely are you know, some design overheads and things to break things down if you start, you know, from the SOC and then go to uh, the package. Um, we've also uh, announced, you know, uh, this year at um, DS and Computex, uh, the, the second generation Ryzen, which is uh, also, I think, you know, a much more kind of chiplet type of architecture that um, I think many of us think of, where we have both a, kind of a, a central I.O. A chip that's in a 14 nanometer process combined with multiple, you know, smaller CPU chips in a leading, you know, 7 nanometer process. Uh, multiple types of uh, process technologies mixed into the, the same solution, what makes sense for each function. Um, and then you know, we're, uh, we've had several announcements extending this approach to you know, other parts of our, our products. Uh, so you know, for, for us, you know, chiplets is something that's, you know, it's, uh, it's very real. It's something we're building uh, already. Uh, but you know, I think uh, everyone here probably agrees that we're just scratching this. So much more uh, to be done throughout the entire industry. AMD thing, Intel thing, or anything else that, you know, these types of big uh, efforts, I think, are necessary to drive the industry. Great. Thank you. And Carlos? Hello. As you will see, there is no um, job description in my slide. It's because I'm not really responsible for anything. Um, but um, I am the Senior Director of Artificial Intelligence Strategy and Products, and, and from that perspective, I have seen many AI architectures and, and chips, and previously I was a design manager more on the networking space and high-performance computing. So um, that's where I have, you know, seen uh, all of the of the different um, the different challenges that these different the different market niches actually have. As a company, we we are an ASIC and IP provider mainly in the data center space, and um, uh, th that kind of bias my point of view very strongly because for us is the the really the extreme performance 
the very large devices, the, the, the kind of device that the gentleman next to me will build, right? So, so that bias is a little bit my point of view, uh, because most of the chips we do are, are 2.5D these days. So we've been doing that for, for a number of years, and that's why we're so familiar with the pain that it also represents to build such complex systems, right? Um, so most paths lead to Rome. What I mean by that is that um, actually I said the architectures in the different market niches are quite different, and hence the reasons why they move to uh, chiplets are also different, but they're all converging uh, there. For example, in networking, with, uh, Sanjeev said it very clearly, we simply run out of real estate. There's no way to pack all of those features into one die to start with. In AI, it might not be that much that there is no real estate, but for example, the integration of memories uh, very close to the logic is of great importance. So in that sense, I've put there three pictures. Um, the two to the left are from networking products, uh, real products, by the way. Um, the first one, as you can see, has more your classical chiplet approach, where you have different chiplets, different sizes and form factors and whatnot. The one in the middle started like the one on the left uh, in terms of a variety of chiplets, but then um, the customer decided to aggregate all of those chiplets into a larger second die. Uh, and, and we can then discuss why that move was made, what was the problem with having several chiplets on a design, right? And, and let me just say that some of the implications are, are quite uh, maybe not sexy, trivial maybe, but mechanical stability was a big factor here, for example, right? While the one on the right, which is a 3D implementation, is a case study, and that is more, for example, for uh, architectures where you would uh, take advantage of having a lot of memory on top of your logic die, which would be, for example, amenable uh, to AI design. So most paths lead to Rome. The reasoning is different. The constraints are also different. Great. Thank you. Let's back up. Have everybody's name here and uh, start with this question, um, get this uh, going. And so um, I think I want to build off of uh, something that Carlos that just said and also um, along the lines of what ODSA has been talking about in terms of um, building a POC. Um, do you have any ideas on the architecture or topology in terms of central anchor chiplet and peripheral chiplet of architecture? I guess obviously our ideas are based on our own experiences. I would broadly say there are two types, right? One is more traditional, where there is an anchor chip of compute type, could be CPU, GPU, FPGA, ASIC, and they're supporting chiplets, as in some memory the chiplet like HBM. And there's certainly in some markets very compelling needs for things like data converters, uh, the RFs, which at the very high end, they can't be in the same process, the teams which are doing them are very niche oriented. If we can integrate them for some market, it's absolutely critical. Uh, also, so these, uh, if you can integrate, it can help. Uh, so I think that's sort of one more traditional. There's the compute die and the supporting dies are around it. Uh, the type two is more of where both are, are, are a multiple compute. There is this sort of host notion, like the CPU, and some accelerator where all these, perhaps the, the uh, we have a NIC chip, we need to attach to some processor, but I don't have processor or vice versa. Or I have a machine learning accelerator, but I don't have the host or vice versa. I think that's sort of the other side of, of uh, and there will be combinations of these certainly. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I largely agree that, you know, there's no, no one size fits all. It's really application use case driven. Uh, you know, there will be some, um, I think, you know, like our, our EPIC processors, the first generation was actually four separate chips that were, you know, interconnected, um, you know, basically, you know, fully, fully connected uh, between them all, uh, whereas the second generation takes more of this kind of central anchor chip type of a topology, more of a star type of topology. Um, and, you know, for this particular, you know, design point for this particular market, the, you know, the design trade-offs and kind of the, the package size requirements and everything else, you know, drove... Uh, actually, again, time to market um, you know, drove you know, one approach versus the other. 
Um, and so, you know, we found over time that, you know, these, we, we have to reevaluate, you know, these questions for every single product, for every, you know, set of needs. There's different um, tolerances per market on the additional, you know, packaging costs, the complexity. Um, you know, this may be a different story, you know, in the future when we have, you know, off-the-shelf chiplets. Uh, but, you know, in our current state, you know, we, you know, each different chiplet we have to tape out is, you know, another mask set, additional costs in engineering. Um, it's very different if I can, you know, just uh, if I'm a third party, I can buy an AMD chiplet, I can buy an Intel chiplet and mix and match. Uh, it, it changes the story quite a bit. So I think that's still a very wide open, um, you know, question. And I think that will continue to really not have an answer except for the right answer for your product. Thank you. I hear from a system perspective. So um, your question assumes that we can't do both. Probably you're right right now, but ideally we should be able to do both. Uh, in our case, if you see the IO thing I talked about, a main die and having IO chiplets is wonderful. I'd love to buy IO chiplets from lots of you guys here. Right now we don't have a standard, I can't do it, so we go and spend a bunch of money on developing different types of IO chiplets. But our main die also is almost critical size. So the yields are low, the cost is very high. So if we can break that up into four, like as Gabriel mentioned, that would be ideal. So if we could get both, probably that would be the ideal solution for us. But I know at least right now, we are having a lot of difficulty uh, getting yield on those kind of multi, more than nine, 10 dies on the package. I think we've seen a couple successful models so far, even exhibited on the slides here, of you have the, the SOC with the peripheral chips around it. It could be IO chips, networking chip, memory. That, that model seems to be very, very solid. Um, there's the, uh, the die are getting so big that you have to split them up into multiple die, but they kind of do the same thing. And I know that the Xilinx and as well as AMD have, have, have done that approach already of just the way to get more silicon area to do the same problem you're trying to do. Um, there's a, another idea that, that um, might be possible, which is you could have a, a pipeline of chiplets that one of them might be some ingest of, of RF data of some type and an accelerator and then a general purpose SOC or FPGA. That might be something that, uh, that, uh, that comes out. Carlos, do you have anything? Well, um, the, the beauty of chiplets is that at the end of the day, it's just a, a subsystem that you encapsulate in its own, you know, silicon. So whatever architecture you're able to do, almost on a piece of paper based on subsystems, you can do then in reality with chiplets. Um, the the angle where I was coming from was in the kind of products that we typically work in. The problem is not as much what can you do or what can you not do with chiplets, but it's a degree of optimization that you need to achieve. Um, and because um, the people are trying to, to really reach either the maximum performance or, or saving the most power or whatever it is, um, people are somewhat reluctant to leave a PPA on the table by using more generic components. So it really, even if they were um, available in the open market, which they are not, the chiplets I mean, um, they would probably still um, have a strong incentive to try to optimize the implementation into their own chiplet. And this is why I can see perfectly well the rationale on how the business model works uh, when you have a family of products, such as AMD has, such as Intel has, such as Cisco has. Um, I, I have a little bit more of a problem when I think about um, you know, general purpose reuse for this particular market. Great, thanks. So um, we've heard a lot about the benefits of the chiplet approach, uh, but I was wondering if you could talk about any of um, the barriers, hardships, points. Um, <laughs> and it was, this would be a good question. Um, so th th I think that's a, that's a topic. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll just dive in because I've got the mic here. You know, if, if you're going to take one chip and disaggregate it, now you've got two chips or N chips, and there's some amount of overhead you have to do per chip that has nothing to do with what it is, but actually to get it to close timing, to solve all the DRCs, to get it taped out. 
So um, as, as much as possible, reducing that kind of overhead or optimizing that, maybe a um, more standard um, chip sizes, so some things that are pre-done for you. Um, you know, all the way one extreme would be stick your logic into an FPGA, but, but I, I think, you know, some things to help out that kind of physical design and, and uh, individual per chip work. Okay. Um, yeah, I, as I said, we've been doing this for a while now, and uh, most of the issues, at least uh, from my perspective, is, uh, I mean, there's actually two sets. You know, one is, of course, the business. Um, it, always turns out that it's much more expensive than we thought it would be. Interposer cost. Uh, when we started off, we assumed a particular thing. It's not been true. I mean, it's actually been much higher than what our expectation was. That's on the business side. Uh, yields. Um, uh, putting nine, now we're thinking of putting 27 or nothing. It's not uh, uh, yielding very well. So there are a lot of business issues to be solved. But on the technical side, what we have seen is uh, the, especially the bigger packages. I think uh, co-planet is a huge problem. Uh, the, uh, the mechanicals are a big issue. I mean, in fact, we have had to do drastic things like go to a socket-based approach just to get the uh, uh, package to not warp as much. You know? So most of the issues we have seen are all on the, get, can you get it to high, high volume production at a reasonable cost? and it's taking time much more than I anticipated to solve those. Uh, as uh, what uh, um, Dave was saying, I mean, yeah, there are some issues. If we can standardize on certain things, how we, how we do the thermals, how we do the packages high and stuff like that, um, it, can, it, it will be easier to develop more, uh, but that's a secondary thing for us. We, can, we do have solutions that can work out, but this getting mechanicals and getting the business stuff right is the biggest issue. I guess the challenge is maybe the, 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 the more holy grail of chiplet integration is a different set of challenges, but if you look at our own, uh, it, there is the, you do the chiplet because you're pushing the limit of, of a single die. And that comes obvious that when you have to build something so large, then this is the only option. There's not a whole lot to analyze. But when you build this, uh, I could have CIDs disintegrated uh, that's then it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, so, for example, as I as I indicated in the beginning, we, somewhere in 2012, we did do that, which is that we have to have these high-end CDs at that time. They were 28, get, separate into a chip and then integrate over interposer. But if you look at the performance and 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 the cost, those are two competing things. And in theory, an integrated CDs can always be better than disintegrated. And if that's the only thing you care about, then that's not good for, for, for integration via chiplets. So that, that's one that in the, the integration via chiplet is not always good if you disintegrate. You have to see if your performance needs are met or not. Uh, some of the other things in terms of experience is when you have your own chiplet, both sides of the interface, that's one problem in terms of testing and debug. When you have the third party, as in the HBM2 in our case, there are all these interesting uh, test stability issues. And when you have in, on a PCB, when you're debugging, you put a probe in between the, the R chip and the DRAM, and there are all kinds of these scopes which can uh, uh, probe your interface. There is no such thing when you have the HBM integrated. So you have to have better ways to do the, the debug testability. And there's some standards coming up, but certainly it's a, it's a different mindset. You can't have the same observability when you integrate as you had on the PCB. Yeah, um, I don't have um, you know, too much more to add that you know, hasn't already be, been said. I think you know, some of the uh, additional complexities come from just overall um, product planning. You know, there's a uh, time to market. Um, you know, in theory, you know, you might be able to you know, get your yields going faster because you're building smaller chips rather than a big system. But then there's the head plus you know, all the verification tests. Else, it involves uh, that comes with uh, you know, disaggregating your system into smaller pieces. And so there's a lot of different you know, competing factors, some which are you know, beneficial, some which you know, add uh, cost in some dimension. And it's um, you know, often very difficult, uh, especially you know, at the start of the project when you're planning things out. Right? Everything always seems so great at the, at the beginning, the costs are cheap and everything else. Right? Um, and so there's a lot of learning that you know, goes on, and it just gets that more complicated because 
things with you know additional third party boundaries, OSATs, and all, all manner of you know new things are being discovered as we as we go through this. Um, there's a lot of learning happening, but um, you know, for example, we had to you know, work with our partners to develop you know, new testing methodologies because you know, what was being done beforehand you know, related to observability and sometimes it's just you know, the, the partial assembly test, you, know, you want to go test it, you introduce some new defects in the process of testing it. Um, where none of this is necessarily you know, showstopper type of stuff, but there's just more engineering, more effort that we as a community, as an industry, have to continue investing in to bring these things you know, to sufficient ma uh, maturity that it's becomes an off-the-shelf uh, capability for all of us. Carlos, do you have anything to add? Uh, just hammering this, this last point that Gabe, um, which I actually, it was the last bullet of my slide, is um, what we have found is that all of the pieces exist. The technology is there. Uh, it's just that it's not mature enough. So as, as they were saying, there's no fundamental roadblock uh, it's just that you come and you say, hey, I'm going to do this with my EDA tools. And it's simply the option does not exist, right? Um, or you, are, you go to your OSAT and you say, well, we need to do things this way. Is it possible? Possible, yes. Are our machines ready for it? No, they're not. Are our people ready for it? Are our processes ready for it? No, they're not, right? So, um, but, but it's exactly the same road that we went through every time there was a major technological advance. And if we look back at when Interposer were first introduced around 2011 or so, well, it was exactly the same set of problems, and we've overcome them uh, little by little, and now it's absolutely mainstream. So that's what I expect will happen over the next couple of years. Great. Uh, so um, next question, and uh, I think I'll... I'll uh, ask Gabe to start with the answer. Uh, is what's your perspective on standard organic packaging, uh, high density uh, packaging, um, and um, silicon inner packaging that AMD? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, in short, um, it's sort of a repeat of my previous. Um, uh, response. Uh, the the, the one-word answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it really depends on you know, your 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 product needs and what exactly you're trying to do uh, in that product. What you know, what level of integration and what are you trying to solve with that uh, that integration? So you know, we have some products. Uh, our, our GPU products make use of the silicon interposer to uh, attach the GPU ASIC to multiple stacks of HPM. In that case, we have you know very very high bandwidth requirements, and so that you know the, the interconnect density that you get from um, you know, Interposer, or you, know, you can do it with EMIB as well. Um, you know, is what makes sense for those product needs. Uh, for our current uh, CPU servers, we're just doing that on organic substrate because the uh, the bandwidth that we have to provide from the CPU chiplets back to you know that central you know uh, I/O chip uh, needs to be on the order of you know DDR scale bandwidth. And would you get you know, perhaps better picojoules for bid, or are there other benefits to having a interposer or emib like approach? Yeah, quite. You know, from a technical perspective, uh, but from a cost perspective, and from a just you know engineering risk perspective, and a variety of other factors, the organic substrate for that product was sufficient. So we went with you know sufficient. Uh, sometimes trying to do the absolute best, you know, most aggressive thing can, you know, on paper look fantastic, but, you know, it, all those benefits are relevant if your product is late to the market. Uh, so, you know, the answer is, you know, you have to use the, you know, we have a lot of different tools, they have different trade-offs, and you have to use the right tool for the product at hand. Um, and I think that's, you know, one of the challenges that um, we'll run into with a, uh, an open uh, type of approach, right? You have to provide the right flexibility so that you don't pay uh, too much overhead in terms of that like that general purpose flexibility, um, but at the same time, you know, if it's it's a very careful you know balancing act that you know we're going to have to navigate to figure out what's the right set of functionality to be useful but not so broad that we try to uh, you know boil the ocean and you know then it's just too costly and if, uh, for everyone to use. Great. Does anyone that? I can go on to the next question. Everybody feels like page. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, what types of chiplets do you think would um, be useful in the type of open open ecosystem? Types of chiplets is remain proprietary. Okay, Sanjeev. At least uh, this goes for of you. IO chiplets. <laughs> If I can buy chiplets from everybody, I would buy it from everybody. I mean, very ripe for standardization. Uh, I don't think uh, there's anything, any good value we add at Cisco. Uh, somebody like Mark or uh, Carlos can give us a good IO chiplet and we'd love to integrate that. I think that's the low hanging fruit. So, so maybe if you go back a little bit of the sort of the, the rationale, motivation, why we do integration, then we roughly talked about the building the biggest. So that's, that's and building the biggest seems to be still in the arena of where chiplets are coming from the same company because the integration challenges and complexity is so large. Uh, the, the the next down is that the, uh, like Sanjeev said, uh, you have some area companies focused in and the other things which are more peripheral, but you need them and integrating them helps in terms of reducing the form factor, power, other things, absolutely. In that, memory is, is I think one of the critical one and the IOs, um, so it is, or RFs and maybe other senses too, because uh, they tend to be more niche in some way. For example, memory, it's just a different process. You fundamentally can't even integrate onto the same die, so it's going to remain same, uh, separate, and then find a way to integrate it. Uh, as we go into the more, uh, I guess, the exciting ones, the more aspirational ones, where I could disaggregate and have the, the compute and the accelerator, uh, the, the, that's where, if in, in a more idealistic world, more sort of holy grail of chip, in, chip player would be, but you could truly go to Avnet and just order a few. Uh, then you can build kind of uh, whatever uh, small chiplets uh, put together. But I think that then with lots of phase standardization has to happen. Some uh, cheaper ways to integrate have to be there, and testability is going to be extremely, extremely important because, I mean, on the PCB over decades and decades, you've perfected these things. Uh, somehow that has to translate into the democratized world of chipset. So I think um, one, one thing that you talked about uh, earlier this morning, I think that really you know hit the nail on the head is the the difference between interoperability and reuse, right? And at least in the the nearer term, right, in terms of what things make the most sense for chiplets, I think is really about the reuse part of it. Um, so part of that has to do with you know what things have uh, well-defined standards, whether that's you know memory types or you know I/O uh, standards. And then I think another interesting aspect of it is sort of the velocity of those standards, right? If I build a chiplet that supports a particular generation of PCIe, is that going to change in 12 months where I have to go redesign it for the new generation? Anyway, that's perhaps a, an example that's a, a good one because it doesn't move that fast. Our, our memory is, you know, pretty similar. Uh, there's other things where in concept it may be reusable, but the changes, you know, happen, you know, very, very quickly. And so, you know, yes. Theoretically, you can take your, you know, this chiplet. It's, uh, you know, some CPU or some other, you know, accelerator. Plug it in, but I don't want last year's one. I want, you know, the one that just came out. That's, you know, even faster, even better. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, I think an example where you've got interoperable chiplets, but the uh, the product or the the market, you know, reuse value of it is far more diminished. Um, and I think that's a, a key aspect of you know, what things. You know, make the most sense, at least in, in the nearer term. You know, as the economics and other things change down the road, we'll have to reassess. Right. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to see a continuing uh, effort on the, the SOC disaggregation, where, you, where you're dealing with fundamental die size limits uh, and, and yield issues. And those will probably continue to be private interfaces, and uh, that that's kind of the one category. The other category, I think, is is um, Sanjeev mentioned is, is the peripheral, the, the I/O interfaces, and it, it, some of it's mundane. You need you need a, a memory interface or a, a network interface, and some of it is some folks are doing some really innovative work um, with uh, I/O technology that we at Intel or, or somewhere else may not possess. And I think that's just a fantastic opportunity for chiplets there. I was curious, um, 
his I.O. triplet came obviously. Um, and then uh, earlier you also talked about accelerators. Now, accelerators don't have to go in. They can go on the fact that three months housing. Okay, so why did accelerators come up and put them in the package? And are accelerators uh, one of those that would be um, a chiplet that could uh, be created? So if you look at chiplets, uh, sorry, the accelerators, whether it's GPU or FPGA, in some way I think fundamentally they are limiting to them in what they can do because they are far away on the little pipe of PCI more often than not. If I could bring that closer to the CPU, more looking like a coprocessor, there are there's just so many more applications that would open up, number one. Two, as it is, there's so many application performances are bottlenecked on that interface. And there's all kinds of effort to overcome PCI. There's like NVLink and C6 and whatnot. In some way, they're trying to just push the PCI, but no matter how much you push, arguably can be as good as I could integrate something on package or on your browser in terms of the throughput and the latency both. I think that those are the key for how good of an accelerator you can have with respect to host. It's really the latency and the throughput and again, arguably, there's no way a PCB could get to be as good as as integrated one. Other things being equal. Are there any specific accelerator types or applications? <laughs> so there is. Uh, if you look at the some of the things, I guess, so popular, the, the GPU as an accelerator is, is a very uh, proven case, and so much of the acceleration today is more sort of coarse grain. You have to have really very coarse grain data sharing if you want anything useful out of this accelerator. More you go towards fine grain. So a lot of these, uh, like the, the data based acceleration, which tend to be more of, you don't know where you're going to really touch the data. I need lower latency access to the accelerator, but it's an accelerator I need as opposed to just CPU doing that. Great. There could be other things where it's, it's, it's more fine grain data sharing between the accelerator and the, and the host, then, then, and then tight integration becomes more and more uh, in, in critical. I think w one of the challenging things with the accelerator story is really, um, you know, I think most of the f uh, folks in this room are probably a bit more you know, hardware-oriented in mindset, but it's, uh, it's really a, a major software uh, challenge in that we basically have this chicken and egg problem, right? Uh, the you know the, the the marketing version of an accelerator that's you know tightly you know coupled to your host CPU that's you know cache coherent they can you know do you know share the same memory with you know zero data moves and things of that sort. Um, if you were to look at you know the benefit you get from any current applications of a system like that, it's relatively low because they've already been written for a system that assumes a coarse grain partitioning, a lower amount of bandwidth, and so it's you know for kind of these new breed of accelerators to really be successful, um, you know, I think that the chiplets can pay, play a part of that story, but it's really one that requires a much broader hardware software co-design. Um, you know, I think uh, a recent example is kind of the whole uh, you know, uh, TPU stuff. Right? And the TPU isn't an interesting story without the entire TensorFlow story that goes along with that. And you know, how do you build an ecosystem? How do you build the software to take advantage of that hardware, and so I think you know that's one of the challenges of if you just you know take a, a point solution of here's an accelerator, let's make it you know faster, chipletized, closer, closely integrated. You may not see much because it, it really is about the overall you know solution. What are you trying to solve at the end of the day? That's a great, great point. I think we talk about um, chiplets from silicon perspective a lot, and then we don't talk about how the software partition. I just wanted to mention another type of accelerator is the, the inline data processor, like real time. There's an application for electronic warfare where if you at very high bandwidth, you're sampling the entire spectrum, and then you want to respond to it in real time because there are missiles in flight, that uh, it makes a lot of sense to have that very tightly coupled and, and lowest latency possible. So it's just a different than uh, that card that I showed earlier. Carlos, 
Um, okay, so uh, I just want to do a time check. Uh, okay, um, I, before we before we get into any um, anything else, I just wanted to ask you about the business, similar to software, which problem. So, um, anything you want to add about that? And then questions. Um, actually, th that was one of the questions that I've been asking myself since uh, the idea of chiplets came to, to my mind. Um, and it goes back to the idea of reuse, right? Um, let me take a stupid example. Your, your archetypical ARM processor. Um, I don't think I have seen in the entire course of my life over all of the tapas that we have done two chips that had the exact same configuration for the ARM processor. Um, and even when they did, if they ever did, uh, it would have been a different technology node, or uh, you would have floor planted differently because the requirements were different, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I'm trying to say here is, that is to me the, the big conundrum around chiplets, is again, they need to be general purpose enough that they, there is an, a possibility of reuse, right? Because otherwise, the business model only makes sense for those buying the chiplets, but not for those building the chiplets, right? Um, so I, I suppose that in areas around ASSPs and the like, where you can cope with that generality is, is where it, it will work out best. Uh, for more specific implementations, uh, I think it's going to be complicated. I've got a great, very practical, non-technical business model issue, and it came up several years ago back when Linear Tech was a separate company. We thought, what if we took one of Linear Tech parts, integrated it in with our part, and then we sell it? And you encountered this problem called margin stacking, which is Linear Tech wants to make very nice margin on their part, we want to make very nice margin on our part plus the cost of their part, and so you end up with something that, that just doesn't make sense to the end customer because now they've just paid double margin on it. And I think there are ways to solve this, like consigning materials or branding it as linear tech inside and, or something like that to, to get around that problem. Yeah, go ahead. I, I guess simply thinking of, if you look at it, today PCB is a business, I guess we could say, and the, the board makers who source from wherever chips and put it together. In some way, the, the, the SIP level integration is really, I'm just going to miniaturize this some more, uh, but fundamentally not that different. If maybe ODSA or we together could come up with, make them interoperable, and chiplet vendors have to be willing to sell bare dies, obviously, which may very well be like it's cash and mouse type, so the, the cash 22, uh, the, the if we have the interoperability and testability solved, then we should be able to sell bare dies if there's enough business. And that all these other technology files and whatnot have to go with it, which don't go today with the PCB. But I think fundamentally, PCB could be an independent business that could we not have an integrator who's not one of these chiplet vendor, but a third party. If we can get technology-wise there, it seems like it has all the same ingredients of the PCB business, uh, but we have to have enough ecosystem of chiplets you can buy from and then, then build the system. Couple practical problems uh, we are facing. Who owns the final yield? You said bear, final yield. They said, yeah, somebody's gonna give me a bear die, I put it together, my bear die fails, who owns the final yield? Because it's very, very expensive at that point. So that problem is not solved as a business thing. I think that's uh, it's a little different from PCB because now we are packaging everything and can't really remove a component out and throw it out and put a new one. Yeah. Rework it. Exactly, well. yeah, yeah. So that's been not solved. The second thing, I think, Dave, I want to come back to your thing. You wanted $50 million to do this. Cisco has $50 million if somebody can really solve the standardization of the interface at the I.O. and put together a coherent solution for us, I think. It's not the money problem. I think it's somebody coming up with a clean solution that we can use. Although just a um, a big comment on the you know what happens when you know who you know who who gets left uh, holding the bag when uh, you know something doesn't work. And it's not that there are no solutions. You know, for example, we have agreements in place where you know we get our GPUs from one foundry, we buy our memory from a 
assembled at a certain that and then you know if something doesn't work then you know what happens and we have agreements in place but the question is really how do you scale that right is there a a standard you know convention that you know yeah you you pay for this part i pay for that part and you know we'll play rock paper scissors sort of rest or you know whatever it may be uh you know how do you, you know what what is the overall you know industry-wide you know norm business practices we have in some sense kind of a, a one-off agreement with our partners but you know every company today is kind of off doing their own you know agreements with their uh, suppliers so i think it's a question how, how do you scale that out okay uh so we have some questions from the audience. I think we'll need to. Oh. I mean, there are, there are definitely clear case use cases for a chiplet. For example, if you have to put memory and processor, or the different technology, or you know, silicon ger germanium or 3.5 or, you know, there's no doubt those. But if you're only dealing with, uh, let's say, CMOS, and it, it comes down to, okay, uh, would you use 14 or, let's say, 16, you know, not to offend anybody here, uh, nanometer versus, for example, or even, like, take 10 nanometers uh, versus, for example, option of going to 7 nanometers, which is monolithic. So, and... Uh, which one of those would you choose? You know, I know at least uh, at least your company, Intel. You know, you've chosen, I guess, you know, more of a sort of like um, the the 14 slash 10, and using chiplet. But I know other people are going to seven nanometer. So, does anybody want to take that question? Which is which is a more advantageous and overall in terms of cost and also yield? You know, I'll, I'll start with that. The answer yeah. again is yes. Um, it, it depends on the product. You know, we right. have products that use interposer. We have products yeah. that use, you know, mm -hmm. uh, chiplets on organic substrate. We have products which are monolithic, you know, silicon dye. And it right. just depends on, you know, that the cost and needs and, mm -hmm. you know, all, all the factors uh, to decide what we use. There is no silver bullet that, you know, this one advanced packaging technology right. will solve all the world's problems. Um, so I think... You know, it may not be a very satisfying answer. Okay. <laughs> you, you'd like a, a nice but, sound bite. But um, it's almost because almost like when you, if you hear in this uh, workshop, it almost seemed to be that the desire to go to a monolithic is almost like we've put in back. But, but I think that's probably, isn't that our first goal is to do monolithic and when needed, do chiplet or is it, are we switching role now? So, so here's an alternative view and, and you can picture me as Sanjeev now. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, for for networking, yeah. one of the the most critical pieces is always the certes, right? Yes. And we don't care about the technology node; we care about the speed. Yeah. So once you, uh, once you have a 112G certes, um, and it works, and it's silicon proven, and you've tried it, if you could stick with that for as long as you need 112G without having to change uh, to change it ever. I'm pretty sure that Sanjeev would live with that. What about power saving with the future nodes? Seven, five, I hear five is very nice. It, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't counterweight the risk yeah. of the search okay. is not working. Okay. Thank you. A, a quick, a quick follow-up on that is that it's also, you know, depending on uh, your engineering organization, it's an opportunity cost, right? If I spend engineers to go and rebuild the CERTES on, you know, a five nanometer process, what other, you know, capabilities am I leaving on the table that those engineers could have been doing instead because they've been enhancing, uh, you know, adding value to my other IP uh, as well, right? So you have an infinite number of engineers, you know, sure, maybe that's fine, but, you know, there is this grand, you know, massive balancing equation that has to be done for, for every product. Okay, we'll take a question from this side and then we'll move the microphone. I uh, just want a quick comment to that. I, I guess this idea of that you have in one IO chiplet and last for generations is is a little bit of fairy tale. How many times you have that the, the 112 gig side of it will be valid perhaps, but the other side of interface seem to almost always change when the other chip is changing. And there have been some examples in industry before which were more at the PCB level they were from GPU side. The two GPU companies, ATI and GPU, they tried to disaggregate all the display interface into separate chips, 
and they try it back and forth. And right now, it's, I guess, right now it's all integrated together because even though in theory you could use few generations, they could never do that because the whole site changed something or other. Something else changed. It's true for compute because we do uh, storage and compute chips too. But networking, fortunately, has much more uh, gradients than 100. So we are a little safer there. Okay, so one more question from this side, then we're going to. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, uh, from the standpoint of accelerators. And uh, from AlexNet, starting from a simple feed forward network, then you go to a more complex network like Google Net and you have uh, farther down five years you have bypasses now and divergence convergence on, on networks and and it seems like uh, AI and particularly if it's like it's like a moving target so I uh, I want the question is for each and every one of you from your company standpoint uh, how you're going to address this moving target on the chiplet uh, level and how that connects uh, to the complexity of those systems going forward, like, and that connects also to to what you guys mentioned on, um, on the software side of things, because these things, these two things, have to go uh, hand in hand, basically. What's your point of view? Say that again. Uh, I think you just we, we cannot off. hear you. I guess the interface is obviously one one issue, but you're talking of the main compute itself may have to change because the network is changing. And I was jokingly saying, well, I have simple answer. Use FPGA, and the next time you hear next next network, just resynthesize. But because I guess that's the that's the core part of your, I suppose, in a, in, a, in a more hypothetical sense, is let's say you have a CPU side which you don't want to change, but this accelerator where you have your network needs to change because your network is changing. And it goes back to that, yeah, sure, next generation, you could have the next accelerator with the next uh, network, and you would continue with the same CPU. That, in theory, is true, but I'm not sure how in, much in practice it's, you'll probably want the next CPU too. I think hopefully that's the that's what if we can solve here, come up with some way to integrate that the accelerator and the other side host can interoperate or other chiplets can interoperate. Uh, that's the key. And whether you can also somehow morph your accelerator chip into something else, you just need some programmable stuff. Okay, so I've been told to accelerate. No, no, no. No, I have. <laughs> Oh, you have yeah, questions. Yeah, I, I thought you said you, well, we, yeah, we only have time for two questions. No, we, we have time for everyone's questions and then two more. I said, I just a, okay. a quick a quick follow up comment on here, which is I think you know one of the objectives I think you know for a uh, kind of a, an open standard type of approach is I think it's really key to have the interfaces defined in such a way that every component, every function can evolve at its own natural pace. Right, so whether that's you know I/O going along with standards, whether that's a particular accelerator going through different generations of you know the the, the latest algorithms from you know NIPS and ICML or whatever, um, or or you know even the the, C, the host CPU whatever that you know each one of those should be able to you know evolve at their own natural pace based off of their requirements, their you know business uh, situation, whatever it may be, and so you know maybe. You know, I do want to upgrade the CPU hand in hand with my accelerator. Maybe there's other applications where you know the, the accelerators are you know, changing fast enough that so long as there's a common interface and I'll reuse the CPU for a couple generations before I you know do some change. Right. So I think that's one challenge is you know making sure that everyone has that that flexibility and freedom to do you know what makes sense for their business because at the end of the day, you know, each one of us, if it doesn't make sense for our business, we're not going to do it. Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, so clearly, this is a tough problem, as we've heard this morning, um, and uh, ODSA is trying to solve that in an open sense. But this is more of a business question, really. I mean, okay, you guys are, I guess, technologists on the, the side of your business. Um, arguably, you're being very successful, and you've invested an awful lot of money to get to your Stratix 10 or your or the multi-generation of the Xilinx parts, or even the AMD ones. Don't know too much about the Cisco ones, sorry. Um, so, um, and you're being very successful there, and I, I guess doing quite well in, in a competitive sense with it. 
Um, so although I hear you in terms of the motivation to enable the rest of us, I can't see your businesses allowing you to partake successfully to help us go through this transition without us spending the same amount of money, which none of us has got. <laughs> so can you rang that quick? That's, that's yeah, I can, I can talk to part of that. The, the reason we opened up AIB, the reason that we're, we're particularly interested in this is that uh, we can potentially pair up Intel Silicon with other parties Silicon and then address an application that Intel couldn't do on its own. And that way capture more of the business that we wouldn't have been a part of to begin with. Right. Well, I hear that, but then the EMIP side of the equation is not there. 50 well, million, I think I heard you say. Th that's why we are pursuing other ways to put Intel Silicon on to, uh, with other chiplets. I guess the, 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 the standard interface comes back again too. So, so if you have, let's say, the, again, HBM, uh, somehow, for whatever reason, the, the, the HBM or memories are different technologies, and if you have to integrate, you have to have some interface. If you can leverage some proven, uh, I think, uh, ecosystem, that's certainly one way that if you enable the small chiplet vendor to build their chiplet to a standard, it's so much easier. So I think to standardize working with some proven, something which is standardized, has ecosystem, that doesn't mean we need to copy it over, but leverage it is, is, is a good way to start where even us and others, if, if I'm interested in, let's say, integrating HBM, I have to have that. Could I have the interface also to interface with something else? And if the answer is yes, then, then we have enabled the ecosystem for other things too. At least that's how we are thinking of that the HBI could be such that you can integrate HBM because you have to, you have no other alternative realistically. And then if, if you can have the similar idea of at the electrical level to attach to other things, then, you, you, then it, it's certainly in our interest to expand. We're also interested in selling more and more chips. So. <laughs> Pure business answer will be hopefully the customers of Intel and AMD will put pressure like us in our interest to make sure that we have. Uh, Actually, that's a very good answer. And, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be key to you guys. And time and again, I've been on lots of standards. About this. I know. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's, it's, it's getting, and getting, the, getting the proprietary stuff out in the open and, and getting some of the legal people out of the way. <laughs> I'll leave it. Uh, great. Uh, um, I was wondering if, if people had uh, any opinions on on focusing on the I/O chiplet, whether the minimalist one is the preferred thing that just has XSR, uses the PMA interface, PMA interface, and the long reach, or the sort of bigger one, as Dave showed in his slide, that has the FEC and presumably PCS and other things in it. Does anyone have an opinion of which one? So, which side of the interface is the FEC and PCS? Uh, system guys, we have very strong opinion that as long as everything is standardized, it's, keep it simple. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to put anything there that other people can't do. So I just want uh, 30s. I want the PCS. I can. That's, I do not want anything else there. That other people or I can't use from other people. Right. So so no Make Mac. Simple. Right. No but Mac. but you would want the back. Uh, FEC is an option, yeah, because I think you know, right? I mean, some of the standards require FEC now. Mm -hmm. Four gig requires a fact, so it has to go somewhere. Uh, right, but it could be on the. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. So, so, so that's but, that's that's why I said it's an option, but maybe it's not needed. Yeah. Okay. Um, being an FPGA, it's, it's probably a little unique. You know, our alternative is if we don't do the Mac next to the certes, it would do the Mac in Soft Logic, or we could put the hard IP on the main die in, in FPGA as, as well. Um, it worked out well for us. We got a lot of customer feedback, as I, as I mentioned here. They said they wanted to harden there and they want to use the soft logic for stuff that they didn't really have figured out yet, right. as long as the hard IP that we put in there was flexible enough to cover everything that they thought of and everything they hadn't yet right. thought of. And the fact's big, too. Yeah. And, and the fact in soft logic is really unfeasible for, you know, 100 gig and above. Maybe just to contradict my colleagues here, which is always fun to do, um, I I actually agree with everything they said. I, I just picture I just picture a different kind of customer 
whose secret sauce is on what you do with the data, not, not how you bring the data in and out. Um, and in that case, you really don't care about the PCS effect or the Mac. If you can get all of that from somewhere, then you're very happy because it allows you to concentrate in your secret sauce. Uh, I think here, I mean, they, they, uh, we are all biased, right? And the kind of product that they build, it makes sense what they're saying. I have seen other customers where they don't want to care, they want to really handle anything that is, so to say, standard in nature. <clears throat> Next question. Okay. Uh, thanks for the uh, good discussion. One of the common concerns I see quite often was the concern about yield post-packaging. So put the chiplets together. And uh, of course, at the same time, we've had uh, good success with wafer level screening. Uh, overall to get the yield prepackaging to 98, 99%, so the final package product has good yield. Uh, is the concern still that this 98, 99% is not good, or is concern is if you go for uh, ch uh, chiplets using micro bumps, that screening would be limited. So you will not be able to do as good of a level packaging. Carlos pointed out, I can only talk from my experience, so I have a very warped view around it. Uh, the, the, pr the problem is actually the micro bump. I mean, yeah, you're right. So uh, we can get known good dyes, which are wafer level. We can do a very good testing. It's your dye set, and you start putting it in the package, and you have issues there. And we have seen sometimes um, it takes a few weeks to figure out what the packaging issue was, and we lose a lot of time and yield because and this is, again, growing pains, I think. Uh, once uh, people figure out how to put the proper tests in place and put the proper tolerances in place, we'll see less and less. And we've already seen, I mean, we've been in production for a while, and the amount of issues have gone down exponentially. But it's always, it's it's in the packaging problem. It's not uh, the wafer level test. Yeah, so I think you, you, you just touched on it right at the end there. There's the... The known good dye, you know, can you at wafer probe determine that this chip is going to function as you expect at speed uh, in your package? And then there's, did you mechanically get it assembled correctly? And we've had a, um, actually really good success on both of those. But I think the idea of using redundancy on micro bumps is still a good one. That uh, as the the geometries ideally get lower on micro bumps and the number of bumps goes up, that you know, 99% is is going to be not good enough, and you have to have to go up higher from there. Thank you. Okay, so this will be the last question until Bobby gets his two questions. Hi, um, I have a question about power distributions, because as you integrate more and more chiplets into your substrate, your power distribution becomes a problem and challenge. Is there any way to start considering uh, voltage regulator as a chiplet so that at least you can solve your power distribution on your substrate level instead of pin level? I mean, just you know, kind of you know, speaking you know, speculative, speculatively. I mean, I think that's certainly perfectly valued, valid to start thinking about. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, there are going to be a, a variety of you know, power distribution you know, related problems. A lot of you know, and, and the chiplets. You know, I don't. You know, it, it's not. It's not obvious how you can take a a chiplet, you know, open chiplet approach and still, you know, get to that. Uh, that nirvana land of you know le pure Lego you know just plug things together and it works. There's still going to be a lot of you know co-design required. You know there's the you know the thermal coupling between components that can cause problems. You know what happens you know um, either from a poorly designed case or from a adversarial case. You know might we have you know security attacks in the future where one chiplet can you know attack the power supply and mess up you know other components. Uh, in, in the system, right? You know, we haven't talked about security at all, but that's likely to be a really important aspect if I'm taking these third-party parts that, um, you know, it may just be a design bug, it may be malicious, you know, what are we going to do? Um, so, you know, power delivery is part of it and how complex that power delivery is, you know, can have all kinds of, you know, unintended interactions. You know, I don't know if we want a system where we can have, you know, you know, e even though it's all open, you know, do you really want, you know, 17,000 different, you know, power rails running through the system? And we, we still have to put some standards, some, you know, limits in place. Um, so I, I think that's 
a wide open question that certainly uh, is really important to think. So maybe for uh, uh, IO chiplet, there'd also be, you know, like something, but something that maybe. Some I think there's power delivery as well as power management. You know, how does a chip express to the rest of the collective, you know, system and package that it wants to change operating points or needs something different? How does it, you know, or a, a power or a thermal emergency or, you know, what are just a lot of, you know, system management questions uh, that are, you know, wide open? Yeah, I think if it's integrated with experience, I think typically to go through the power structure and go through the pin view, it's very difficult. And if you can isolate the substrate level where you, you have your chip left to regulate your voltage, it's really helpful. And, and my personal experience also, even in Intel, many, many years ago, it's the same inclusion, so we have to build these separate power distribution away from the pin field to, to handle MCM. So it, it seems to be a, something that needs to be addressed. Okay, so Bapi, two questions. So, um, 1A, thank 1B, you. 1B, 1C, 1D. Yeah, something. <laughs> uh, so when I was gluing the panel together, I sort of said, I want like a, um, Semi vendors. I unfortunately, I'm fortunately, only one systems person and services. Uh, he was supposed to be on there too. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, in the three to five year time span, right? What's the upside you could potentially see from your viewpoint for chiplets? That's sort of question number one. Question number two is much more parochial. Um, how can you help us? What problems does the ODSA? Well, you know, are we on? What problem do you think we should be solving? Are we, you know, you've seen some of this in the morning, you sat through some of it, give us some feedback. Um, those are two. And be kind when you're answering answer to. <laughs> we are carefully watching all the chiplet sort of uh, efforts and, and, and progress on different sides. In, in terms of what we are going to do in next some years, I think some things are obvious for us that we need to sort of have the biggest um, chip we can build, and that's sort of easy to rationalize. Also integrate some of the things like memory and such, those are easy to rationalize. Uh, but this idea of the, the disaggregation is interesting, appealing. I think we'll have to see if it makes sense for us, because uh, that, that that's that's, that needs a lot more standardization before it, it's like companies which are already doing this based on their own proprietary interfaces will can necessarily jump into. Uh, so I think three to three years, maybe it's more of see where the standardization goes and how we can help influence. And from my point of view, I think the key to success in terms of standardizing is on the on the five leverage something. It's there are only few flavors if I look at conceptually, say parallel inside these, but there are many, many nuances. Every different person can come up with some, but they're very hard to then, if you start with a new one, it's very hard to say. There are a lot of these uh, details to work out if you really have to have a robust interoperable interface to work. There's something working, there's something industry is already le railing around. Leverage that we've seen so many flavors of. Uh, PCB interface is in a round of PCI because that's probably the easier way to come up with your new thing, but leverage the PCI if I. So I think for, for ODSA, leveraging the the FI efforts, which are proven in some way, there's an ecosystem around them, there's sort of the IP ecosystem we can uh, source from is, is hugely important. Yeah. Uh, upside from at least where I said, I mean, I think this is where we are going. As, as I said, we are out of real estate. I don't see solutions out there. So our compute and storage has already moved. Uh, no, sorry, uh, networking and storage has already moved. We are looking at moving compute to, to a chiplet based. Uh, how can we help? We could enforce or we could demand that you guys use standards. <laughs> That's one way to do it. I, we've already been having those discussions, right? It's not uh, new, so definitely uh, this is in our interest and help. So I have three predictions, future. 
Um, so one is uh, I think that there will be a lot of innovation done on chiplets that that attach into um, you know, larger SOCs. Um, an another um, is, is that the SOCs might live longer if the peripherals can change change on them, them faster. And the, and the last one is about the phi. I think that we are going to have to deal with a um, multiple phis and that we're going to find ways to turn chiplets so that they can use different phis much more quickly and match the application. In, in terms of uh, near term, you know, upside, I think, you know, what, one, one of the questions that was, uh, you know, previewed to us is, you know, sort of what is, what is a killer app for chiplet? And I think, you know, for, for many of us, the killer app is actually more, right? Moore's Law is starting to kill many of us. And so, um, you know, simply being able to uh, keep this game going, you know, further into the, the next couple of generations of uh, process technologies that, you know, we can't build, you know, radical size, you know, uh, chiplets enable us to keep this game going, keep us all uh, employed for at least you know several more years. Um, so I think that's you know one of the the near term benefits in terms of kind of you know contribution. You know overall, part of it is that it goes hand in hand. The more you know the various you know players in the uh, industry are actually building chipleted systems, whether they're open or not. The more we are learning and driving this technology you know uh, forward to greater maturity, so that you know when you know, we do have an open standard, you know, completely defined when all the other, you know, many different, you know, business and other uh, pieces come into play, you know, the technology itself won't actually be that what's holding us back, right? That we will have worked out, you know, how do we do the, the testing and the assembly and, you know, the interfaces, what are the right architectures, what are the right application drivers, you know, how do we strike that right balance between uh, generality and, you know, application specific, specificness, um, and that, you know, basically so long as all the companies are, you know, or, you know, enough of the companies are actually building, you know, chiplet-based systems and driving the technology maturity forward, you know, I think that's actually a, a, a big thing because, you know, all the standards in the world aren't going to be useful if no one can actually, you know, build it and make money off of it. So I think that's one of the key things that, you know, all of us, you know, you know, independent of you know the activities uh, with regards to standardization, um, and then you know I think where appropriate it's a uh, it's, it's a business you know it's a business case in terms of where it makes sense to you know open something up where it makes sense to keep something proprietary and you know that's going to end and change over. Well, you see, uh, I'm not a free man. I'm a slave, right? I work for these guys, so whatever is their benefit is my benefit. And in that sense, I think that what they are going to get out of it, in terms of pure benefit, is the higher reuse, besides, obviously, the, the push out of, of more slow limitation. Because they do have families of products where they can reuse the Lego pieces. So for them, it works very, very well, this, this higher reuse. Um, in terms of what can we contribute to the open community, I think that the pushing for the standardization, in particular of the chip-to-chip -chip interfaces, as said, is something that they need. And hence, there is an interest in them also pushing it and making it like the, the standard for, for the industry. Thanks. And this might be a little unpopular here. So question specifically for Sanjeev, because in this list, he's uh, the only systems vendor, I guess. So, would, would, <laughs> so can you think, would there be any business case against using chiplets, if any? Oh, <laughs> I know, that. no, that's why I asked. <laughs> no, sure, I think the first gentleman who came here and asked, right, say, yeah. if I can do uh, monolithic and on a... So it's, it's uh, not from a technical uh, perspective. Yeah. The question is, um, and uh, to keep, keep things into perspective, uh, one of the customers that I was selling into a long time back, I was very nervous of putting all eggs into one vendor's basket where the main die and all the chiplets and the integration and everything is coming from that one vendor. There's a risk from a technology failure perspective, execution perspective, and price perspective. As a systems vendor, do you see anything that concerns you with this? Or uh, 
actually right now the other thing concerns me is that I don't know how I can mix and match and have one person responsible and make it work. That's more concerning right now than putting. But to answer your first question, we'll always use the low, low risk approach. If I can, and low cost, right? If I can do a monolithic die on a laminate, that's the cheapest way to go. For one, I'll always do that. But I, what I was saying is I cannot do that anymore. I have real constraints, hard constraints. So I have to go to chiplet based solution. And right now, one neck to choke is the solution. I go to one person, Mark's my friend. I'll say, you are responsible for everything. Okay, <laughs> go do it and deliver a final uh, chip to me that works, right? Uh, 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 modular. Uh, that's the lowest risk approach right now. We need to figure out, okay, how I can insert somebody else's IO chiplet in his uh, flow, uh, production flow, and make sure that there is legal things solved and somebody responsible for all the yield issues. I don't know. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear that because right now he's charging me a three thousand percent premium to do everything. So <laughs> maybe just a quick, quick comment. I guess to that because if you look at the, in, I think the interoperability. If you buy two chiplet from two vendors, you have to be really, really sure they will work together. If you look at again PC example, we're all aware of is enormous amount of interoperability testing goes before you actually qualify something as PCI compliant. We need something of that order if chiplets have to be ordered from Avnet or wherever, otherwise I can't trust they'll work together. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jawad Nasrola. I am with a, a startup, Zglu Inc., where we do chiplet based design and uh, we have been part of ODSA from the pretty early on and bringing in a lot of our knowledge and contributing it to the community. Do we have the clicker? Clicker? I don't think. Oh, okay. I'll click you. You click. Sure. Could you guys? Could you hear my introduction? Or you want me to go again? Go again. All right. I'm Alex Wright Gladstein. I'm with IR Labs. Uh, I'll be talking later on the second panel about what IR Labs is, but for the purpose of this, I'm actually talking about some help I did as part of the business subgroup for ODSA, which Jalad will introduce. Great. So stepping back a little bit from the discussions that we had this morning, what we will talk about here are some practical things that we started doing when we started working on the proof of concept. And we started getting chiplet dies from different companies and started thinking about putting those together and ran into a bunch of issues. One very simple thing was, okay, how do we 
take the data from different companies and put that together. Turns out that everybody who is doing chiplet-based design, they have their own methodology. They have their own way of kind of like representing these uh, pieces of information. So what happened here was we said, okay, let's just see if we can create some kind of a machine readable uh, mechanism where people can share their information with everybody in a market in a marketplace for chiplets uh, in a manner that makes it easy for the consumption and design of chiplets. So that's where we started. And the idea really was that this information eventually leads to uh, easy data exchange, and we have been thinking about the service called Chiplet Design Data Exchange Service that potentially ODSA can at least standardize, and uh, it will help work with different CAD tools and different types of design flows. So that's where we started. And when we did this discussion, we realized that people are really worried about uh, sharing some of this information early on. And that's where Alex and Sam and business group, they started reaching out to the community and they put together a very nice survey and Alex will show you the survey results and then I will describe this chiplet data exchange in a little bit more detail. Yeah, so we were talking about all the great ideas we had for some tool that could collect a bunch of information about chiplets to make it easy to co-design and then the question came up, well, will anyone be willing to share any of this information? So we figured a survey could help answer. So here's an overview of the questions that we asked in the survey. Hopefully most of you received it and even participated. They, um, most of them followed the same template. So we asked, can you share this type of information? And then the answers were A, as public information, B, through a tool with a standard agreement in place. That's the ideal that we as ODSA would like to encourage. C is no, actually only directly with an interested party with an NDA in place, kind of standard two-way conversation, two-way NDA. And then D was no, can't share this information under any circumstance. And the specific questions, um, you guys can read this, but to call out a few of them, it was as high level as just saying, this is the functionality, this is what my chiplet does all the way down to much more specific things like the heat map of my chiplet or um, the voltage rails, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So we had actually really good, a really good response rate with a bunch of responses even coming in late last night. We have 50 people who responded. Most of them were familiar with either the ODSA or at least with the concept of chiplets. Um, out of the 50, 38 were. Uh, 10 weren't familiar with chiplets or ODSA, but are familiar with chips in general, and two just not familiar at all with chips. Um, and then the job functions I thought were worth calling out. We had a pretty good spread. Uh, a lot of architects, which this is relevant for, so that's good. Um, good number in uh, executive management, business development, and marketing. And then a, a good number uh, in what I've categorized as engineers. So because of the way the numbers worked out, I ended up pooling the responses into these three groups. So we have a, a good number, you know, 15 or more responses per these three groups. And you'll see the results by group later. So here's the overall summary of the responses. So um, it's a complicated chart, so I'll walk you through it. Along the bottom, I've summarized each of those questions. So we start with the first one on the left, chiplet function. Can you share what your chip does? On the y-axis is just number of responses, straight count there. And then the colors of the bars are the category. So from the left with green, that's totally public information, all the way to the right, red, can't share. Uh, blue is where they are willing to do it through a tool with some kind of standard agreement in place, yellow is NDA. So you can see most people think, if you just glance at this, that for most information you need to have a two-way NDA in place. That seems to be the default of everyone, or at least a lot of the people who responded. There's a decent amount of blue in there, so a decent amount of, oh, a standard tool could work, that some people believe that to be the case. A lot of red, a lot of people saying, no, I can't share anything ever, which is interesting. Um, and a, kind of a sort of equal amount of green, which is encouraging too. Maybe it offsets all that red. 
it gets more interesting when you drill into the specific uh, types of uh, people who answered. So people who fall into engineering, different types of engineering as well as engineering management, turns out a lot of the, the reds come from that group. Uh, we cannot share this information. Um, and a lot of them also think that they need NDAs in place. Um, if you go to the next slide, the architects, architects are used to getting NDAs in place for everything apparently because all the yellows were coming from there, a lot of them. So the encouraging thing though is if you look at the executive level and business development and marketing, you actually get a lot of blues. And so uh, we were talking about these results and we were um, kind of discussing that, you know, maybe this is actually encouraging because uh, maybe when it comes to actually, you know, we, we took this survey as purposely an anonymous survey. We didn't want anyone to worry about us thinking they're representing their company's opinion. We just wanted the general person's opinion. Um, but if you think about who's probably going to make decisions on behalf of companies, it might be more in this group, at least the executive management. And it looks like there is some hope for some kind of standardized tool, tool with all the blue there. And it's really across the board. It goes down a little bit on the right. These last ones like heat map, um, pre-assembly test functionality, post-assembly test functionality, business model, that, you know, it's more specific information than at least some of the kind of higher level stuff that's earlier like X and Y dimensions, bump physicals, Z dimension, it looks like there's a, a good amount of consensus that it's okay to share that through a tool with a standard agreement in place. Okay, hi. Thank you so much. So, you know, this is something that told us uh, quite a bit in terms of um, what what is it that people really think in terms of creating a marketplace. So there is a desire by people who are interested in business to create a marketplace and 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 they want to get out of this traditional mode of uh, hardware engineering where everything is just nda based at least they are willing to say okay in some controlled manner we are willing to disseminate basic information like x y z and bump physical so people can at least do some initial feasibility study of picking some things uh, from an available catalog and doing a design. So this is actually is a solved problem for um, uh, many of you who do in-house design development. You already have your uh, CAD engineering and your system flow folks who have a equivalent of this table around here which is, hey, on the left-hand side, you start with a domain-specific architecture specification of some kind, and you go look at what are the available triplets in a, some kind of a library element in there. And uh, from there on, somebody will create a system-level netlist. You will use EDA tools to essentially create that, that netlist is getting information from the same database. And then that is being converted to a actual design of the package or the interposer. And the final package is being assembled. The, the flow at the bottom is something that we will come back to in our POC discussion, where we will talk about how a flow for a software development kit works. The point here in this one is actually the box at the top, which says triplet data exchange service. And there is a concept in there which is called triplet ZEF library. So if you have worked on silicon backend, you will be familiar with files called LEF and DEF, which were put in the public domain 20, 30 years ago, and everybody uses that. Uh, pretty much all the EDA companies support that file. So we at Zglu, we had to invent this particular solution for our tool. And it, that's what we call the Zglu exchange format that essentially captures information in the Z direction as well. And we decided to actually put it in the public domain and we have been working with uh, OCP ODSA to offer it to everyone, you guys can just uh, build on top of it. So if you look at the triplet 
data exchange service, what you will see, there is a library of a bunch of objects. Each, each object is a chiplet, and chiplet has uh, different pieces of information. Mechanical data, which essentially refers to X, Y, Z. There is IO, bump map. And notice they are in blue color because this, they can, people are thinking that this information actually can be given to others through a tool. So let's say if OCP has a information sharing tool of some kind, people are willing to, to uh, at, least, at least talk about this piece. Uh, ZEF also includes electrical data, which talks about electrical characteristics and um, uh, other, other uh, capacitance and inductance type of uh, characteristics. Also, power and thermal data and architectural data. So the, the concept really is for ODSA here to come up with file formats and just say that this is the information that would be in there. We're not going to write any tools on it. People are free to just develop their own tools, their own flows on top. All what we say is, here is a example standard definition of a ZEF file. And if this thing uh, becomes interesting, maybe OCP, maybe OCP or somebody else can host this particular service. So just want to drill one level deep into just one very simple thing, which is, what is a chiplet? It's actually a physical object that you buy or you get from another department in the company. Uh, what is the minimum thing that you need for that is X, Y, and Z. Truth is, you actually are using a lot more information in here. You have tolerances on X and Y. You have uh, different types of materials in there, the properties are being described. You have reflow profiles, you have thermal profiles. So all of this information is kind of needed for initial architectural work, right? So at least part of it is needed uh, to be kind of like, you know, shared with each other, with not, where we have to overcome this paranoia that, you know, oh my God, we're not, we can't even tell you what is an X, Y, Z of this thing. Well, reality is I can actually go buy your part, put it under X-ray, and I would know what XYZs are, right? So good thing the survey told us that people are willing to, to uh, share some information, and that is actually a hopeful thing for creation of this marketplace. If you guys are interested in knowing more about the ZEP format, you can go and get the spec from GitHub. So just to summarize what the next steps are, we are going to work more on this particular work stream. And if you are interested in participating, please talk to Alex or Sam or Bapi or me, and we will have uh, some of these learnings that we, that we come up with after doing this collaboration we'll share with everybody in a pretty open manner. Thank you so much. Any questions? Like uh, this information, because obviously in early stages, people are more like they don't want to provide any of this. But at some point when the chip is, is, is going for production, as you said, you can just measure it. The X, Y, Z, and they're measurable. And I wouldn't have said no if it was meant for that type of chip which is available. But if you ask for something doing development, then yes. Was it meant to be like for something I think, um, in production? If, or you're no? talking, if you're talking about legacy, even for legacy parts, we are seeing that there is hesitation. It's a good point, though, and it's something we discussed when we were creating the survey. You know, at what point are we talking about? But we decided to keep it vague just to collect something right now. Right, but you're not making any data sheets for any chiplets and giving them. 
That's, that's really the thing. Thing is, you know, there is an opportunity instead of making PDF versions, if we have a standardized machine readable format, it's just a lot easier. The data integrity is just people will believe in that, right? Instead of doing super complicated validation mechanisms that, oh, data got exchanged correctly between these two companies or not, right? I also think the question of when is an important one because you're not, you don't have to share. I think there, it's worth defining that there are things we will not need you to share up front for this data exchange, right? This is really a matching mechanism, as far as I understand it, to help chiplet providers match with each other to create a bigger product together. You don't need to know everything about the chiplet to be able to do that matching, but there's a bare minimum you do need to know. In, in addition, it creates an opportunity for companies who are in system integration space. Right? Imagine if multiple chiplets are available, just like on DigiKey, and you can put together a combination, right? Right. I agree with you on that one. I think that's kind of like the underlying. I have a quick question and then a theory. Um, the the question is, uh, what is the what was the wordsmithing of the survey when you said you know with a tool does that just mean machine readable, uh, or is there some sort of other implication of some sort of security or or shield or traceability there? I want to pull up the words themselves. <laughs> So are you talking about the through a tool, right? What is answer B, through a tool with a standard agreement in place. Yeah. So the intention was to say that there's some sort of information protection in place that's not as strong as a two-way NDA, but it's better than nothing. Kind of like, and Boppy actually came up with this comparison when you're um, when you are downloading an app from the app store on your phone, you sign you know some agreement, and uh, it's different than a two-way NDA, but it is some agreement that's in place. Yeah, but I still can get, presumably, all the information that I could have gotten under the, I, I don't know, it's, uh, I, I don't really understand that, but that's why I'm an engineer. Okay, um, so then the, the, the theory, uh, again, being an engineer here, I'll be a sociologist, which is that the engineers are used to getting shut down and saying, you know, you can't share that where the business <laughs> people are usually, the people who are optimists who get told, Go ahead, do this. It's a quid pro quo. You know, you don't do something for nothing. We can't say we're going to put it out there unless unless there's actually a, a, a collective gain that we get from it somehow. So I think um, it, to me this was hard to answer just because, you know, I don't know what I'm getting in some sense if I'm making it public or if I'm doing it in any other way. So I put the safe thing down. Um. I, I also had a hard time answering, and I think one um, one information would have changed all my answers. Uh, if there was business justification, I would have gone above and beyond, and whatever it takes to get that information to go there. So, so I was always thinking, okay, is there a business behind it? Then I can say yes, but that that was the difference. Yeah, I think those are both good points and kind of similar ones. I think we all assumed that you wouldn't be want, wanting to participate at all in this tool as a chiplet provider unless there were a business justification. Maybe it was an assumption we made that we didn't make clear, so it would have been a better survey. survey. Set it out right. If you're going to do business, you had to share information that you wouldn't. Is there a central clearinghouse or a PDK-like mechanism where this would happen? That was the basic theory of the questionnaire. Sorry, I'm an analog guy, so I keep asking analog questions. So um, when you put multiple dyes on the same substrate, your power grid has to be shared because you, you, you need to understand the power grid of the other one so that they don't interact with each other. I just cannot imagine silicon house will share power grid information between each other. You can't imagine that company A will share power grid because you, you need to, because when you analyze power distribution, on the sub same substrate, you have to share power grid information because they interact with each other. Right, so think of it this way. 
if you are selling a chip today, you are giving some power information. No, to no, you. you're isolated by the by the substrate. So at the pin level, you don't that's, see the power noise. That's okay, but you give them a EC table that has okay at this mode, this, this power, and things of that nature. You tell them that there is a diode here. You can access that to get the junction temperature. So this information that we are collecting, I don't think we are trying to figure out how you constructed your chip. We really are asking for the interface level information. By power grid, I think it means inductance, IR drops at each bump level, so that they, when they interact with each other, they don't get into resonance. So the companies do share IBIS models? That's not IBIS. But you know, the, we have to start some. Actually, um, I'm with you. If you could, I mean, there's a, there's a lame answer to everything where people, if you could go offline and get them information, that would be really helpful. We're trying to figure this out ourselves. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the short answer is you're probably right, and we're trying to figure out what the answer is. Okay, thanks. Um, our next speaker, I actually don't even know what he's going to talk about, but he just sounded really cool. And <laughs> 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 so, I don't know, we had to blow 20 minutes on this thing because where's Ali? He left. Ali from On Semiconductor said, I, I saw this absolutely wild presentation. You guys really should see it. And I don't even have a. So, you know, he, we're all going to find out the hard way. <laughs> Okay, so this is so our host knows what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I went to a full screen. Or... It's coming up. Sorry, I'm just trying to go to my... Okay, so... Uh, thank you for the chance to uh, speak. Uh, I think three days ago, I didn't even know this meeting existed. <laughs> I got a, um, a Friday invitation here, and I'm, I'm very pleased to speak. We have a couple technologies, um, which I hope you find very interesting. I think they're very relevant to uh, chiplets. Might be a little broader vision of chiplets, but hopefully um, uh, you find this very interesting, and I uh, um, want to see where this can go. So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, I work at Park, and Park is a wholly owned subsidiary of Xerox. Uh, you know, over the years, has done lots of things in computing, um, and uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the laser printing part. Um, for business models, people should know um, we are a wholly owned subsidiary, but half our work is with companies outside of uh, Xerox's business. Half our funding is, and the two technologies I'm going to talk to you today are um, definitely like that. They're the vision and how far they can go is much broader than what Xerox can do, and we're definitely looking for electronics and uh, industry expert opinions on um, where this can go and, and partnership. So um, the vision is kind of chiplets everywhere, not just for a, an accelerator. Uh, and from the assembly point of view, we think there's a tremendous need that's coming up. Uh, for those of you who weren't at the, um, have been following the, the display industry, there is a larger movement, kind of like, you know, the, um, there's a movement to see whether LEDs can take over. OLED, LCD, I don't know if it's like Moore's Law or not, but they only have so much far they can go. And LED chiplets, maybe a, a simple diode, a very simple chiplet, has uh, the potential to be significantly lower power and more robust, better brightness, better, basically better performance and cost for the next generation of display, and uh, maybe signage, and, and it's already in lighting a lot. Um, but uh, uh, the potential there is tremendous. There are 10 to the 16 digital pixels in the world right now. Maybe they all can become LEDs eventually. That's quite a bit of assembly. And they're also working with very small chiplets, uh, you know, just like I see, smaller is cheaper. They just need enough light, and some of them are just a couple of microns, others are a few hundred microns. And so that's what this um, RGB, this is, so library there is easier to define, and the communication protocol is, of course, easier to define, but there's a very important assembly problem which we're hoping to, to, to capture. Um, and, and then the IC chiplets we've been talking about here, as, as you all know, and about IP reuse and heterogeneity and modularity, 
Um, something I want to I want to emphasize and just mention more of the heterogeneity because I'm actually more of a process person, fabrication person, and from a heterogeneity point of view, the world is so far non-heterogeneous, right? I mean, it takes decades to get a new material into a fab, if ever. The vast majority of all semiconductor research and materials will never get into a fab. Um, there's some very exciting things in 2D materials and quantum, all kinds of things which, which just aren't on anyone's roadmap. Um, the general solution for integration is, is assembly, and uh, that's why you always have it at the end of some, some, some kind of the process. Um, from the IP reuse point of view, um, you know, these are kind of two extremes, right? There's the diode, well, for the, for the LED world, it's pretty simple. But, uh, um, but the IC world, of course, there's a transistor, which is actually, you know, cost a nanodollar for a 10 gigahertz transistor, but of course, we don't buy it in those units. Um, but that, you know, it translates to, you know, IP blocks on the tens to 100 microns. So, so there's potentially some very interesting assembly problems, even at these smaller scales. And so a question I have for this community is, have people thought about that? You know, dramatically more IP reuse as you go, you know, farther down into the, the hierarchy. Um, and so, um, we've been thinking about assembly for a while. Um, uh, decades ago, the first laser printer was actually um, developed at Park. And viewed from an assembly point of view, it's crazy fast and crazy um, fine fine scale. Um, pretty much anything mechanical that's out there now, and how you put little chips together with robots or lasers, or those are still mechanical, are um, six orders of magnitude slower than what your current laser printer does right now every time you press go. Right now, your laser printer puts down 100 million particles in a second on a page for a penny, and it's, and it's digital. So short run, you know, co-design, real time with the graphic arts people. You know, you, you've got this, it's the ultimate in rapid prototyping and complexity. Um, and so our, um, if we're gonna try to do something like this to try to actually get a lot of things together, we want to leverage what this technology does, which is directed electrostatics. So we're using electrostatic uh, um, control of a fluid to see if we can make a process where every single toner particle is a computer chiplet. So this is the broad vision. Uh, the library, um, you've been talking about you know, the bottom bottles, the, the top bottles, the RGB, um, the display world is talking about. And uh, I do think eventually those will start to mix, you know, as our, as our display platform becomes more of a computing substrate and, and, and sensor, a broad area sensor platform on the edge and all that jazz. And, uh, but from our perspective, they're all just chiplets. And so we're trying to develop a, develop a general process to put lots of these little chiplets together. Um, you load them into this printer area, they assemble, and uh, we actually are doing it kind of randomly right now, like a, like a solution, because ultimately that's the fastest. Uh, they could be loaded in a more organized way for, for, for certain applications, so you don't have to redo, redo it all. But this is the fastest way, we think. And then you transfer it. And there's kind of two kinds of applications, where one where you're doing large area electronics, mostly where we've had our funding and where we've focused on so far, or smaller scale things, finer scale, finer scale um, uh, integration, uh, chip scale. So our ultimate goal is a brand new tool for the, the chiplet world, um, which is high throughput, low cost, like a printer, like geography, fully digital, so you can customize and print out your circuits, you know, in a building across the street or um, someplace close, and, and customize each pixel, and it's fully digital, so you can actually um, even do sorting. I'll explain why that's important. And so for, you know, compared to printing, of course, we need to figure out how to do hit, um, orientation, finer placement, and heterogeneous assembly. And so this is what we've been doing um, in the research lab. We've been taking some dummy wafers, making dummy chips, and uh, um, like I said, for ultimate cost reasons, we actually put them in solution. Um, the fluidic approaches scale incredibly. Um, but then the, the, all the research is really around um, this active matrix electrode array. We actually have developed a software suite and shown that it's possible to fully control where each of these little guys go, um, micrometer scale to millimeter scale. Going up you know, above that, there's lots of robotic solutions, but especially at the small scale, there's very few. And uh, it's digital, like I said, so we could sort out bad die, like the little red square is a, a bad die. Uh, so if you've got wafer scale built on self-test, uh, that's definitely being worked on for the LED world. 
um, and, uh, as, and, and, and it's probably one of the solutions for some kinds of chiplets. Uh, and so if they're marked, we can move, move them out of the way. And then we transfer them with either a roller-based approach, which is especially for the large-scale sensor arrays, or a stamper approach, which is probably more for the, the chip scale stuff that most of this community is, is used to thinking about. A couple of problems that we think we also can do better than others um, is getting chips really close together because we actually move them laterally. I'll show you true closed packing in a minute and, uh, and also dealing with small chips. So this is the key slide. Good, they're working. Okay, so this is, these are all real-time videos. Uh, we think we're the only group that can do this right now, uh, which is to move little things at this precision in parallel with software. So no mechanical moving robotic parts. So on the top left, you have uh, 10 micron beads being moved around. This is similar to a vertical LED, um, which, which has a top and bottom contact. On the bottom left, you're seeing them kind of move in a deterministic arbitrary pattern. Uh, these are both going to a micron registration. Uh, on the, in the middle on the top right, you're seeing 50 micron chiplets, where now we're also controlling the orientation. So these are pretty recent results where you have a three by three and then a, a 10 by 10. And um, you know, the current solutions to do this mechanically, I don't think exist. Um, people are working on parallel rubber stamp and people can program robots to get very precise, but they're extremely slow and they don't handle the small chips. And then on the bottom middle and the bottom right, we have true heterogeneous assembly. So two different kinds or three different kinds of chips on the right here at the same time moving together. So if you care about actual integration costs, so you don't have lots of transfers and the fabrication for the advanced packaging, we think this is the ultimate solution because then you just have one transfer out of the system. Um, here we've got a couple of LEDs, a gallon arsenide, gallon nitride, and a silicon chip. It also shows that the process is very general and it doesn't matter where we, where we um, uh, get the chiplet. Several of the other laser release methods people are working on, for example, are extremely coupled to the fab. And so you, you have this usual vertical, vertical integration point of view. We think this kind of um, generic, we're using dielectrophoretic and electrophoretic forces are very generic and can work on pretty much anyone's silicon chiplet. You don't, need, you don't need to do anything special to them. It does help if we can see them because then we can do more of this kind of image-based feedback. Um, in a longer talk, I can tell you more about how we do it. There's lots of open loop scalable methods which we think scale to uh, millions of particles um, and billions. So I'm only showing you 100 now because that's where we're at. But, um, but we're working really hard to make all the software and the processes very scalable so that eventually designers here can really think about much, much more complex systems. You know, basically lithography took us from one transistor to billions. We think microassembly will take us to one chiplet to, to billions of triplets. And just some stills in case the videos work, didn't work. On the top right, we did a little side experiment recently just showing that it's possible to bring chips right next to each other. So this is essentially a zero gap between those four chips. Um, the other images uh, are kind of finals. I think the bottom left one is probably most interesting as a still, because these are really small chiplets, 10 micron, 30 micron. Um, relevant now for the LED world, maybe relevant for this community soon if, if you can figure out the right designs and, and libraries and, uh, you know, the cost should make sense. You're saving a lot on the active area, but you don't want to be all pad. Um, and the you know, other things, you know, we, we can control the angle. The bottom right is actually like a, a non-moving part LIDAR system or something. And then for the larger applications like LED, which is the one where, where the market is, is, is clearly pulling right now, we are integrating this continuous roll to roll. So the chiplets like a printer go into a transfer and you're seeing one line by line getting picked up. So um, uh, in our lab, we can print out like a, a couple inch array of, of, of chiplets here. Uh, so far, we've just put some diode through them. Uh, we'd love to get more chiplets too. We'll probably get LED chiplets sooner than we'll get IC chiplets because that community is a little farther along. But um, uh, we do think the process is general. The actual final steps of the packaging, because they package people in terms of you know, how you actually interconnect and planarize, we've done it a couple of different ways. There's lots of solutions out there from many companies. That's not the main research opportunity. We think what's really neat is no one's done this kind of electrostatic assembly that's, that's scalable, uh, integrated with the transfer. Uh, so to recap just some of the applications, 
Um, there's, the, there's the larger LEDs on the middle right here, which is I would classify as just part of the larger sensor world in general, uh, solar sheets and other things are what we've um, had some funding for to work on. Uh, and, and there's a lot of space in between those. Once those platforms start to get out there, so a lot of uh, um, sensors and, and computation can go in there. Um, we are offering a new capability of high throughput sorting of small things. Uh, one direction we're interested in going is around 2D materials for, for, um, for quantum and um, uh, laser sources and, uh, and, and other heterogeneous structures in that space. And that's because that's one key example of something which is very immature. It's an immature or low yield process. And with high throughput uh, sorting and, and assembly, you can go from low yield to high yield, is, is what we think we, we, you could do if this, if this kind of a process really worked. Totally changes how we get new technologies to the market. Instead of waiting decades and only having a big market pull it, lots of small markets, lots of small technologies could, could, could get to market if you could actually integrate low yield processes. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the ICs. You know, you've, we've been talking all about actual fieldable applications here. Um, one vision we have here is if this process in the library was there, we could use this process to maybe serve as a, as a cloud service from an emulator, for example. So there the goal is not necessarily to, um, you know, in addition to the fieldable applications, but it could be just, just to be to help um, emulators use real chips, real hardware, get the full stack, and, uh, um, and that might be a business model for, that we're interested in because that might be a business model where just one of these these systems gets, gets built initially. And the last two slides here, I'll switch to a different uh, topic, which I think is also very relevant to this community. Um, there's another technology, what we call microsprings, that, that we work on. And this is a thin film uh, flip chip solder ball micro bump replacement. So instead of the kind of glue the chips together theory, which is pretty much what the packaging world does, we're, we're making a thin film microspring which pops up. And, and these are images of the different projects we've done um, over the years uh, with, this, with this technology. It's very scalable. It's basically limited to the thickness of the thin film. And uh, um, it's very important, potentially, I think, for this community now because it, it offers some very new test solutions. Um, because it's a, it's a, it's a reworkable um, chip scale vertical interconnect. So you can hold chips in place, do full at-speed tests, and, and remove them. We've integrated with TSVs on the bottom right on, on organic substrates. And uh, um, actually, you can make 3D coils with these two, the same process. Um, and so just to recap that, that point, uh, um, if you want to hold a lot of dye together down right now, chiplets, um, especially if they're at the tens of micron pitches, you're at the point of no return. So the whole community has to design very conservatively. You have to, the whole supply chain has to design for 100% no good die. And uh, I'm claiming that there's a price for that. You, you can't speed bin. You can't push the limits. Your, to your design tolerances can't be as, as tight or as aggressive as they, as they could be if you had full speed integrated test and rework at the end of the process. And so we think a microspring pressure contact could offer that. Um, if you didn't want to use that for the final package, you could just use it for the final module test. So you've designed your final substrate, and instead of designing a whole separate test board, just take your final substrate, instead of bumping it, spring it. And, and you can use that one version to get your golden set of die, push your test limits, and take out the best die. Um, uh, we've done a lot of cost models around the potential value of, of having integrated having reworked this late in the process. Um, uh, you could skip a lot of testing. You could be more aggressive. But uh, um, uh, if one of these, th these three things are true, either you have a lot of chips, you have one low yield die, or just one expensive die, it's pretty easy to get like orders of magnitude savings. And you can see why no one builds multi-chip modules. <laughs> They're just way too expensive. And the, there's, it doesn't, and so, um, you know, it, it's actually kind of interesting on the bottom right here, you know, as one chip starts to lose the yield and move around, the system cost is much more predictable. That's why the, the yellow and green lines are very flat. So, so in terms of controlling and predicting the cost of your multi-chip module, um, integrated test and rework, we think really changes the, the economics of the system. Uh, we've also integrated these with kind of a self-alignment process so that in the field you could actually pop out die without having a, a mechanical tool. And, and we think that might be very interesting, and I'm curious if other people agree. 
for for security or field upgradable chips, uh, something that you can actually um, swap out uh, in the field. Uh, uh, or there might be applications where you just have in-house testing where you just want basically a high bandwidth socket. So, so these micro springs, I think, could also be used for um, a micro scale so socket, which which currently doesn't exist, right? Langrid arrays and et cetera are, are significantly larger. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you we've got some very interesting technologies um, in microassembly and in microsprings. Um, they both offer some capabilities that the chiplet vision, I think, uh, could really uh, um, benefit from. And uh, I could acknowledge our previous partners. And I look forward to any feedback and application ideas. Um, and as I said, both of these, are, the, the assembly one especially, it's much too big for us. We have to have many other um, partners to, to get that out. And uh, um, even if you don't have the funding yourself, will help take the idea to the government. We work with DARPA and others a lot, too. So thank you. Any questions? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. There we go. You won't be blinded by the light. Those? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, getting towards the end of the day, but, you know, it's like Texas weather outside. I think it's like 100 degrees and the traffic's bad, so you might as well stay here for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. We have cookies and we have an interesting, uh, uh, in, more interesting things to learn and, and hear about on, on the uh, ODSA and chiplet front. So I'm Sam Fuller. I'm with the NXP Semiconductors. I'm with the – I also um, – am responsible for the business work group within the uh, ODSA um, business subgroup within the ODSA work group within the Open Compute Project. So, and it's, uh, it's my pleasure to help moderate a panel discussion today on chiplet workflow experience. And we've got a, a number of, uh, of experienced um, individuals on the panel today. Um, so what I'd like to do, I think I've introduced myself. Um, I've also got some slides for some of these folks. I guess for the first four, um, she wants to, to talk as well. So what I'd like to do is I'll 
kind of introduce Alex, and then I've got a slide, and Alex can talk about kind of what her company's doing, which is uh, related to uh, Chiplet's X. I think they're 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 building that kind of technology. And then we'll talk to to then we'll have Brian, um, Halil, Wolfgang, and, and Ramshi, and then we'll have some more questions after that. So we'll Alex, please. I'm with IR Labs. I'm one of the co-founders there and our chief strategy officer. And we design and sell optical I.O. chiplets for integration in multi-chip modules um, or systems in package. Uh, so we were formed out of a DARPA-funded research collaboration. Um, it was a 10-year-long collaboration that resulted in 2015 in a demonstration of the first ever processor to communicate using light. Since then, we've taken that technology and further developed it to make uh, very high throughput optical I.O. chiplets. We call these chiplets TerraFi because it's a multi-terabit Phi. And um, they are manufactured in a uh, standard high volume CMOS manufacturing process, which makes them capable of being integrated into a standard multi-chip module or system in package as if they were um, a, a standard CMOS chiplet, even though they have optical devices in them. Um, and so they have advanced digital logic, analog circuitry, as well as optical devices, all on a single chiplet. Uh, we flip chip attach those onto the uh, substrate, um, and that's what this picture is on the top left. And so the electrical connections, the electrical data to the other chiplets in the package come uh, through that substrate, and then the optical signals come through the opposite side of our chiplet, which is now the top side, uh, out of a fiber ribbon array. Uh, on the bottom left of this slide, you can see um, a little bit of how we do it. So we basically use the same uh, layers that uh, are intended for transistors to make optical waveguides and optical devices. Uh, we do have one step after the manufacturing, which is removing the substrate in a local area above the optical devices. This allows for access of that um, uh, optical fiber ribbon to access the uh, waveguides on the chip. And we manufacture currently in the Global Foundry's 45 nanometer process. It's an RFSOI process. Uh, you can see an example of a, a project that we're working on right now on the top right. Uh, there are six of our TerraFi chiplets in that package surrounding a central SOC. Uh, these first chiplets are targeting high-performance computing and AI-type applications to enable higher bandwidth I.O. from that package and to enable that I.O. to travel longer distances than just within one board, um, enabling it to go across a whole rack or maybe even a couple of racks for new types of architectures. And then if you are familiar with I diagrams, we have very high data rates on our channels, and then we have some technology targets here as well. So it's, you know, in, in this realm, it's all about high bandwidth density, uh, low latency, and low power. So you have some specs there. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Brian Holden, next. Brian is with the Howdy. Community. Yes, howdy. Oh, there it is. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm, um, I'm Brian Holden. I'm from Can Do uh, Bus. We're, uh, we're a Phi maker, uh, uh, and we produced uh, uh, several years ago now a, uh, a product called the Glasswing, which is a Phi bit over six wire uh, Phi, and, uh, um, and it, it achieved uh, one picojoule per bit. It was one of the very first USR Phi's on the market specifically for, for uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, products. But I, I, and I want to just make uh, uh, one point through this through this, uh, uh, that in addition to all that's been said today, which is that reach actually matters even within a chiplet. Uh, within, you know, within a, within a package, the reach of a, of a USR service uh, uh, matters. So, so uh, um, uh, uh, the next slide is a study uh, that uh, uh, shows shows uh, uh, why this is so. So the last bullet on on here, the you know. Uh, when you make a, an I/O subsystem die, we were we were talking about I/O uh, chiplets earlier today in the questioning in the last panel. Uh, uh, if you put those around the perimeter uh, uh, of a package, you can shorten 
the long reach 30s uh, 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 trace length. And it's very important because it's, uh, you can save like two dBs or, or more uh, on each end, and, and that those dBs are very precious in, in, uh, in, in applications. And so there's a study on the next page, if you can go to the next page. If you look on the, on, on the upper right there, is a study of an Ethernet switch, a 25 a terabit Ethernet switch, uh, which with the main central die and 16 chiplets around the perimeter. And these are I.O. chiplets that might have the whole I.O. subsystem, the PCS, the FEC, the, the, the long reach 30s there. And then you can get those chiplets near the I.O. pins, and you can save a lot of, uh, uh, of trace length. And so this is in addition to all the other reasons to, to uh, uh, um, use chiplets, signal integrity, making the, 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 tr the travel between the chiplet and the package uh, 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 balls is, is, uh, is something that can be improved with chiplets. And uh, uh, so on the, in the graph, you, uh, the blue line that's coming down is, is uh, the number, the trace length that you need to reach the far corner. And you need, say, 32-ish 30, millimeters to reach the, the, if you don't have any chiplets, but if you have 16 IO bump chiplets, you can get that down to 14 millimeters or so. That's, it's a big difference. And so, so uh, uh, you know, again, you can save 2 dBs-ish. There's two other reasons why you might want to have some reach. Oh, in order to do this, you actually need some reach in the chiplet. You have to be able to go from the center SOC to the chiplet that's in, the far, in each of the four corners. So, so that doesn't come for free. You have to reach across the thing. And there you can, uh, you can see you need to go, you know, 23 or, or so millimeters to get to that IO chiplet. So, so again, this is why, why you know, uh, uh, very short reach things like, like you know, EMIB is, is awesome and, and it solves many problems, but it doesn't solve every problem. And, and, uh, um, and this is a problem it doesn't solve. Because, you know, with EMIB and the very short interfaces, you know, you're talking, you know, 10 millimeters or eight, 6 millimeters, that, that sort of range, and you're just not going to be able to get to the, to the corner. Uh, two other reasons why you might want to uh, uh, have some reach are just to not waste the four corners. That's one second reason. The third reason is to enable things like, like uh, two-dimensional torus uh, uh, topologies where you need to skip a chip. So if you have 16 processors, on an MCM, the you know the sort of default way is to make an XY a fabric out of them. But the better way is to make a, a 2D torus where you where you skip a chip and you, that's like a flattened 2D torus. So you have to skip a chip and then you skip, skip, skip. And so that to do that you need some reach to do as well. So so that's the uh, one quick point that that uh, <laughs> I wanted to make. And uh, okay, thank you, Brian. Um, well, next we'll actually jump to Halil. So, Halil, if you can, Halil's with Facebook. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, guys. I am from Facebook. I am responsible from the high-speed interface uh, selection and the roadmap. And in here, my contribution is going to be why do we choose chipless over IPs? <laughs> the first thing is uh, be able to get the power, performance, and area Sometimes the digital and the analog blocks might not be ended up at the same technology nodes. And for high-speed surveys to be mature, it might take some time. And then we are building the SOC. We don't want to wait for the surveys to be matured up. If all technology is good enough, we would like to take it and build R and save some time. And if the less technology, uh, advanced technologies is good enough, like older technologies for us, then we will save some money and it will, time to market is going to be improved. And lastly, like when we integrate too many blocks, like I'm talking about a huge server, like if you need 256 high-speed surges connected, your yield is going to be massively, uh, get a big hit. And if you do the chiplet surges outside, we can choose, and then it will be easier to screening, and it will reduce the cost. These are our main points to favor the chiplets over the IPs. All right, thank you. Um, Wolfgang, 
to have your slides here now. Does this work? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Hello, my name is Wolfgang uh, Sauter. I already know myself, so I won't introduce myself, uh, but I would like to know who in the room is another packaging guy or lady. Anybody? I know. Somebody. So there's two of us. Which, which is, I think, twice as many as the last uh, ODSA meeting I was at, which is <laughs> great, right? And, and it was... Um, We've been asking for more packaging people to come, <laughs> for sure. And it was really great to start the meeting with that because a lot of uh, what we talk about really is, is about packaging or packaging enables it. We've heard that many times today. Uh, now, one part I want to um, highlight here also is that uh, not only the capabilities have changed, but with that also the cost dramatically. Um, single chip modules, which is pretty much what ASIC model has been up to now, about two thirds of the cost was in the silicon, and the last cost was in everything else. Right? But um, one chart that Carl showed earlier showed some of these very crazy applications uh, they are working on right now, and the cost structure of that has flipped. The package is about two thirds of the solution, and the silicon is only about one third of the solution. And that's really driven by the complexity of the package, and that is driven by the interface that's chosen to um, enable the chips to communicate in, within the package. So we really have that reached that point where the tail wags the dog now, as, as shown in the top right. So um, a lot of this has been mentioned in different ways already, but if, if I just make up numbers now and say there's a bunch of components, um, Biggest chip comes from supplier A for 100 bucks, and then there's some other, job, other chips with different cost structures, and these are purely made up. Um, and so let's say they total $300, and that can be an order of magnitude higher for some of these crazy chips, or it can be an order of magnitude lower for some of the cases. But let's just use some, some middle case. And the question here really is, who wants to own all this? Who wants to buy all these things to integrate them for the customer at the end, right? So if we click down once, they all get onto the module. Um, let's say suppliers A, B, C, and D are all in their typical business model and they want certain profit margins. How can they buy all these things and not mark them up? It's not a, a business model that is really interesting to them. And it's not interesting for the end customer either because they don't want to double margin the part. Um, OSETs don't want to own this business either. Um, so who really can own this? And we've heard some of the talks today, Intel, AMD, some of these big companies that really can do everything themselves, but a typical ASIC customer, we've heard Sanjeev earlier talk, uh, he wants to buy everything from his buddy Mark, but he wants Mark to do buy all these things and for him, right? And, and I'm not sure that's a, the, the perfect business model either. Um, now, this has been talked about extensively also. Um, what if problem happens, and a problem will happen, right? They will happen, there's no question about this. Now, is this a problem for chip A? Is this um, chip B? Is this the substrate? Is this the C4 bump? Is this the laminate? What caused it? So there's a lot of time and uh, fault isolation that needs to be done. In the meantime, do I stop the line? Which line do I stop? Is it the bumping line? Is it the chip A line? Is it the laminate line? So. A lot of these business problems really haven't figured out until there's clear ownership of, of who does all the integration. Um, and then one, one last uh, chart, um, which is kind of interesting and some stuff we're working through right now. Um, a lot of these standard components, um, same doesn't mean necessarily they're the same. Um, even if we talk about standard memories, let's just say HBM came up many times today, but it's also true for DDR memories. Um, they don't have the same dimensions if they come from different suppliers. So if you integrate them on the module and they have slightly different Z height, all of a sudden you have different bond line thickness, you have maybe a tilted lid. Um, there's a lot of complications that come with that. So it's not just swapping things in and out. Um, and that's why I was really glad to see in that survey that went around a lot of the questions about the physical geometries because they actually are important. Um, Assembly results also are always different. If you have a different bump, if you have different solder alloy, if you have a different source, things will be different and yields will be different. So um, along with that, reliability results will be different. And how do you qualify one solution with one chiplet provider and then bridge across the rest of your um, whole provider platform? So a lot of complexities, I think, still to work through, no solutions. But as Bobby said earlier, we identify the problem.
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have, uh, um, so we'll start, uh, Vamshi, if you don't mind, you can introduce yourself. Sure. And then start. Uh, but good afternoon. Uh, again, uh, Vamshi Kandala from Granite River Labs. Um, I represent the probably less exciting but most important aspect within uh, adoption, which is testing and validation. I know there's been a lot of talk about testing and validation, what it means, uh, and how it can uh, essentially uh, enable chipper adoption. Uh, we'll talk through that. Um, as a company, Granite River Labs, so we're just down the street uh, on the other side of Montague. We specialize in high-speed uh, testing services and automation across uh, all interfaces, uh, from 5 gig through almost 400 gig right now. And obviously, we have seen and done in everything that pertains to silicon validation from bench all the way through quali qualification and production. Uh, we have a pretty decent idea as to what has to happen, when it has to happen, and what it means if it's not tested. It's so eight locations worldwide, um, probably 30,000, 40,000 hours of PVT testing, and almost all of the semi and system vendors here are customers of in some way. And, and we'll talk through what, the, what that means going forward. And that's the goal. So this is a show of hands. Anybody here in the testing and validation space and in the room? And that answers my question. It's, uh, that is, it's not exciting, but obviously critical going forward. Right? Yeah. If... <laughs> yeah, I've always, uh, perspective has always been, if you, if, if you didn't test it, it doesn't work. So, um, okay, so I had a, let's see, a kickoff question here. Um, so what key deltas for, for developing products as chiplets, what, what, what are the deltas for a workflow for developing chiplets versus standard um, SOC devices, standard, standard ICs as we've known them up until now? Some things that come up as being different. So packaging guy. Um, okay. One thing that's dramatically different for us is um, a couple of years ago, I was grudgingly tolerated at the Silicon guys' meetings, and now they don't grudge anymore. So, <laughs> 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 um, it's, it's actually an integral part of the very early engagement directly with the customer because of these discussions about what's the right interface. Um, that we can use that connects the different pieces together. So packaging is in the foreground, starting with the first customer engagement. Yeah, right Co-design. Yeah. yeah. There is no solution where you isolate silicon from package anymore. Okay. Anything else? Again, from a, from a workflow viewpoint, again, um, going back to what I was saying earlier, uh, there is no set process uh, for uh, testing and validation for chiplets if you're in a workflow viewpoint. We are all used to a certain flow in terms of engineering sample, college qualification, and production. And, and everything is based on a certain set of standards and interfaces. That workflow is kind of compromised with this particular, let's say, initiative. There are ways we can reuse what's already been done, but uh, there is a situation where we have vendors or competitors trying to get into the same market, will they share data, which is becoming an issue. So those kind of, uh, let's say, uh, disruptions means that the workflow from um, a tape out all the way to production has changed. And, and what it means, uh, and what I'm more interested in testing and validation is still up for grabs. What does a known good die mean, honestly? right? So what does it mean to test a known good die? A second. Uh, is it adding value from a cost viewpoint? Yeah, maybe it is. And can we reuse the same processes for known good die testing that we did for packaging testing? Yes, we can, but there's no standard talking about it. So those are kind of things that become critical. That the workflow is compromised, but there are ways we can reuse what's been done already for a standard monolithic process. I think that's, that's going to be interesting going forward. Thank you. Uh, I, I could answer one, one thing. You know, we're an IP provider in this world, and uh, getting... Getting the that just the industry as a whole uh, has has to to accept uh, chiplets has been a, a, a you know a real work we've really had to work uh, because we made this big IP just for chiplets and 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 you know the the big struggle to get the industry to accept it has been a big part of our workflow to to uh, uh, you know to really create momentum and uh, to, to get it all to happen. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been a, a, 
a good piece of, of my work over the last uh, three or four years. <laughs> it's getting just they're realizing they need this IP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of the chiplets, which they also need. Right. So from you know our product is a chiplet. There isn't any standalone chip product, but we have made standalone chips for demonstrator purposes. And I would say, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to have standards to be able to co-package with other companies. You definitely need to have a ton of communication. Uh, you know, the big change is just syncing up constantly. You know, on almost a daily basis with our partners to make sure that we are in lockstep as we work on tape out as we think about the package. It's not just, oh, industry can decide on the answers to all these questions that everyone's been discussing today. It's, it's also there's just a lot of co-work that needs to happen. I think that will stay true whether or not there are standards. We would prefer for there to be a standard interface as ODSA is developing because it means we don't have to develop a different product for every customer we work with. But um, regardless, I think even in that world, we still will be working very closely with each customer to make sure that the product actually works and that we're figuring out in real time the answers to these questions over a long collaboration period leading up to product. So as a representative of a semiconductor company, I, I can say that we have evolved in the delivery of the information of our chips. We used to publish kind of 400 page books maybe even big, maybe 1,000-page books. I mean, they, they were pretty thick books. And now they're 3,000-page uh, PDFs, right? So, so you, at least you can search them and stuff. But it's still mostly English text and tables and stuff that describe it. Um, with an advent of using chiplets, is that enough? Or will there need to be more electronic means or other kind of tool-based means to support, um, you know, support the, the ability of uh, developers to comprehend the complexity and actually make something that'll work. There is a, a business opportunity for chiplet design training here, because I think uh, we we do a lot of uh, seminars for again uh, testing and validation for new interfaces. Uh, there's a lot of demand. We see uh, we get asked questions. What does this mean? How can we how can we take care of this? Uh, can you debug it for us? Uh, can you develop some SI based specifications? Uh, what is SI for chiplet? So um, we get a lot of those questions. And there were earlier there was a discussion about what does single integrity mean for chiplet design, and that means everything, right? So uh, the point here is there is a demand for for training, be it on the design side, architecture side, testing side, and or packaging. Uh, people understand. Instinctively, chiplets mean um, uh, extending the semiconductor business cycle. Now, people do know that. Uh, we'll all be employed for a while because of this. But what it means from an execution viewpoint is not yet clear. And what it means from an actual design viewpoint is, is clear enough, but not exactly. So, yes, there is a need, maybe it's through more tools, uh, maybe through automation, through seminars, uh, whatever it be. Uh, there should be more uh, demand creation uh, from a uh, chiplet design viewpoint. Okay. okay. Uh, I will say like the one of the biggest challenges is going to be in the power supply domains. Many different IPs are going to share the power supply noise coupling, and if the if, if it is not being communicated clearly or we put a very tight budget, it can cause issue, and then there will be lots of point fingering, and it's very hard to debug. In that area, we need to do some more studies. Mm -hmm. Um, any, any other comments on that one? So I had a, I had a question, and back to Halil, and it's probably unfair because he's really an engineer working on uh, high-speed <laughs> interface. But but I'd like to ask what role he sees as companies like like Facebook, where end customers, what role do they play in facilitating the the uh, facilitating a chiplet marketplace or a chiplet you know the adoption and deployment of chiplet technology. I mean, since currently I can only talk about my part. We are not designing high-speed services. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to buy. Then, like testing and integration, all these things, if there's a chiplet, it's going to make our life very easier. Mm -hmm. That's why we are pro-chiplet on that part. So you, when you talk to semiconductor providers, you would encourage them to adopt this technology. Exactly. You already have a view that that's... Exactly. And then this can be helpful for us on the ASIC division at the same time, at the networking because choosing the high-speed 30s, maybe we are not going to rely on the whatever the chip inside. We can choose.
choose according to the distance, according to laws, according to coupling. And we want to have the whole freedom to go to like a store and choose whatever you want to choose. It's our goal. That's why we are encouraging and then we are very active on the ODSA and OCP. Okay. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm about ready to turn it over to, to questions from uh, the audience if you're, if you're interested. Okay. Yeah, just just to follow on to what Halid was saying, that so let's say for example you have two um, you know excellent suppliers of you know thirty score available. That you can actually uh, source those. You potentially you know uh, source those thirty score from them and just integrate, uh, or would you still consider? Because I understand that you know. In your case, you know, you don't build your own thirties, obviously, right? But if you had a choice, would you consider uh, integrating, or would you get a chiplet? And what would be your decision-making criteria to go one way versus the other? Okay, let me think. The first thing is, let's say I got a thirties. Let's talk about a USR, like a, yeah, a hundred twelve gig. And how many of them I'm going to integrate on my chip? If I'm going to put two hundred fifty-six of of them, right. let's say, my yield is going to be crazy. If I'm the responsible at the end from the yield, I prefer not to integrate. And if the chiplet outside, maybe it so, will be easier for them to test and give it to so me. So when you say that the yield, you mean the third is core yield, or are you talking about like a DF? A third is, for example, like a, there will be a, let's say, 1% yield every part which we okay. got. And if you put 256 of them, the yield goes off the roof at okay. the same chip. Right, right. But, but I mean, I know that your, your networking group is uh, actively developing products with a 12.8T, which has 256 thirties. And as far as I know, those are integrated. Yes. And I believe the only two suppliers who are actually leading that chart you know, are Broadcom and Inovia, and they use integrated. Mm -hmm. And I know there were also some who were uh, considering who are de developed products which are uh, a chiplet, but none of them, I believe, are leading, and some of them might be even exiting the market. Why? Why do you think the people who went integrated are winning the market? Oh. I didn't think about that, but probably they are already starting ahead. <laughs> that yeah. might be the first reason. Uh, I have a slightly different uh, question. Maybe the packaging and testing could come to that, and that's related to. Uh, so let's say I have. Uh, I do, you know, good dye, deliver good dye to a no sat, and I get my chip back. It's I have yield followed. Who is going to cover the cost for that? Is the packaging guy responsible for it, or uh, who do I go and have him cover my cost? You know what? That's the elephant in the room. Who owns it? <laughs> no, well, well, the ownership. I mean, it's clear. I mean, the the end user. If it's good, the, own, the ownership is, you know, is owned by the end user. But if it's not good, who owns it? And okay, <laughs> that becomes more like a more like a hot potato. Right, you know? it does, it does. So um, from I'll use the standard experience because it, it, this is this is still pretty new. So right. uh, with, with the standard process, um, if if uh, we we conduct the end to end back end testing and verification. If we find a problem and if we tell them what the, what, the, what the answer is, maybe a new FIB, a new tape or whatever it is, it is the silicon vendor who is responsible for that going forward because everything is a part of the same package and they're integrating IPs, whatever they're doing. But that is a standard process. Here, it will be slightly different, but end of the day, if we are conducting system level testing right. on an integrated board that has chiplets, at uh, a die level from different vendors, I think uh, the packaging or the testing vendor, whoever it be, probably becomes responsible. But they, there's no known good practice yet. But that's where I think this ends up. Right. But that is a question for, for everybody here because we don't know yet. But, but logically, I think that makes more sense. Uh, but as I said, I'm, I'm not very really clear on what's going to end up as, but that's what I would intuitively see it, see it going right now. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, yeah. I think it, um, there's there's always going to be one person I think who is going to hold the stick at the end, 
Right. Um, there is no other way to to do it otherwise, right? Some person needs to be in charge of fixing the problem. And if you leave it between different people, they'll just point. Um, so, and then it depends on the business model, right? The, the big companies, again, Intel, AMD, they have their own teams to manage all of that. Um, if we go back to what Sanjeev said earlier, he's an ASIC customer, he wants an integrator. The problem with that is the profit margin again. And, and that's, I think, to me, the bigger problem is because we'll, we'll find an integrator and somebody to fix the technical problem, but to find a solution where the profit margin is not diluted, that, that is a difficult piece. I think and, and earlier, I think David said he has a solution for that, and I'd love to learn or get you, our business guys together with yours. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point that it, it comes down to business model, it comes down to pricing, and I also would ask the question of does it belong to this group to have to answer that question, or is that something that uh, the companies who are actually integrating their chiplets together can decide amongst themselves? Does there have to be a standard for how that is dealt with, or can it be done on a case level? Uh, to, to that point, uh, creating an um, open interface where all the chiplets are then trying to meet that open communication interface makes, uh, the job, makes it easier for someone to basically say, this is mine, because I've been doing it using this uh, common standard, if you will. And then it's easier to uh, lay the blame at somebody if they're not doing it. That's one, one of a better term. So yes, absolutely. I think that becomes important. It, it makes it a lot easier for everybody going forward. Right, and, and along those lines, if we get standardized interfaces between things uh, that are chiplet specific, then the, you know, the Keysight and the LaCroix and everybody will start making test equipment that they can hook up in some way and you know, have standardized test, test points or test access or test whatever, you know, eye scopes that are integrated in, in a standard way that, out, that you can read from outside one way or the other. You know, they've got to be able to test it, and standards really help on, on that because, yeah, because you know, the, all the old ways of doing things aren't necessarily applicable because you can't get in there easily, but it still has to be done. And and one way or the other, uh, you know, standards. It, really it, it has to happen, right? So really help. Just to add to that, to just finish up. So, uh, for any standard, especially from a testing viewpoint, there is a method of implementation MOI and their compliance test specs. Because without that, we can't do anything, right? Here, obviously, PCIe has been popular. PCIe to the PCIe SIG has specs up to Gen 5. Um, there's a there is an option to. There's base spec and there's a chem spec. I won't go into details, but there, there are options to reuse what's already there uh, for, for PCIe, if you will, and then change it to a new MOI for chiplet testing as long as there's a common interface or open interface that people can adhere to. So just, so just as PCIe is important, there are other specifications which are also very similar. So having that common interface makes, makes everything easier. All right, thanks. Can I ask a question, Sam? Yeah, please. So uh, I, I'm looking at the panel. I'm guessing at least three of you called yourselves engineers in the survey. <laughs> so I think you're all very practical people. Um, and my question for each of you to answer uh, and not to cop out, what's your favorite interface and how is it integrated? Is it silicon or is it on a laminate? And in less than 10 words, tell us why. We know Brian, yeah, but right. I'm curious about the other four. The NRZ5. <laughs> yes. So it's a slight cop-out answer. We have two. Depends on working? Yes. Okay, so we have two. It really, I don't think there's any correct answer to that question. It really depends on the application and the use case. You know, why why are you making this system and package and who's doing it and what for? care about. Um, so in our case, we found that people fall into two kind of two categories. Either they care about low latency and low power so much that they they don't care about anything else, or they care more about um, uh, low lower cost. So if you care about low latency um, and low power, we we're doing AIB uh, for our first version of our product. Um, which enables some really cool system architectures in the realm of AI and high-performance computing, where they really care about low latency. Um, and then we've also developed a, a high-speed serial interface that does not require a silicon interposer, which is expensive, so you can't use it. 
of the other three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Uh, on, honestly, we test all interfaces, so I can't take sites because I lose my business case. So, but uh, we test almost 20, 21 not interfaces. But um, a PCIe 3 to 5 is probably uh, the one I really like for two reasons. One, um, it's obviously used as a data bus. It's, it's critical. Uh, it's mature. Um, it does a lot of things for a lot of people as, as a bridge mechanism, if you will. And even more important, not only is it probably critical for edge computing, um, probably data centers, but can also be reused going forward for autonomous cars for the automotive transition, where I'm seeing a lot of uh, next-gen IBM vendors look at using PCIe going forward as a data bus. So if there's a technology interface out there that meets two growing markets uh, and has a standard in place which makes it robust and quality, um, and good quality, to me, that's the best. And again, that's the earlier point. So if you have a common interface, then you can expand into other markets which have the a similar architecture in play. And for automotive, I think this is a good start because architectures are still being dis defined on for next generation. And having a chiplet as an option for single function work is really critical. And PCIe adds to that role. Now, that's a lot more detail, but that, that's my no, take on more it. More than 10 words. <laughs> <laughs> but, but good answer. Okay, a couple more. I think my background is 112 gig, and then mostly I'm dealing with 112 gig, then I will favor the 112 gig. <laughs> From familiarity breeds uh, Exactly, adoration. and uh, on networking and on the training chips, the highest communication, the like highest speed is more important. For now, I didn't see it on the chipless yet, but if it's on the chipless, the benefit is going to be there will be lots of USR, XSR. Like you can choose whatever you want to choose according to your trace. That's what I like about that. Power optimize over trace. It's so easy to go last. <laughs> so I agree with everything Alex has said, and if I have to pick one, I go with Halil. <laughs> <laughs> nice cop out, Wolfgang. Okay. All right, Brian, did you want to weigh in on that, or one, one other deal? You know, automotive was brought up, and and uh, uh, that's an interesting problem in itself. You know, automotive, it's like you being inside a lightning storm when you're inside an engine. Uh, compartment and and so that may have a whole another twist for all, the chiplet world too as well because you have to not get zapped you know, be, even between the chiplet. I just want to point out that we all agreed because PCIe can run over AIB or over a serial interface, so we all agree. Happy to. I guess we're all engineers. We're all engineers doing different things. I really. <laughs> <laughs> Still do. Still do. Okay. Any other any other questions? Um, okay. So so why don't we why don't we throw out? Um, okay. Yes. Go ahead. Just, and I guess maybe a little caveat. I'm not a business person, so I can take liberty to ask question. On the business model, somehow we seem to make it like the, the board design, the PCB design of today is all solved in one problem. We seem to be thinking that when now the 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 package level integration is certainly a new big problem. But if, it's, if I look at the continuum, there are simple PCBs. You take lower speed interfaces and go up into, let's say, GDD R6 running at 16 gig is not the same company can do. It's very close to the integration at the at the package level. You need those kind of uh, SI expertise. In that continuum, isn't the business case just it's a more complex integration? in the continuum from simple PCB, low performance to high performance. And if you look at high performance PCB integration, normally the, the, integra the, the chip vendor of the anchor chip is heavily involved in either building reference designs and giving it to uh, board makers, but they're heavily involved. And can we not have that sort of kind of a precedent or learning towards into the now we are doing integration at the higher level or more complex, but really the continuum just next step of that. So in terms of business model, isn't that a viable next step? Why does it have to be like we solve all the PCB issues, but suddenly we have a wholly different problem? Good question. I mean, actually, I see a lot of uh, companies kind of stepping in and developing um, what we call modules, high-speed modules, processors, and, and DRAM, and maybe PMIX all integrated 
you know, very small form factor, but they're still leveraging the, the device in package, the whole standards around that. And, and you know, I think there's a, there, there will be a pretty strong market for modules just because it's so hard now to develop high-speed memory interfaces and other things on standard PCB technology. So I see that happening. Um, but uh, um, it is interesting to think, you know, is there, is, is, should we look at this as just a continuum or is there really a step function change when you, when you start trying to sell die um, independent of a, of a package? Uh, and maybe we'll just we'll just finish that. Is this really a, a a big change for the industry to move in this direction, or is it just a kind of the next logical step in a continuum? I think it's an ecosystem change because although it is uh, it is different, it's, it is a perception and there is cost of uh, execution, there's economies of scale. All three go hand in hand. So in this particular um, direction, I think the 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 players are the same. But the ecosystem development is going to take a, a larger, big change because there's a lot of trust involved uh, in, in, within all the vendors, which is difficult because we are asking an SOC vendor to trust that the quality of the chiplet they are getting in, in die form is the same as the process they are used to, and, and there's no way they can validate that, which means that the, the people they are working with have to maintain a certain process that the ecosystem brings to them and that they have to basically use it over 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 years which is going to be a challenge so uh, again a lot of things that go hand in hand but they, there's an ecosystem paradigm shift using the same ecosystem development processes but the behavior has to change through again a common methodology which uh, i think we all have to develop yet and right. and i would say you know it, it hasn't happened yet right there is no uh, uh, market for chiplets yet, you know, sort of separate from the, 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 the one vendor produced all the chiplets in one package. And, and we'll know it when it happens. I think it'll be obvious once it happens. But when will that happen? You know, it's like you, uh, you can't tell. It's hard to predict when, when the seam will tear, right? So, so we'll, we'll know when it happens, but it hasn't happened yet. I would just say I agree. I think there are a lot of parallels and things we can borrow from the PCB assembly space. I think you know it's interesting you said from a business perspective, but honestly, I do think it's more from a technical perspective. It's an engineering question. Basically, the technical constraints are. Anybody else want to give us some last words here? Okay, Bobby. Yeah, cut coffee. Yeah, do you have the last word? Uh-huh. New opportunities are created. Yeah, for the for the live stream, um, the question is. Um, are chiplets just solving a technical problem, or are they um, a new technology that will actually increase the adoption of, of semiconductors, like solve new problems and create new opportunities that actually grow the market for this technology? Yeah. Yeah. So I can I can I can I can solve problems that I couldn't solve in the, with the, the economics that we have now. I think it. Maybe it's to prevent it from diving off, you know, you know, prevent it from hitting the wall. So this is a way to, to, to you know, to step over a wall. But it, I don't think it necessarily grows the plant. Well, uh, two ways of answering that question. One, um, chiplets extend the semiconductor business cycle. I think we are clear on that, and which means that the TAM will probably stay the same, but the serviceable market probably becomes a lot more easier for people to get to with better profit margins. Right? Mm -hmm. However, uh, if there is a large success story in any market through chiplets, which wherein we have seen a proof of concepts and people actually integrating it, then with a large success story, then I believe there's there's this probably a potential for adjacent markets which may not really be semiconductor oriented to be uh, where we can solve a few problems. But in theory, it should happen. But for that to happen, somebody has to show it to them, and that's not yet happened. 
From my perspective, the fact that chips today are expensive doesn't really prevent people from buying chips. Too, I mean, maybe it does, but I think the bigger thing is that it prevents innovation and new entrants into the semiconductor industry um, because it's so expensive to innovate, right? The end chips, are, you can get a chip for a penny, right? But making developing that chip is super expensive and it's hard for a startup to compete. And so we've seen a lot of, um, uh, you know, just large companies growing bigger and not so many new entrants into the semiconductor space. And I think chiplets will change that by um, making it possible to uh, address more markets with a chiplet, right? Uh, rather than having a chip that has all these specific functions and so it has a narrow market space. It can address. Split that into a chiplet, which now can address 10 different markets, but you know they all need that same one thing within their chip package. So hopefully it'll spur innovation from my perspective. So I think um, actually the um, panel, I think you put together, the earlier panel was excellent and those were probably the most advanced um, SAPs that exist in the world. Um, and they were all, every single one of them, and they explained them to us before, were done for a reason. It's not that those products wouldn't have existed otherwise, but they achieved, the integration achieved a purpose. So they, they would have existed no matter what, but, but this integration made sense for them to make them better. I was just thinking, for example, the dominating vendors, let's say, and then there is only, I don't want to give a name, but there is some server chip, let's say, there is only one or two makers in the world. And if you cannot, if you cannot convince them, the chip is going to be used there. Because if they are integrating everything, if they are taking all the benefits of the profit, how are we going to convince them to split their chips, give some part there? I mean, if that problem is not solved, it's very hard to buy, right? I mean dominating factor is there. But except that, if it's available, I think everybody's benefit to buy more, if there's one. Okay. So I think that's uh, a to wrap for the panel. And uh, you have a proof of concept discussion, right? Yep. Up next. All right, thank you so much for the participation. There's a warrior. What about that? It's an important one. So, you're talking in the microphone. Um, so, if, if, you, if all of you, if oh, everybody's been patient, are, are we and the POC, we need for input, thoughts? Maybe you guys could. Uh, on. So, uh, quick to us. Here you go. So maybe you guys could uh, focus on. We'll go real quick if we can. And we we meet Wednesdays and we if um uh, yeah we, you can tell me we need to help them join join the next. So the proof of concept uh, team meets weekly on Wednesdays and you can reach out to any of us up here and I think there's contact information on the wiki so. Uh, Feel free to reach out to us. So the proof of concept uh, team, uh, the other people up here all raise their hands, they're engineers. We're the real engineers because we believe you, if you want to learn about something, you got to go make it. Um, so that's what the proof of concept is. Why do we want to do a proof of concept? Well, because that's the way you can really learn. Uh, we can reduce the risk for the subsequent efforts. And we can convince the skeptics by saying, here it is, this is how you build it. So when we're looking at chiplets and trying to figure out how to you know, crack this so that we can make a chiplet ecosystem for multi-vendor solutions, um, our proof of concept is really trying to address a whole range of issues. The three primary ones we've been focusing on are the architectural issues. How can we validate that the architectural decisions we're being, that uh, we're considering are the right trade-offs? And also, very importantly, are the architectural decisions we're making, are they 
can we develop software program models because we in the hardware world have a very bad track record of building really cool hardware that no one can program. Um, so of course we want to make sure that anything we build is actually usable. Uh, we also want to explore the physical issues and make sure the proof of concept is addressing all the packaging, uh, power distribution, and all the other physical issues of a uh, chiplet solution. And we also, by doing this and by having a proof of concept, which is trying to take multiple companies and together build a proof of concept, we're basically a little petri dish for experimenting with the business and all the problems that address of how do we share information that we traditionally don't share, and in some cases don't even have a legal right to share because we deal with a foundry that actually puts a whole bunch of restrictions on us when they manufacture our chip. So basically this is, you know, when you actually try to do it, you learn a lot about all the challenges. Um, now this is the old slide. We're going to go into much newer stuff, but I just want to level set people. What we've laid out for the proof of concept is could we build a device that could serve as a smart NIC and or a storage accelerator. Uh, this would be a device with some sort of uh, networking processor, a CPU subsystem for a control plane, an FPGA for a data plane. Could we create that in a package with high-speed network connectivity, uh, with storage connectivity and some DRAM connectivity to that package? Um, now, we, we want something that's at least reasonable, so we're looking at, you know, maybe 40 gig. We're looking at using some legacy parts, so this isn't going to be, like, state-of-the-art. We want to build something that was reasonable enough in performance that it would be a good test case for the issues of a, uh, the chiplets. And there, I think I'll turn it over. Yeah. It works fine. It's me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Queen and, <coughs> and Bobby. Hello, everyone. My name is Jayaprakash Balachandran. Go by JP with Cisco. Uh, first of all, thank you, everyone, for staying late for this presentation. I really appreciate that. And I want to talk to you about the POC platform implementation. I've been working on for some time brainstorming and different approaches for the proof of concept implementation. <laughs> so uh, Quinn talked about the package, what we call the POC package. Let's put in our three uh, chips together, three chiplets from Micronix, uh, NXP, and Netronome, right? Let's put in for now, we have that package design, and let's see what do we do with that, right? So what you see here on the left is the POC package. The next step is really designing the board, what I call as a bring-up board. That's what you see in the green block. So once you have the bring-up board, you have the components, a bunch of components integrated on the board for the POC package to function. You will have a next step is software. So we, we had a very interesting panel this afternoon. The Gabriel was from uh, AMD, he was talking about Soft hardware alone is not sufficient. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> hardware alone is not sufficient. It's what matters is also software. So in order to create an acceleration platform, you need both hardware and software. <clears throat> so once you combine the hardware and software, it leads to what we call the <clears throat> ODSA development platform, which you can use it for design validation, doing the performance benchmarking, at least and algorithm development, and so on, right? <laughs> That's where we want to get to a kind of Petri dish, what Quinn puts out for testing a lot of these ideas and acceleration, right? So when you set to do this proof of concept package, we met with several challenges. The first is actually with the package fabrication, assembly, and test on. Unlike the PCB, package design, fabrication, assembly is pretty expensive. And remember, recall is actually the ODSA is the small group of 
people run by volunteers and uh, it's limited resources uh, right so the fabrication is pretty uh, seem to be very expensive right and the other thing is actually it's not just the fabrication part assembly and test is also to do with the design each of the chiplets we are trying to integrate they are about 3000 to 4000 bombs they have about 3 to 4000 bombs and putting them to the one substrate it leads to, can be lead to error prone it's not something it's not doable it's challenging can lead to errors right and especially with uh, considering the limited resources we have <clears throat> and also the architecture is evolving so this acceleration architecture changes by the day it's evolving first we need to test drive before we commit to the actual before <clears throat> before we actually fuse this the chiplets into one uh, package, right? So really we need to test drive. So how do you address these challenges? So, uh, so one is, so the, this is the flow we put together to mitigate these challenges. So we all this, uh, fortunately all the chiplets we talked about are all available today as a SOC, a package SOC, right? You take this, all this uh, package part and design a bring up board. And again, it comes along with software. And then what you get out of that is really a ODC development platform. And once you have this, all this tested concept proven, you take that into package, right? Later, we'll show about a flow that you can convert from a board design to package design in a lot more validated, right? Once you have the POC package available, then you can bring, you can bring the package back to the board design again. You can reuse your bring up board back and you get in the business. Right? And so starting with the package, expensive package design first. So what we do is we start with the board design using the same set of chiplets, but in a package format, and then <laughs> develop the board, and then translate finally, once you learned, apply all the learnings to POC package design. So, <clears throat> so that's the flow we have been uh, <clears throat> planning to follow. And um, so we set out a few requirements for the POC platform that I talked about. First is actually it needs to be a disaggregated architecture. Just like uh, chiplet designs, the chiplet designs are different companies that involve the chiplet design. They actually independently design and later we integrate in the common substrate. In the same way, so we want to design our POC platform. Actually, each of these chiplets actually gets designed in a package format separately and later we integrate it in a one common board. And that makes the design as well as the test a lot easier and there's a clear ownership. Right, and the other thing is actually, we want to make sure this platform supports multiple use cases for domain specific access, not just one or two few cases. The water, uh, various, it should be flexible enough to support a lot of use cases. The other is flexibility comes in the form of form factors. So one, it should be uh, able to use directly attach the server host for acceleration. And also we want to use it in an independent platform, right? Not just attach to host, but it can also use independent, right? So these are high level requirements we talked, we have. And what you see here is a platform architecture. So the bring up platform architect with chiplets. So you have here the three the, the chiplets we want to use. We extra, abstract into three generalized blocks. What I call here is accelerator A, B, C, and we give the new name called switchlet. So chiplet implementation the pack, uh, is implemented in a package same chiplet, if it's integrated in a board for design convenience, we call that as a pitchlet. It's the exact same idea, but it is implemented on the board, right? So, so these um, uh, pitchlets implemented the three uh, major blocks here have got very identical interfaces, right? So uh, the chiplet A and B talk to the host PCA link to talk to the server, and um, host uh, accelerator A and B, there are pitchlet A and B, talks to accelerate C again through a PCIe link, or it could use the high-speed interface. Same way, the A and B communicate identical fashion with the high-speed interface. It could be Ethernet, or it could be PCIe. That is something they can decide a time of connection, right? And also, you see there are two blue blocks here. So those are M.2 SSD connected to B and C, and those are used for uh, if you want to have any computational storage application, and you can actually develop some applications with that 
connecting and talking to B and C, right? Typically, the accelerator A pitchlet is from national, B is actually FPGA, and uh, C is actually the NXP <laughs> QRIQ CPU, right? The multi-core ARM CPU. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually switch around. B, A, the portion of B can be switched to A, and C, everything can be switched around because they are architected identically. So this has an advantage in some applications, and you don't have to use all three of them at the same time. You can mix and match, pick and choose. Right? And um, so what you see is actually a conceptual physical implementation. So, so the whole thing is implemented, uh, or planning, we're planning implemented as full height, full and PCIe card. So it's can attach to a server. But in, um, in other use case, you can actually move from the server, power it externally, and use the independent platform, right? So, and uh, you see this pitchlet block A, B, C, implemented as separate modules on the board uh, with the QSFC interface, right? At the back side, we have this uh, long M.2 SSD pods implemented on the component side of the PCB. And this is M.2 SSD, or you can have and even have an accelerator that fits in the M.2 SSD. So it gives a lot more flexibility in what you want to implement. Right, these are the pitchlet architectures. So what you see here is a pitchlet, three different pitchlets we have defined. And the pitchlet block itself is a uh, is fully self-defined, self-contained entity. And let's talk about the first NX, uh, NFP chiplet from Netronome. And what you see here is actually the, <clears throat> uh, the block on the left are the components that is required for, its, uh, for that particular component bring up. For instance, uh, the, this particular component may require clock, reset, and boot flash. And then it may require its own memory and debug capability, plus power supply. On the right side, what you see is actually the interfaces that talk to the other chiplets or other pitchlets uh, or to the external world. So these interfaces are identical from one pitchlet to the other. And uh, some may support all the interface, some may not. But the interface-wise, they are identical. So it can be swapped and attached together. So this is actually um, a physical implementation of pitchlet. We think it can be done within the form factor we had defined for right full PCIe card. And uh, it's about three inches by five inches in our definition. Again, this can be independently designed and later by the respective companies involved. And they can be attached to a common motherboard, which is a full PCIe card. Right? So, uh, so far, that takes me to the summary of what I spoke so far. So, the, so we set out to design POC package which actually has more challenges. Thank you. So, uh, so which, which has, uh, we found it has more implementation challenges. And uh, so we actually uh, plan to do a disaggregated pitchlet-based design flow to mitigate the design risk. With that approach, we'll, uh, we'll develop pitchlet modules, and then later we translate that into, into package, right? And we believe it's a flexible platform for different architectural evaluation kind of petri dish. And uh, the next question is really how to automate the PCB netless to generate a package netless. So we're going from balls to bumps. How do you do that? So Jawad will talk about more on that. Thank you. Yeah. It's OK. Work, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, JP. So, just to connect this concept of doing a board design for the purpose of development of software and for the purpose of doing some early emulation, uh, naturally we arrived at this pitchlet idea where we we are now doing these 
mini boards and kind of like putting them together into one particular form factor and such that we get some head start in software development. But the actual objective is to take the netlist coming out of this particular exercise and convert that to a package design or a package netlist. So the flow that you are looking at right now, it essentially uh, talks about you know what what are the steps that we are taking or what are the steps that we have already taken. So uh, boxes that you see in green are things that have been completed. And <clears throat> at this point, we are developing the uh, pitchlet netlist for, or, or, or making the boards, essentially. The, the pitchlet. So uh, the, from this point onwards, we will, the, the work stream will split into two activities. One of them will be essentially focused on the board and the board bring up. And the second will be going into conversion to a package design. And that's where this, the, these couple of new concepts that we have, one of them is that we'd like to write some rules to take a CB type of uh, solution and, and netlist and automatically convert that to a chiplet-based netlist. So that is this uh, chiplet netlist extractor block that we are kind of like thinking about. And, and, and this will be one of the activities that we'll be working on uh, next in the POC. Um, from there on, we already have planned out the activity for actual package design. Uh, which is quite traditional. And if you look at it overall, the schedule kind of looks like the following, which is in June timeframe, we are building this particular software development vehicle for the proof of concept. And we'll in parallel be starting on the package design that takes us a few months. And by the end of this year, we should have some results on the software development vehicle, and we will have uh, completed our package design, and uh, the, we may be making a second board to bring up that package. So that's kind of like roughly the, the situation. So at this stage, we are going to uh, open up this discussion for everybody to get some feedback. Quinn, going to... Moderate. Yeah. Forty five minutes in the Warriors game. Okay. So everyone check Google Maps and then subtract the time and then decide if you want to ask questions or not. <laughs> yeah. Any food that's left out there you can take home. So we've given a good thing here. You know, we're always looking for, in a POC here, our job is to sort of test this, and we need input on are we testing the right things? Um, and, you know, specifically we've taken this look that says in a world of a um, single company building chiplets, it's okay to kind of do that in-house program where you can build them in parallel, but in a world where you've got lots of vendors, does it make sense in a general to have a board level platform to test them together before you package them together into a solution? That's something that we found in our case made sense, but that may be an artifact of our legacy, using legacy dies as opposed to new dies. But I do believe that actually potentially for new dies, there is a real reason to test stuff uh, before you'd go to the cost of a actual integrated package. Um, so we'd love to have your people's thoughts on that. And you can give it here, or you're welcome to join our working group and discuss it at our meetings. But questions? There's a mic. It may be on. Well, I thought one way to look at it, you had a really good slide at the beginning. and said you said these are the kind of questions you wanted to answer. And then we are making a PCB. 
does making a PCB answer those kind of questions? I think it answers one of the questions, how to bring up the software, but maybe you could emulate. Maybe there are other ways. So if you could just say, okay, how many of those questions that you listed on the first slide is answered by making a PCB, then we can have a more constructive discussion. And that's a good way. It would be good to make a table of that. I mean, one of the problems you always have is we are very good at making lists, but we're terrible at putting the weights on the various parts of the question. But that's a very good uh, approach to it. Other input questions? Unsolved problem. It really would help in terms of flushing the flow. I can, but oh, it's not likely. You can. That's not. A Different, but the, I can imagine that the SIP in itself is an effort, which can be straight from standardizing. So one of the important things to that is. We have an effort to stand, you know, look at both physical and link layer. And we're trying to figure out how to use this POC as a evaluation platform for that. Now, we can't actually implement a new interface with this POC, but we can look at traffic patterns and we can do performance. Um, we think it can do some very good performance inputs to models of those new interfaces. Now that may so that's the conjecture we have, uh, but it does require it is a one level of sort of abstraction of how do you take traffic patterns from this um, POC using legacy interconnect and project how that performs with a new interconnect. Yes. And, but we're running, if you kind of look at it, if you take a step back, we're running, say, 40, gigahertz, you know, 40 gigabit Ethernet, and you, know, you could say that as you're scaling this up, this is actually sort of just taking a step. If you were to scale it to a 400 gig Ethernet, then you, know, you can kind of extrapolate how this would work. But I agree, there's a challenge there of, is this actually going to give any meaningful input to our, our uh, interface project and it's something we're looking at. It is going to help us because one of the things we're looking at as part of that is the uh, what kind of packet modes do we need to support from a programmability and sort of a management level. So in that case, we do think it'll help us understand what kind of tr what kind of uh, communication and coordination we need between these devices. Well, no, this, so there are two we were building. One is with current die, and the second is once we have a uh, interface definition, then we need die taped out with that interface, and then that's the next one. Then that's the next one. But, that, um, uh, but th those are the two envisioned. But the, to answer your original question, even if you take the technology side aside, at least, the one thing we struggled as a group so far is what is the business API between companies? It's like, you know, if, you, if you, we have this board, right? We're trying to build a, build a package part. It was an actual struggle to get somebody to say, oh, I'm, yeah, I'll step up and design the whole board by myself. Huge risk across three companies. This, when finally we said, okay, if we decompose into three parts and each vendor is responsible for this part, then some, we know how to assemble them. And if one, somebody else comes along and says, hey, I have a different accelerator I want to try it out, we say, hey, great, we can reuse two parts out of the three boards for this. And we also know how to make a new package part from that. So one of the, we sort of stumbled into this because none of us could figure out a different way for three companies to sort of work together without any one company bearing the whole burden and without any, we're still having defined interfaces between all of us. Not just defined technical interfaces, kind of defined business interfaces as well. 
that, that the, it was just like a very confusing thing. All of it, we, for the longest time, we were stuck because like, who wants to bite off this? So the guy said, okay, well, give me a package necklace. And I'm like, oh, wait, okay, we, 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 no one company wants to bite it off. And at least now we have a defined part. Somebody comes along and says, um, you know, Sam is give, you know, Sam's company has given us a multi-core CPU. Some other company says, we want to use our CPU. We have a defined way of saying, hey, yeah, meet these interfaces, give us a pitchlet with this. It works. You can uh, that that this is and this is our our hunch is you know if you're going to do multi-company chiplet projects even now they're not even just board projects this might be the way to. Right. Right, and so that's the, so. So this is more for the workflow of how do we get together. We were because if you look at it, we're also not able to do a memory abstraction between the parts. So each of them, each of the parts has its own memory space. So we really can't do memory abstraction either. You really have three different entities, right? But from the outside, at least from a next higher application software layer, we think we can actually make that uniform for both the part with the optimized interface and this interface. The so underneath it, you can say, hey, look, I can change the internal software admit to the faster interface, and then I have these then, but from the outside wrapper, we can still, the, the part will still look the same, just much faster. That's the working hope right now. And so we can say, oh, look, here is a storage application, and if I replace these chips with the faster interchipper interface, then I, they, we, I get them to we get them to occupy a magic memory space and uh, a, a, a uniform memory space, but the software itself, the outside application software, can remain the same if we preserve the API. It's not a p. Yeah, no, it's not a p. If we're missing it, we're saying that this PCB is the only way we know how to get to a multi-chiplet package, a netlist. We, we're not able to come up with another way across three companies easily. Problem. It's not clear to us. That's what we thought, too, but it's not clear to us that Anybody would roughly have to end up on the same path, and that's why all your, all of all of your projects are within one company, and where everybody can share information. We're we're sort of almost all of us are sort of uniformly swinging to the conclusion, and maybe we've just been staring at it so long we've talked ourselves into a corner. But no, we are going to do the MCM. So here, uh, no, right, right now, after this, immediately, we, 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 with, from this, the, we face a very simple problem. You need an MCM. I said, give me a package. There's a, they designed the package netlist with MCM. Who's funding it? And, oh, because the, because our packaging I says there is a very clear, simple, straightforward tools-based path from each of these pitchlets to a package, uh, to, a, to a package part. No, we're not yeah, but we know we, we know have the what has to design activity, that. and we know we have all the right. It's all connected, right? If we if we get the basic design of the MCM wrong, we're spending another hundred k to get it right. Wait, wait. So, well, yeah, we were in the main. So the, we we had two pro. Yeah. So we didn't know. We we look at it and said, yes, big time. We're going to take the layout here, and this is all the connectivity that directly goes into the MCM. This, the, 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 so the, there were very clear paths from, hey, okay, because you, you, each chip needs peripherals, each chip needs like connectivity outwards. This is a very clear path for you to say, oh, if you design your pitchlet, we know exactly what peripherals your chip needs. You know what power supplies, we know memory, attached memory. Okay, so push that into the package in that exact format. Ah. So, yeah, so now you hit upon our second, you know, that's why we're all excited when JP, 
I'm sorry. I, we also thought that when somebody gave you a chiplet, you needed the equivalent of a reference design around it to use it. And this is the closest we, we got to that concept. They give us a... Well, that you, I, you'll get him started then. <laughs> uh, but I, and then for you to design a package, they're going to give you these are the peripherals my chiplet needs. These will be in the package. So one of the, do you guys have the picture with the in the package outside the package? You see that white dotted line in the middle? It's kind of trans. So that is the thing about which portions of this pitchlet are on package versus off package. So all of these were very hard to answer on our own across all three companies, and this was the easiest way. We say each company would just provide a list of, I have my part. These components stay on the package when you integrate all of them into an NCM. These components go off the package. And this abstraction was the best way we have all found to answer. Yeah, yes. So, so Here. And uh, kind of validating all the connections, it's not going to be straightforward. It's prone to errors, right? And that's one of the reasons we chose because in all in the PCB world, the same connection exists, and people have been doing very well because you have to deal with the less number of connections compared to bumps. We're dealing with the balls, and you know most of the time they have already a proven reference design, right? All these companies have got a proven reference, and we connect accordingly, right? And uh, and then. Once we connect, we, once we agree on, review, this is actually for now, it's a manual effort. We're connecting from one chip to the other, making sure it's fine. But since we are dealing with the ball level, it's much easier problem to address. Once we establish the connectivity test on the board, we have an automated way of converting this netlist, the connectivity from chip A to chip B, to a package netlist. And that is actually well-proven, validated methodology. That's what we are trying building to. The idea is once we have a validated PCB netlist, it can be converted on an automatic fashion to a package netlist consisting of bumps, right? So that's the way we are ensuring now, but definitely we'll have, this needs to evolve. If you have to do it from the scratch, from the bumps, how do you verify the connectivity? What is the LVS mechanism for that, right? Those the things need to evolve, right? And you said RTL connections. I mean, these are things we need to think about, about the chiplet connectivity. We meet on Wednesdays at 1.30 p.m. <laughs> Could you please show up? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, we have lost two of our faithful, which means I've really, like, gone overboard. So, uh, this, this makes sense. I, I, there is one other second part, which, but why don't I end the workshop? Uh, because this is there. We, we wanted... Uh, Sagir's and uh, Ali Reza's and your opinion on this. So, but maybe I stop by saying everybody gets an umbrella. I think. Uh, what about the what about a bonus gift for the hardy souls who stay till the end? Uh, with the, the the other thing, whatever. Um, yeah. So I, I I can't thank Animation enough for what a gracious host he's been. Uh, yeah. The entire interest of Cynthia, who's, if, when you go out, uh, the food is from Holy Land, please say thank you to Cynthia. She set this whole thing up. And Ramone, thank you. Dave Kellett, thank you so much. Uh, Wendy, thanks. Pritam, thank you. This is the first day. So, okay, for those of you who don't know, sabbatical intel is a holy thing. Like, right? This is the first day of Pritam sabbatical, and he came back for this. <laughs> so if we can give him a big, huge hand as a thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
this, this is a big, big thing. So th thank you so much, Animesh, uh, and Ahmad, too. Yeah, as Bapi said, you know, thank you, everyone from Intel side, you know, who helped, uh, especially uh, Cynthia, uh, who arranged everything outside. Um, S3, um, Claire, Pritam, Wendy, uh, and uh, the big thank goes to Ahmad, who uh, realized, uh, and Shivani, yes, uh, Shivani is there, you know, who actually came up with the original idea that Intel should, you know, host it. And with that, I would also like to thank everybody in the OCP, ODSA, Steering Organizing Committee who helped. Uh, Archana is right here, Dirk, Brian. Uh, and it's not complete if Bapi's name is not mentioned. Uh, Kali Burdat, uh, you know, all those, those, those who are not here. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it was a good interaction. Uh, uh, we had a pretty good, you know, turnout. Uh, uh, I, I do understand that around the time, you know, it starts, you know, waning, so uh, not surprised. All right. Yeah. Jennifer. Jennifer, yes. Yeah, yeah. This is my first time, so I don't remember all the names, so I apologize. You have to help. GM, <laughs> yeah, uh, Ramune kind of made a special trip, uh, you know, to be here. Thank you, Ramune, again. Yeah. And Dave Kelly here. See you at the next. Yeah. See ya. Have a, have, a, have a great rest of the evening, folks. Thank you.